too. Okay, is Mr. Combo on? I think Mr. Combo said that he was going to attend from Alliance or with Alliance. Okay, well, I guess they're all there then. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. We're now on the record in case number 2021-00154, electronic application of Martin County Water District for an alternative rate adjustment. Unmuted. Who is muted? Unmuted. I don't know why I said that, but it just said it's unmuted. <clears throat> Before we begin, let, let me ask if Mr. Cumbo is present on behalf of Martin County Water District. I am present, Mr. Schmidt. I'm in the uh, Alliance office along with all of our witnesses. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. I saw on the screen that Martin County Water District was present. I just wanted to make sure that you were you were there with them. <clears throat> Uh, once again, uh, my name is Michael Schmidt. I'm chairman of the Public Service Commission. I will be presiding today. Joining me vid uh, via video conferencing is Vice Chairman uh, Kent Chandler and Dr. Uh, Talena Matthews. This time, I would normally caution attendees to please set your cellular phones to silent mode or turn them off. Due to the current state of emergency in Kentucky, the Commission is hosting this hearing via video conferencing. Since this continues to be a learning experience for everyone, there are a few suggestions I would offer. In addition to the normal courtesies regard, regarding cell phones, these tips may help with clarity and avoid feedback issues for the video conference hearing. Mute your microphone if you are not speaking. Attorneys, when interjecting, please state your name so the video record is clear. If you use a phone for the audio and a computer for the video, turn off the computer audio, otherwise there will be feedback. If you are in a room with several people on their own computers, turn off the computer audio for all but one computer, otherwise there will be feedback. If another participant is in a nearby office, close the doors beneath the offices. Sound carries further than one thinks, which can also cause feedback. Once in the GoToMeeting software platform, go to your settings, the icon looks like a gear, to ensure the microphone setting is on the microphone you are using. There is a pull-down menu feature in GoToMeeting settings that will list the available microphones. Use wired headphones or wired earbuds for better sound quality. Wired is preferred because wireless devices may lose power depending upon the length of the hearing. Keep a charger nearby in case your battery runs low. And please alert the commission if you're experiencing technology failure that prevents your participation at any time in the proceedings. Attorneys should contact staff at the previously uh, provided cell phone number. The hearing today is for the purpose of taking evidence on Martin County Water District's application for an alternative rate adjustment pursuant to 807-KAR-5-076 and request for emergency rate to be approved by the Commission. This hearing is specifically to take evidence on the issue of an emergency rate. The burden of proof is on the applicant and the Commission will be determining whether Martin County Water District's credit or operations will be mere will be materially impaired or damaged uh, should an emergency rate not be permitted. Pursuant to KRS 278.190 parentheses 2 in parentheses, if the commission at any time during the suspension period finds that the company's credit or operations will be materially impaired or damaged by the failure to permit the rates to become effective during the period, the Commission may, uh, after any hearing or hearings, permit all or a portion of the rates to become effective under the terms and conditions 
as the commission may by order prescribe. Uh, at this time, I would ask counsel for the uh, parties to please introduce themselves, beginning with uh, Martin County uh, Water District. <clears throat> My name is Brian Cumbo. I'm counsel for the Martin County Water District. Okay. And for Martin County Concerned Citizens. Good morning. This is Mary Cromer with Appalachian Citizens Law Center here representing Martin County Concerned Citizens. Okay. Uh, and for Commission Staff. Good morning. Brittany Koenig and Ariel Miller for the Public Service Commission. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I checked the record the other day and it looks like that the notice uh, of this hearing has been uh, given to the public uh, as required. Is that correct, Mr. Cumbo? That's correct. I think we've uh, filed in the commission record a copy of the uh, publication in the local newspaper as well. Are there any outstanding motions, uh, Mr. Cumbo? None. Ms. None Cromer? for the district. Okay. Ms. Cromer? None. Okay, thank you. All right, at this time, uh, we will uh, take public comments. There's always a time reserved in these hearings for members of the public to uh, express uh, their feelings uh, or uh, what they think about uh, the present proceedings. Uh, we have already received a number of written uh, comments that have been filed in the record. Now, this morning, uh, has anyone called in to uh, ask for a public comment on the record to Ms. Koenig? Yes, sir. And is somebody on the line at this time? Yes. Uh, the caller may go ahead. Please state your name and make your comment limited to five minutes, please. They hung up? So there's there no callers? Okay. Uh, apparently, uh, someone had called in but hung up. So. Uh, there will be no, uh, there will be no uh, public comment, at least on the record. But anyone who would like to make a comment may do so by sending a letter uh, to the Public Service Commission uh, or an email uh, to the Public Service Commission's website, which is psc.ky.gov. And these comments may uh, be submitted at, at any time. All right, at this time, Mr. Cumbo, uh, would you like to call your first witness, please? Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner, thank you. The, uh, uh, the Water District is appreciative of the, uh, the Public Service Commission convening this hearing uh, so rapidly relative to our uh, request for a rate adjustment and an emergency rate adjustment. Our first witness will be Craig Miller. Okay, Mr. Miller, will you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Mr. Cumbo, you may ask. Thank you. Craig, would you introduce yourself to the Public Service Commission, please? Yes, uh, my name is Craig Miller. I'm the Division Manager for Alliance Water Resources, uh, assigned here in Martin County, Kentucky. And would you tell the Commission a little bit about yourself? Tell us about your background, your education, your qualifications, your certifications. Yes, uh, I have uh, 14 plus years in water and uh, sewer utilities. Um, I have uh, over five different utilities, including Martin County, Kentucky. Um, I have an associate's degree, as well as working on my Bachelor of Science in Public Administration. I have a Class 4A Water Supply in Kentucky, Class 4 Distribution, and a uh, Class 1 Wastewater, as well as a Class 3 Water Supply in the state of Ohio. And... <clears throat> Uh, tell the commission, if you will, what is your role here at the Martin County Water District? What, what job title do you have and what does that mean? So um, my role is a division manager and uh, typically a division manager is administrative and operations. Uh, I uh, have a local manager that is assigned to divisions and I am usually over multiple divisions. But uh, in this case, with the Martin County Water District, I have been here for a year and a half, and uh, I've been working on the day-to-day -day operations, as well as uh, with the team from Alliance to, work to develop the finances, and uh, uh, as well as operations on water and wastewater. When, when did you begin your work here in Martin County? Uh, January 1st of 2020. And is that the date that Alliance began their contract? Yes, sir, it is. Would you tell the commission, if you would, uh, what you found 
uh, when you began work here in Martin County and, and what you have done to address those issues? Um, well, yes, sir. So, uh, commissioners, when we came to Martin County, uh, there was obviously a lot of issues in the system. Um, frankly, poor management practices, um, accountability, uh, per, uh, poor practices with uh, time management, get employees to to uh, properly use of, use their time going from one place to another on jobs. Um, poor prior planning, um, finances were in a state of disarray, documentation was lacking in a lot of areas, a lot of issues with the billing, uh, a lot of questions about uh, meter um, reading accuracy and accuracy in reporting, um, timeliness in reporting, everything from UFRs for the Public Service Commission to reports for the Division of Water, uh, a lot of things that were behind. Um, and a lot of a lot of paperwork that needed to get caught up, as well as a system that was in failure. <clears throat> and that sounds pretty challenging, Craig. What what have you done to address those issues since you've been with us? Uh, well, uh, I have a presentation that I've submitted to the count to the commission. If you would like me to go through that now, is that okay? Yeah, this will be a great time to do that. Okay. If you would. <clears throat> Well, if I could share my screen. There we go. All right. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. So uh, through my presentation, uh, we'll go over a little, we'll go over the uh, key accomplishments to date. We'll talk a little bit about disaster response, talk about water loss, um, immediate needs, and, uh, and of course, uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. Um, key accomplishments to date, uh, as I spoke about earlier, um, a, lot of, a lot of questions about the accuracy of meter reading. So we underwent a meter audit in 2020, starting from the day we first read meters to begin uh, collecting data on the meter reading, as well as trying to uh, locate any meters that were currently um, not on record or currently couldn't be found. Um, we completed the financial audits that were uh, behind from 2016 to 2020. Um, we created 90 day goals something that wasn't being done in the past. Um, there was a lot of firefighting that was going on. So uh, employees would come in and they would just go out and they would fix whatever needs fixed that day. There wasn't a lot of planning for the future. Uh, there wasn't a lot of things talking about what was going to happen next week, next year, in five years. And additionally, how the repairs that were being made were going to affect the system down the line um, or uh, affect the, the, the district. So creating 90 day goals so that we could condense our, our um, the things that we needed to achieve uh, into a more manageable system. Sometimes when you uh, make your goals too big, it's hard to achieve them. So trying to break them down into quarterly rocks, we call them, so that we could meet uh, each goal in a quarter time frame and then move on to the next one. New billing software purchased and implemented. Uh, the current billing software that was uh, being utilized by the district was uh, very poor. It had uh, poor reporting uh, mechanisms. It, it, it was not uh, very user friendly. And there was a lot of questions about the accuracy of the information that was input into that. So bringing on the ENCODE software uh, was, a, was a huge step for the district. Uh, implementing a QGIS and Geosync cloud system, um, mapping in the district was very poor. It was a lot of, I think the water line's over here, I think the water line's over there. So uh, we implemented a GIS system that we could map and we actually used several different maps that were given to us by um, entities like Kentucky Rural Water Association, as well as some from the University of Kentucky. 
to uh, to put together a map and then using the QGIS and Geosync Cloud to update as we go through. Uh, it also allows for leak tracking, so we're able to go through and we're able to put down reported leaks. We're able to GIS those leaks, and then we're able to um, to create a log of repaired leaks that will help us identify areas in the system that are in great need for uh, total replacement of water line. GISing the meters, um, a lot of questions about multiple homes on one tap, meters that are there, meters that are not there. Um, so going through each one, actually it's a, this says 1300 meters mapped this, uh, to date, but that's actually about 1440 meters mapped to date. Um, and then, like I said, the leak mapping on the GIS system, which has been incredibly helpful. With our water loss program, which we'll talk about a little bit more as I go down through this, um, we identified master meter zones. Um, the system did have one thing um, that was really in its favor, is that they had established meter zones with master meters in different districts. 40 East, 40 West, Turkey, all had uh, master meters that they could identify uh, areas that um, water was going in, uh, which helped us break down the system into zones. Um, critical operation equipment for regulatory compliance and leak detection. We purchased some leak detection devices. We purchased some uh, lab equipment, developed SOPs. One of the things that we found was that there was no standard operating procedures. There was no, um, there was very few document, documented procedures for how to properly handle a situation. So sometimes um, one situation may be handled one way uh, on Monday and on Friday that same situation might be handled a different way uh, from a different person. So creating standardized SOPs for our processes was, was a huge achievement. Um, redundancy in pumps, putting pumps in booster stations, which is an ongoing process, and safety equipment purchasing trench boxes for our employees when they're when they're working in holes and making them follow safety procedures wearing hard hats and reflective clothing and flagging practice practices um, things like replacing booster stations which not only helps with the way things look but also helps with insulation of those booster stations it helps with maintaining those the integrity of the systems for longer periods of time um, and, and it helps with, uh, helps with the employees having a sense of accomplishment when they can see that they're, they're doing things to make the system better as opposed to just, um, well, you can see the picture here with the booster station that was falling apart. Um, that There's no insulation. The, the booster station is exposed to the elements. So getting something, a building made that is uh, as insulated and safe and secure that we can lock down to the ground and secure from anyone being able to tamper with it as well. Alliance Water Resources brought three trucks to the district. The district had a lot of vehicles that were in a state of disrepair that were not working. Um, uh, so there was a, a shortage in vehicles. So Alliance Water Resources were able to provide three vehicles, uh, trucks for uh, the Alliance employees to use in the district, um, repairing excavators, um, tracks for the excavators, and uh, a dump truck, putting a transmission in the dump truck so that they can um, remove spoils when they're working in their uh, excavation areas. I think one of the most important things to note is that when we are working in the system, we're fixing the issues that we find the right way. Um, the pictures that you see here, the one on the left is a picture of a repair that was made and they used Gorilla Tape to um, repair the, the break in the line as well as can hold the T instead of using restraint couplings as you see in the picture on the right and thrust blocks. So proper techniques for repairing uh, breaks in the system that will help for the long term and, and make sure that that repair is, is, ma is made for good. Um, developing a theft of water SOP. Uh, theft of water is is something that uh, has been an issue in Martin County. Um, in my experience with the districts, uh, the utilities I've worked for, um, it's, it's much higher than I've ever seen. So uh, developing an SOP on how we, um, how we 
find it, how we fix it, and how we how we deal with the theft of water when we find it uh, was a was a big achievement as well. Inventory control pro program, and then um, fixing things like access roads to tanks and booster stations and things of that nature. Disaster response, uh, I think, is really important. Uh, everyone knows about the February ice storm. We lost power to the Inez water treatment plant and uh, 40 East booster station, as well as the 40 West booster station. Um, the, the water treatment plant lost power for 18 hours, and um, we were able to keep from losing all the water in the, the clear wells based on all the repairs that we have made in the district to date. Um, I think that that's a, a great achievement because um, historically they, they would have lost all the water and Inez would have been out of water, which was, it was great that we were able to keep Inez in water. Unfortunately, the other booster stations did fail and uh, we were able to receive a generator from Kentucky Rural Water Association as well as move a variable frequency drive from one booster station to another while we were waiting on delivery of the VFD from Texas. So we were able to make some things, uh, make some repairs quickly to get water back up and running there. On the 28th, we had a flood, which everybody is uh, very aware of. Um, once again, lost power to the booster stations. When we regained power to the booster stations, uh, power was coming in, what we call dirty power. It was uh, all, all three phases weren't coming in. So we had another VFD failure and uh, we were able to to get a VFD put in there to to correct that situation. We have multiple slips throughout the system. So uh, breaks uh, on Turkey and breaks in uh, 292 and Poplar Fork, large areas of the system where uh, slot slips had just taken out our water line. Um, and uh, fortunately, Alliance Water Resources was able to bring in employees from other districts to come in and help with those repairs. And uh, uh, and thanks to some of the employees from Cape Girardeau and Lincoln County, uh, we actually were able to, in the instance of Poplar Fork, um, come up with a, um, a better process for, for a temporary installation of a water line um, where we brought in a, uh, a new product called Yellow Mine and were able to implement it a uh, four inch line to maintain the same line that, that was already there, but run it across the top of the slip to ensure that those customers were in water. Now it took us a while to get to this. We tried many different uh, ways of getting water to these customers. Um, and ultimately this was what was to, found to be the best fix. And, and uh, our hope is that it will maintain until uh, that we're able to go in, the county is able to go in and fix that slip. Uh, on Turkey Creek, uh, there were six different breaks in one uh, particular area um, where the slip had taken out the mountain. And uh, I think going back to what I spoke about earlier with the repairs that we're making, making repairs the right way the first time, when we went in, we found uh, a valve that was broken in the closed position. And someone in the past had taken a two inch line and routed around that valve and just kept, it was a six inch valve. They'd taken a two inch line and routed around that valve. So we were able We've lost audio. Mr. Miller, can you hear me? We've lost, apparently we've lost the audio. We were at slide nine when... Uh, This is um, Brittany Koenig from the PSC. We're in the middle of the hearing and we need 
to get it. So we can verify that each, each customer has a meter and then doing leak tracking, reporting leaks, then changing them to active and then repairing them and keeping them tracked on our GIS system and then developing reports for those so that we can see where the large portion, the large areas of our system are we're seeing the biggest problems, um, um, what we're calling trouble zones. And then of course our water loss SOP and using that M36 manual, which we believe uh, the AWWA M36 uh, has a best approach for water loss um, reduction. Excuse so me. using a strategic Excuse me, Mr. approach. Mr. I'm sorry. Chairman, um, can we check, Mr. Miller, did you realize that we lost the audio for a little bit? No, ma'am. Okay, so we were on slide nine, I believe. Um, I, I think that's correct. When the audio went off. Uh, do you still have, do you have me now? We, yes. Yeah, we do have audio now, but uh, I'm not sure that we... Uh, we well obviously if you weren't aware that the audio went off uh much of your presentation uh that included material on slide nine was is not on the record so you okay. have to ask but you may have to back up and and, and do that again that's fine and if i can jump in here craig uh, commissioners we there was no indication on our end that we had lost the audio so if that were to happen again, if you would let us know uh, immediately, uh, hopefully we can so, address well, that issue. Well, I, 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 I mentioned it, that you had lost audio, but you couldn't hear us, I And suppose. I tried to contact you, Mr. Combo, um, by email and phone. Um, so I have asked your assistant for your cell phone number um, so that well, I can contact well, you. And obviously, I've got it turned off. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the hearing right but actually so that was part of the dry run i need your cell phone number so that we can communicate if there's any type of technical difficulty this is mary Carl. and it's relevant i did not lose audio so i don't know what that okay means the commissioners time. did they they let me know that the commissioners lost audio while they were watching so uh -huh. we don't know if it's on the video uh, miss cromer did you lose the audio also No, I did not. Okay. Well, apparently we it may just have been here, but uh, we lost audio in the hearing room, and the other commissioners uh, did not. They lost the audio as well. So, if you would uh, maybe begin again at uh, at slide nine, Mr. Miller. And, and Chairman, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller. Excuse we lost audio. Me. Wait, Miller. wait. Go ahead, Ms. Coning. What, what is so, it? So, Mr. Miller, if it helps at all, we think we were taking notes and we think that you were at the Turkey Creek repair. Okay. On slide nine. Certainly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, talking and going back to talk about the Turkey Creek repair a little bit again, um, where we had a slip on Turkey Creek, um, we found uh, because of the slip and then cut and then people driving across the slip once the state had come back and and made a a drive through so to speak um there we had about six different breaks in the in the water line in the area uh, while we were while we were correcting the breaks in that area we found a a valve that was broken in the closed position and what had happened is sometime it's hard telling when years ago a valve had broken and um, instead of replacing the valve uh, along the line they had just put in a two inch jumper so they had routed around that valve with a two inch line and um, and then just allow and this is a six inch line so they had just in a short span of maybe about four foot they had run a two inch line as a as a workaround to go around the broken valve so uh, what we did was we removed the valve and and put a new valve in its place and removed that two inch jumper so that water was was sufficiently flowing through that six inch line as it should and this was coming from the effluent side of the turkey tank so it was affecting uh, the entire turkey system uh, and, uh, very greatly um, from a hydraulic standpoint so uh, as i stated earlier um, correcting those problems when we find them right away as opposed to leaving them for another day and they get forgotten um, has been an effort that we've that we've been making um, anytime we find something of that nature that affects the hydraulics of the system and then um, after that uh, the emergency connection with the mountain water district 
we were able to open up that and provide water to customers on the south side of the 292 slip. Uh, it wasn't as much pressure as we uh, would like to provide ourselves because the, the, the meter is actually a smaller meter, but uh, we were able to get water to customers while we were trying to repair the slip on 290, the, the water line break on 292 from those uh, the two slips that were in that area. Um, so I thought that those are positives. Uh, while it was a, a, a very um, difficult disaster to get through, um, some of the uh, things that we were able to accomplish with the yellow mine and finding issues in our system because of the breaks um, were able to help us, I think, work uh, towards making the hydraulics of the system better. Uh, and I've actually stated to several of my employees that while the disaster was a uh, very miserable experience to go through, it was somewhat of a blessing in disguise because while we were making these repairs, we did find several hydraulic issues in the system that we were able to correct at the same time. So um, sometimes the, those things work out. Um, so going into the water loss reduction program, which everyone knows is a major issue in Martin County. Um, talking about the program that we implement, have implemented in the system, first with being uh, the GIS implementation, um, we talked about the district master meter zones that we established and how that helps us break down the customer usage versus the production that goes to those master meters. The GISing every single meter to ensure that each customer, each home has a meter um, and then that will that will enable us to be able to locate areas that have um, more homes on one tap than um, than we realize, um, as well as just verifying locations of meters so that they don't get lost, buried, um, or no longer uh, in the system. Uh, leak tracking with our GIS uh, that's part of the water loss program as well. Um, being able to track those leaks when uh, the ladies have a reported call. They are able to go right onto the, uh, the GeoSync cloud and they're able to plot a point on a map for the guys in the field and say, there's a reported leak at this area. They, they log it as reported. The, the staff in the field with the service order are able to go to that point and they are able to verify whether it is an active leak or it is not a leak. Once they verify that it's an active leak, our leak detection team verifies it's an active leak. Then once it's repaired, it's turned to a repaired leak. And that helps us create um, reports where we can verify leaks that are in large zones or specific areas to help us identify major portions of the system that need repair or what we like to call trouble zones. Um, our water loss SOP, I'm using that AWWA M36 manual um, and that's that strategic approach using the GIS, um, the PRVs and district meters for leak detection. Um, establishing a leak detection team, I believe we have a, a good team that understands the process and is doing a good job um, reading these meters and understanding the zones. And then ultimately water meter replacement, uh, replacing all the meters in the district, which is an immediate need for the district is replacing the water meters so that we can get accurate meter reading um, up and radio read system. Uh, currently, as it stands, the water district reads the meters manually every week uh, or every month, excuse me. And in the, mo in the month that they read meters, they read them in a, in a seven day span. So it takes three or it takes uh, nine employees a week long to read every single meter in the district manually. We could cut that down with a radio read system to about two employees over two days. Or if you have a, uh, an AMI system, um, one, uh, maybe even shorter time frame. So um, additionally, it also reduces the human factor of writing down a number and then taking that number and giving it to office personnel who then enter that number into the data, into the uh, billing uh, software. So with a uh, radio read system, we're able to just read the meters that are imported into the computer and then they're, they're automatically imported into uh, the, the billing software. And that eliminates a lot of human factor as well, which is incredibly important in today's in today's world. So when we talk about some of the accomplishments that I think that we have brought to the district is also a forward thinking uh, approach, looking at uh, new uh, 
new processes and new um, equipment and new um, things that will help make the district more advanced and, and further into the future as opposed to, uh, you know, reading those meters manually. And um, before the district, uh, before Alliance partnered with the district, they had two employees part time. They were actually contract employees that read meters whenever they felt like it throughout the month. So uh, we believe that with the implementation of the teams, uh, we know that the accuracy has increased dramatically on meter reading. So this is a flow chart, uh, kind of showing you a little bit about how the water loss control program works, uh, reviewing the process, verifying production flows, meter audits, which we've completed, uh, verifying meter consumption is being billed and accounted for, establishing a district meter area, where, which we have completed, um, determining flow for the metered area. Now, we have a couple of uh, uh, master meters that aren't properly uh, working right now. We're in the process of replacing two of those. And once those were replaced, one of them is actually at the 40 East Booster Station, which is a large portion of flow. So replacing that meter, which uh, will help us be able to better identify uh, the water that's flowing through 40 East down into the Warfield area, which um, is, like I said, a large portion of our flow. So this is a flow chart to just kind of show how we've broken down the district into zones, uh, going from the INES master meter at the water plant, breaking it down uh, 40 West, 40 East and Turkey. Those are kind of the, the four, four quarters, if you will, of the district. Uh, if you look at it like uh, the INES master meter feeding INES and the Turkey master meter feeding everything from Turkey on and then 40 East and 40 West, which are right you know pretty obvious on the eastern west side of the of this town of Inez going in those two directions and then we break them down from there into further sub zones and each one of these points has a master meter so we're able to take the master meter and compare it to usage on customers that are in those specific zones and then when we look at the usage on the meter versus the consumption that our customers use, we'll be able to say if in Long Branch, the customers consumed 500,000 gallons of water in a month, that's what they paid for, but we show that we pushed a million gallons through Long Branch in a month, we know that we've got a, uh, either several leaks or one large leak in that area that we need to identify. So the goal being find the area with the largest portion of water loss, attack that area first, until we've tightened it down. Once we've tightened it down to the best that we can get, moving on to the next uh, area that has the highest water loss. And we believe that that approach is gonna be the best approach to, to combat water loss in this district. Uh, this is an example of the spreadsheet that uh, we've developed that shows those metered zones and shows the different, uh, the master meters with the numbers, the books, which are actually the customer books that are in those master meters, the amount of customers in them, and then the readings of the meters that we read weekly. So we read the meters weekly, we input that data, and then we take the monthly usage of the customers, and then we are able to, to get a, a monthly bill consumption and a monthly usage, the difference, and a percentage of water loss in that area. Um, so this is this is the spreadsheet that we're using uh, to, to uh, work towards the water loss control program. This is a map that's brought from our QGIS software that shows those district meter zones. You can see them based on each color. Uh, those are the meters that are in those areas. Um, and the uh, each zone is has its own color. So it kind of shows you how the zones are breaking down, are broken down from Inez, Turkey, um, Buck Creek, so on and so forth. Some important water loss uh, notes. So uh, February water loss was at 67.7%. And then after the disaster and um, the ice storm and the flood, uh, March water loss was at 76.6%. Um, with the losses that we had, the tanks that were lost and the, um, the breaks that were in that system, we anticipated a large water loss number. Um, with the efforts that were made in the 
Uh, during the disaster, we estimated about 40 million gallons of water recovered, and uh, the water loss for the month was of, of April was down to 65.3%. Since the disaster, uh, the water plant has averaged about 1.68 million gallons a day, which is actually uh, about 200,000 gallons less than it was averaging at the same time last year in 2020, and the plant is shutting down for about four hours every other day. We've also increased our water pumping to the prison. Um, we pumped 3.2 million gallons of water to the prison area through Devella in April. And in, in the month of May, we're actually on track to pump about 3.5 million dollars, or 3.5 million gallons, excuse me, uh, through Devella up to the prison area. Talking about immediate needs, um, something that I think is important to discuss for the district um, especially when we're talking about a rate increase and, and the things that these are not wish lists, these are immediate needs, things that the district has to have in order for it to progress. Um, An AMI, AMR meter reading system, we talked about that, how, the, how a radio read system is not only uh, help, does not only help with efficiency, but it eliminates a human factor in re meter reading as well as it allows for an extra week of work for our employees that do leak repairs and leak detection to fight water loss. Right now, they lose an entire week every month just reading meters and then doing rereads and things of that nature. Um, generators for all critical infrastructure. The, there's one thing that the disaster showed us is that not having generators at our water plant and at our major booster stations is an absolute, is, is a disaster in and of itself. Uh, if we can't uh, we can't keep power on. We can't. Uh, we can't produce water. And when the power goes out, we're at the mercy of another utility to provide us with power. And that other utility, they have priorities as well, just as we do. They have hospitals. They have other areas that may be out of power that are going to take priority over the water utility. Um, so uh, we recognize that. And, and so that's why generators are an absolute uh, necessity and, and uh, necessary for all utilities to have, uh, especially in Martin County where power is an issue. Uh, pump redundancy at each one of these uh, pumps, pump stations. There are many pump stations in the district that have one pump. Uh, I think uh, over the years when they had a failure at a pump station and they were able to uh it had the same size horsepower motor they would remove a motor from one station and move it over to the other similar to what we did with the vfds uh, during the disaster the difference is what we did with the vfds during the disaster we purchased a new one once the new one was here we installed the new one and replaced the vfd back to where it belonged um, historically here when they moved a the motor there was never an effort made towards replacing that motor and then moving the other one back. So pump redundancy is an uh, is is a uh, serious issue in the district. SCADA and telemetry upgrades for the plant and remote sites. There are several areas in the system that the plant cannot see um, that our uh, our employees have to drive to the 292 booster station and turn the pump station on. Um, that's about a hour and a half to two hours a day. That, a, that an employee is driving just to turn on a pump, check the tank, come back and, and come back, start their day, and then go back out at the end of the day, check the tank, turn the pump off. Uh, SCADA and telemetry um, is, is essential for us to be able to remotely access those and, and monitor the water levels in tanks. Uh, water line replacement at multiple locations, locations that we've already identified as um, major areas of need, um, such as cold water. Um, INES has some water line issues as well. Um, and then high service pump repairs at the water plant. There are some issues with the high service uh, pumps and those are critical infrastructure to the water plant that needs, uh, needs to be addressed. And all of these projects have been put into a, uh, into a, a list and have been sent out for RFQs, which we've actually received, have not reviewed yet, but received RFQs from five different engineering firms um, for these, these specific projects, which we have highlighted here. And these are just water district um, needs. Um, so there's actually nine projects that were sent out, but these seven are just water district needs. You have meter replacement, 
you have the portable generators and fixed generators, um, SCADA upgrade at the water plant, and then water line replacement in these specific areas that we found um, have uh, immediate needs, and then the high service pump replacement as well. And uh, that that's all I have. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Craig. That was an excellent presentation. Before I make sure I don't forget, the commissioners, I would I would at this time move into evidence uh, the uh, the PowerPoint presentation utilized by uh, by Mr. Miller in his in his testimony, and we've moved that into evidence at this time. It's sustained. Uh, Craig, just a few follow up questions. Uh, you hit on the audits, but you didn't really flesh that out. Did you tell the commission about how what we've accomplished relative to the to the annual audits? So, um, as far as the audits go, when uh, Alliance partnered with the community, uh, we one of the primary concerns was getting the audits completed. Um, we were able to accomplish 2016 through 2020 audits, as well as um, with that use that information to complete the UFRs for the PSC as well. Um, so that was a, a very uh, a very arduous task uh, that took a, 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 a team of people um, that Alliance was able to to uh, to put on that effort. Very good. And we didn't talk about the efforts that you guys are making towards qualifying and licensing our staff members. Yes. So um, when the, when Alliance partnered with the, the water district, um, the water plant had staff that were licensed, but the distribution staff, um, there was there was very little licensing uh, or, or understanding of how to properly um, work a distribution system. So uh, one of the efforts that Alliance makes is we, we really uh, try to empower our employees and, and help them uh, educate them on not only how to do their jobs properly, but also to achieve proper licensing. It only helps them and it helps the district when all the employees are licensed. So we've made an effort to train our employees as well as pay for them to take classes uh, and, and go take licensing. We've had, um, I've had five employees go for distribution licensing. I've had uh, several employees go for, I have one employee that's gotten a class two uh, water supply license. That's a new license, as well as uh, distribution licenses uh, in the system. Um, so we've had five new employees currently since Alliance has partnered with the community that have that are licensed. Fantastic. <clears throat> what do, what kind of challenges did you face uh, in this transition, Craig, when you when you came into Martin County and uh, and you had a, a bunch of employees who were used to doing things a certain way? Uh, what kind of uh, program did you implement to, uh, to I guess, uh, get them doing it the Alliance way? So, you talk about transition and culture change uh, when a uh, prof when a professional management company comes in. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of what's going to happen. How are things going to be? Um, you know, as, as it's very as it's. Uh, May have been made aware to many people, including the Public Service Commission. There has been a lot of turnover uh, since Alliance has partnered with the community. And a lot of that has to do with um, accountability, uh, holding employees accountable. Some of it has to do with, you know, encouraging the education portion, trying to get licensed. Um, but accountability is huge. And um, we also created a organizational structure that didn't exist before. Um, when we came here, the district had a general manager and it, everybody just kind of answered to the general manager. Uh, what we've done is we've created supervisors in each area. We, we have a water supervisor, we have a distribution supervisor, um, and, and then of course we have an office manager and then we have um, on the, as well on the wastewater side as well. And we've created a leadership team and that leadership team meets weekly. And we discuss issues, we put, we, we create to do's, we work towards um, helping the system in the long run, as well as we're able to collaborate and talk about issues and how best to fix those issues. 
So with those, the setting up of that organizational structure, we're able to also hold employees accountable for their time, efficiency in their operations, um, making sure that they're contacting the supervisor when they're finished with a task and moving on to the next task, knowing where they're at at all times and what's going on and, and ensuring that we're doing things the right way. And if you don't know, ask somebody. Um, so uh, that, that's, that was, a, I think, a big culture change, um, creating that kind of structure and then, uh, you know, just having, uh, holding the employees to a sense of professionalism. You know, presenting yourself in a professional manner, continuing to keep our system looking well, um, keeping some, something as simple as keeping your truck cleaned out so you can find your tools, uh, providing them with tools that they, a lot of employees were using their own tools, uh, we found, that a lot of employees had their own tools that they were using, so asking them to take them home, purchasing tools, and um, giving them the tools that they need to do their job. Uh Sounds good, Craig. Uh, let's talk now about what I think is something of maybe particular interest to the to the mission commission is the cost savings that Alliance has brought to the district. Yes. So um, an interesting thing about cost savings is uh, when the district for when the Alliance first partnered with the district, we actually sat down with the chemical supplier for the district and discussed the cost of chemicals. Um, and when we discussed how the process would work and that Alliance would be making the purchases for chemicals, they gave us an immediate 32.2% decrease in chemicals. That 32.2% um, from 2019 to 2020, uh, the review of those actual expenses showed that we saved about uh, $55,632 uh, in, in just chemical expense. Um, additionally, we have uh, an inventory control program where in the past the district would, uh, if they had an issue, they would run out and they would purchase a, a part from uh, a local vendor or uh, a supplier, the supplier, the sole supplier that supplied them with um, parts. Uh, we were able to partner with a vendor who provided us with a consignment inventory that we, we um, count weekly. And with that weekly count, we receive an invoice for what we use. So what we found is um, we're also uh, becoming more efficient and streamlining operations when team members don't have to spend an hour driving to meet somebody to bring them apart. It's already on hand. We just get billed for it when we count it at the end of the week. And then, of course, there are administrative savings that, uh, um, that Ann Perkins will talk about later on. Uh, in this hearing, um, a lot of administrative savings that is there. And I think it's also important to note that not only with, well, uh, this is, is, is a, a, a uh, this is shown savings for the district is that uh, one of the things that surprised me the most was that there weren't more vendors willing to work with the district. Once I realized the financial state of the district, it made a lot more sense. Vendors simply didn't want to work with the district. They were afraid that they wouldn't pay their bills. Um, I heard, I was actually told a story by a vendor who came and did a tour with me where she stated that in the 15 years that she'd been working in water utilities, she was actually told by her mentor, never go to Martin County. Don't even bother, just don't go because they'll never buy anything from you. It's not worth your time. So when she came here and had a tour with me, it was actually the first time she'd ever been to Martin County. We've actually been able to bring on several new vendors for parts, for pumps, for motors. Um, and, and what that does is create competition. And when we can create competition, we can get the best price for the products that we need. Uh, a couple of other points, Craig. Uh, uh, something that came to mind when you were talking earlier about pumping to the prison, those numbers that you just quoted sounded like new numbers to me. Is that, or is that some of the best we're, be, we're doing? Um, I believe that that is the best that the district has done. Um, I, I haven't looked at a lot of historical data since we've been here, the best numbers that we've had. Um, and I know that um, a 
an example is that uh, I was actually called by the city of Prestonsburg last week where they told us exactly uh, the, the amount of money that they were going to be sending. And I believe it's the largest check we've seen was over $10,000 for that $3.2 that we were able to pump to the prison. So um, I believe that those are much higher numbers than they've ever seen. Fantastic. Now, uh, you, you've told us about all the savings and all the, the, the cost uh, benefits. Uh, what, why do we need this emergency rate increase? <laughs> well, uh, I think it's I think it's given based on the financial information that the district is operating in the red monthly. We are uh, we are working uh, against a, a a a very difficult task of trying to operate a system without the financial means to do so. And every month that the district works in the negative is one more month that the district is not using the DAS, DSS to, to pay off debt, is not paying off debt, and is not working towards financial stability to help uh, progress this system into the future. This rate increase was proposed with our budget for 2021 back in November. In November, we recognized that there was a major issue. We, we asked for this rate increase back in November we, we were able to get it approved by the board, but then we, we recognized that this rate increase was part of our budget, right? We had budgeted numbers that said, we need this rate increase to achieve $250,000 deficit. We are currently in May of 2021. As it stands, we're looking at a loss of $125,000 of budgeted finances that the district needs just to break even. We're not talking about buying anything we're not talking about buying equipment we're not talking about you know investing into the district we're talking about paying the bills that is it and just to, to kind of clean everything up i want to make sure that, that the commission knows your uh, attitude towards the reception that alliance received relative to the board of commissioners of the water district how, how were you received by the, the board of directors of, or the board of commissioners of the water district? Um, I think initially the board of directors were um, worried and, and I say worried in the sense that they had worked their guts out uh, to in particular uh, Jimmy and John to to help the district get to where it was while they were when they came on board and um, the efforts that they had made. Um, I know, for example, with Jimmy. Uh, the first couple of months that I was here, he called me every day. How are things going? How are things going? Is everything all right? Do you need anything from me? Is there something I can do? I know John, hey, is everything going okay? Is everything, uh, do you need anything? Can I help with something? Do you need any you know, contacts for somebody? What can I do? And as time has gone on, um, I think, and I hope that they're grateful, they're actually have been able to back away because the, the, the commissioners don't get paid to be on the board. They do this for free. And they have worked hard for the district to try to help it make better, help it be better for free. So um, I think that they're probably a little bit grateful to be able to go back to their day jobs. <laughs> um, they, they've certainly been incredibly helpful. Um, they have uh, given advice when needed, and they've asked for opinions when needed. Um, they've been, in my opinion, they've been excellent to work for and work with. Very good, Greg. That's all. All the questions I have. Okay. Thank you. Here's how we'll uh, move forward with Mr. Miller's testimony. Uh, Ms. Koenig, on behalf of staff, will uh, ask uh, questions, and then the commissioners, uh, me, uh, uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, and uh, uh, Dr. Matthews, uh, followed up by Ms. Cromer, and then, Mr. Cumbo, if you have any uh, redirect, uh, you'll be permitted to do so, okay? Right, Ms. Coney, got any questions for Mr. Miller? Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Miller. Can you hear me? Well, may I ask a question here? Uh, I think I had a note, Mr. Cumbo, that wondered if you could, if you could appear on the screen uh, at the same time as, as uh, Mr. Miller. I don't know if you can. You're at the same office, but... I can scoot over. We can, so we can, we can uh, sit by side. Uh, I don't I think anybody asked you to hug up with him 
or anything, but uh, you can, I, just, I think someone asked if you could appear on the screen, and I don't know if, if, if that meant side by side. I assume that maybe that was a different. Uh, yeah, I, I've already taken my tie off. Should I put my tie back on? No, well. I just think you need to be on the record um, when you're questioning, Mr. Combo. So if you want to work it when you're questioning or whatever that you're on the screen, um, it's just for the video record. So okay. if you just want to work it to when you're questioning your witnesses to be on the screen, that's fine. Okay. Well, now that we have that, you there can you can either stay on the screen, Mr. Combo, or you can slide off and uh, how how everybody <laughs> wants to do it. <laughs> All right, uh, Miss Coney, please. Uh, uh, begin your questioning. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me, Mr. Miller? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just let me know if you can't hear me and if something happens to the audio, um, Mr. Combo has my cell phone, just text and let us know. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. That was a lot of good information and I'm just gonna ask a few questions um, and try to not have you repeat as much, but I just wanna, um, highlight some areas and so I'm looking at I guess what you just mentioned about um, Prestonsburg's check for $10,000 um, can you explain it I saw the board meeting was streamed live the other day and you were talking about owing them $2,000 as well can you can you explain yes, why you owe two thousand dollars to Prestonsburg? Well, yes, ma'am. So, so basically, the way that the the, the system is set up is that if we, um, you know, we we either pay Prestonsburg if we don't pump enough water, or we receive a check from Prestonsburg if we pump enough water, right? So during the disaster, um, we actually had a failure on a pump at the Vela, and we're not able to pump during the disaster. So we had a bill from Prestonsburg for, for a little over $2,000, which we actually ended up, we did send them a check for that amount, and then they're sending us a check for the full amount for this month's uh, readings. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and then I have a question. Um, you provided our division of inspection with monthly water loss reports. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay. And for January 2021, February 2021, March 2021, and April 2021. And um, we'd like to submit those as PSC Exhibit 1. Um, and so I think that the our um, assistants can pull those up on the screen for reference. Um, Travis, can you pull those up at this time? But I have a question about one of the items on your report. Okay. And I'll, I'll wait for him to get those on the screen if he can. I just don't know that everybody has, I, I, there we go. Um, is this the right, is this the document you're referencing? They would have been in an email. That is the water loss strategy from their application. That's not what I'm referring to. Um, I'm referring to their monthly water loss reports. That's okay. Okay, I'm not sure that we can get those, so I'll just move on. But do we know what his problem is that he doesn't know? I don't. I don't are? have any communication with him. Well, can we send somebody up? Does anyone here, Holly, in, in the room know what those water loss reports look like? Maybe someone could yeah. run those. Here up they there. are, for the record, for the hard copy. Um, and I don't know. I not, I know what Martin County has these, but I don't think that the concerned citizens. Um, I don't know that they have them. On hand, they've seen them before, but um, well, it's saying let let them be filed. But I, I do think we ought, 
need to get it on the screen because I might want to ask a question about it myself if uh, whoever's operating this video can uh, uh, can do that. Okay. Um, and I don't know if he can even hear us. I he, he, he can. can. He, he, I he can. said that he can't locate oh. that exhibit. Well, uh, uh, could so, one of the gentlemen here find those and go up and see if he can, you can, he can, uh, Okay. Thank you. So, you may proceed on another line. Okay, thanks. Okay, let, we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, okay. Let's see, I'm going to try to pick something that doesn't require an exhibit. <laughs> okay, Mr. Miller, sorry about the delay. Um, I'm going to refer to the... Um, information that you filed just recently, May 26, um, you filed and entitled it Responses to Public Service Commission's Second Data Request. Question one um, was how far past due is the utility on paying alliance and the management fee? And you spoke a little bit that you're in the red and, and this is part of what the district owes. Um, it states Alliance invoices Martin County Water District twice monthly on the first of the month and the 16th and that you've listed April 1st, April 15th and May 1st invoices were past due. Um, is May 15th also past due? It, it's not considered past due yet. Okay. But uh, that's probably a question best for Ann Perkins. Okay, She's sure. probably best to answer that question. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to touch briefly on your presentation about some of the areas that you listed um, with improving uh, matters at Martin County Water District. And so was a lot, uh, the theme of the application was that you were going for better management, and and better data is that fair to say yes ma'am okay and and by better data i mean like data that was had integrity that you could that you could check that it had internal controls yes ma'am control secure. internal controls accuracy um absolutely reporting abilities um and and correct integrity okay and um so would you say that um I'm trying not to to have to go over everything but um one of the big things was the billing software and what was wrong with the old billing software well uh one of the things notably was the lack of reporting ability um so the staff had a difficult time putting together reports um uh with inf and information uh it was a very very cumbersome program. It was not user friendly at all. Uh, but once again, Ann Perkins, uh, she's a resident expert on ENCODE and billing, and she'll be best probably okay. to answer that question as well. Okay, but is that, that data that was created from that software is what the PSC had to work with in the last rate case, is that true? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so, would you say that the data that the Public Service Commission was working with was not accurate? Uh, I can't speak to its accuracy. Um, not be, not having been here, I would say that it was lacking. Okay, but on the amounts that we were given to work with, as, try, as far as trying to get Martin County to a bottom line, or um, from what you understand that the Public Service Commission does as far as setting rates to make sure that a um, water utility can maintain operations and financial stability. The Public Service Commission relies on the data that the water utilities collect. And so would you have been secure based on the data that you were looking at when you arrived at Martin County? Would you say that the Public Service Commission had a clear picture of what the utility needed based on the data? That I believe that previous reports that were given to the Public Service Commission related to the needs of the district and the rate were accurate. Um, I think that the, that our application currently 
that we're at, uh, that we're applying for now states that very clearly. Um, we're, we're showing the same deficits that the previous um, information that was delivered to the PSC um, still exist. Okay. So, um, all right, with the billing, what is the staffing situation at the district? Are you fully staffed in your field? Uh, billing office and the in the billing office yes ma'am okay and are you fully staffed in field operations uh, we are actually short one plant operator but other than the plant operator we are fully staffed yes ma'am okay um, are you so are you in compliance with the state and federal regulations with regards to staffing levels at your treatment plant yes ma'am and distribution operators too yes ma'am okay um, As far as billing goes, switching to billing software, was that the only improvement or have you published any written policies or procedures with regard to there customer been, billing? Yes, ma'am. There have been quite a few policies and SOPs that have been created in the billing office for, um, for especially with the new ENCODE software. Uh, the, we have uh, put together SOPs for um, how, to, how to utilize the software as well as um, using the tariff and developing SOT, SOPs for customer service. Okay, great. And um, do you rent the Collier Center for your billing office? The water district does, yes, ma'am. Okay. And did the rent increase in 2020? Yes, ma'am, it did. Is that a question for Ann Perkins? Uh, or do you know how much? There was a contract. There was a, a rental agreement. I think that the lease event was up last June or I, I don't remember the exact date. Uh, forgive me, but the the lease agreement was was reinitiated last summer sometime, um, and there was an increase at that time. But I don't recall how much it was off the top of my head. That's okay. And do you think that Miss Perkins will know that, or I'm sure that she'll be able to find that answer. Okay. And. Have you reviewed the public comments that have been filed in this case? I have reviewed m many of them, yes, ma'am. Okay, and I know that you spoke about um, customer education and outreach in the application. Can you go into that a little bit more? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. So I think that um, perception is a, is a major issue with the water district. And its customers. There have been a lot of questions and a lot of uh, distrust between the customers and the water district um, for for many different reasons. Um, many of them historical in nature. Uh, and I think that it goes a long way when you are informing your customers of what's going on, as well as informing your customers of the expectations. So one of the things, the efforts that we have made is to utilize our social media platform much more to inform customers of issues in the system, as well as inform them of things such as um, the theft of water policy and, and what theft of water looks like and how it'll impact the customers and how theft of water impacts the ratepayers, those that aren't um, uh, stealing water and are paying their, um, their, their um, uh, bills every month so um, making an effort to to communicate with our customers as well as in-person communication um, and and informing them of things that we're doing and trying to educate them about water quality um, about uh, the hydraulics of the system about meters and how to use them um, and how how to read them if they would like to um, and and just trying to make an effort and a presence in the community to to help bridge the gap and help um, put help kind of heal some of the old um, distrust that's been created. Okay, and specifically, um, did the district make an effort to help connect customers having trouble paying their bills to aid that was given during COVID? Absolutely. I, I in my opinion, the, the staff did a, a wonderful job, um, not only trying to communicate with customers, but also um, staff in the office um, did a lot of applications themselves for customers, which uh, is going above and beyond, um, in my opinion, 
helping the ratepayers, not not just calling them and saying, hey, you know, you, you need to apply for this, but actually applying for the for them and saying, hey, we've got the, the information done. Either you just need to come in and sign or you need to call this number. Everything's been submitted for you. Um, so I believe that the, the staff in the office did a, a really good job of that. Okay. And so do you have a plan of attack as far as addressing the public comments and, and connecting that up to your outreach program to address those customers that have reached out in this case? Um, I have not put together a plan yet, but it is something that I've been working around in my head, just trying to to identify the major concerns and, and how we can correct them. Okay. But like you said, as far as the perception, um, educating the customers is very important. And, um, and you mentioned uh, that you're not asking for things that are luxuries uh, as far as the rate increase and the emergency rate increase go um, the the rates are covering baseline items that are were already in your budget that are required to keep the utility functioning is that correct um yes ma'am that is correct okay and so would you say that when you started at, at Martin County in January 2020, um, when you got there, you were in a desperate situation or the utility was in a desperate situation? Uh, the most desperate situation I've ever seen. Okay. And so you're trying to uh, work out of this situation and um, there was the formation of the Martin County Water District Work Group that brought several different agencies together, and you're a part of that. Can you kind of describe what what that work group is? Um, yes, ma'am. So, um, truthfully, the district, this water district, has more collaboration with more state agencies than I've ever experienced in my 14 plus years working in utilities. Um, you know, I've actually spoken to to several colleagues back in Ohio and, and said, you, you know, you don't understand the level of scrutiny that I'm under on a daily basis. Um, and, and it's not, it's, it's been, there's been a lot of benefit, um, to it, um, in that, uh, getting the, my, my relationship with the division of water, for example, I believe, uh, in my opinion, it is really, um, is really strong because, um, we're able to discuss issues, uh, with the work group specifically, um, you know, just enlightening state agencies and the Secretary of Energy um, and, 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 and telling people where we're at and where we're headed and the plan and then getting insight and, and, and assistance from those agencies and how to best um, enact our, our plan of action. And, and, and uh, it's, it's been, um, it's been a, a really awesome opportunity um, very overwhelming but um, at times at times for sure but uh, I, I can say that I think that there's been a lot of uh, benefits to it but it is also a lot of work there's a lot of time and effort put into putting together these presentations for all of the various work groups that we're a party to I, I can understand that would and so would you say that you have a great deal of transparency because of this. without without question I, I don't I, I can't say that there's more transparency in a utility anywhere that I've ever seen okay and would you say that's a good thing for a water district that's in a desperate distressed situation to put everything Absolutely. on the I, table I think the transparency is is as always important and, ne and necessary okay and and part of your education to the public as far as letting them know what the situation is how desperate things are and kind of the levels of desperation that you're climbing out of right yes ma'am okay so i'd like to ask you some specific things about your application and specifically attachment 4g your water loss plan just to get some clarification you were discussing and i believe it's on your um slideshow as well but I don't have page numbers on mine, so, but um, I'm, I'm going to ask you about your water loss plan. And our division of inspect inspections looked at it um, and felt like it was, it was solid. Um, 
but we just want to clarify as far as and and I want to I was trying to follow along when you're explaining about the master meters um, can you just clarify as to what order of steps where you are as far as what you have finished um, because it was confusing as far as what will happen with the master meter or what what is happening with the master meter yes ma'am okay so currently as it stands we're reading the master meters weekly um, we have recently uh, we've been working this process trying to streamline it you know when you with when you have a lack of information the first thing you have to do is establish a baseline right so um, the first thing we're trying to do is establish a baseline and so with the spreadsheet that um, we've created and uh, we've recreated and we it's actually gone through several uh, iterations um, to where we can break down the zones and then once we established those zones identifying all of the meters um, and, and identifying that they're working. Um, sometimes there's uh, miscommunication between field staff and, and myself or field staff and billing. And so getting, uh, for example, that 40 East, the 40 East meter is an important meter, but it's not a cheap meter. It's a very expensive meter that we need to replace because it's a large meter. I believe it's a four inch. And um, so it's, a, uh, it's something that we have to purchase to replace. And because it's not rebuildable, it's an old style meter. So that's been one of the, that's been the challenge that's kind of holding us up from really pushing forward in this because all of the water that goes to Warfield 292 goes through 40 East, right? Uh, including the Meat House area and uh, Wolf Creek. And so there's a large portion of water that flows through the system in that area that we need to be able to deduct to really identify, to street, to really uh, tighten up those zones. So getting that meter replaced is, is right now at the top of our list. Okay. So uh, that, that's what we're working towards to, to, to get this spreadsheet working. Okay, so that's the top priority, um, but you do have some, so you said part of the process is identifying the meters, and that was one of your progress report items, was that you have identified all the meters now, okay, and that was progress from where you started. Yes, ma'am. And so, yes, ma'am. But, but are you working with some master meters now, or? You, and, yes, ma'am, we, not... we are using, right. yes, okay. ma'am, the, the meters that we currently have we're using, and our leak detection team has a, uh, has a formula that they use to base uh, flow rates for customers in an area. So they're currently using those master meters with the, the formula that they were given uh, by Kentucky Real Water Association. We're just uh, waiting on this last meter so we can use the spreadsheet as well. Okay, great. So and they're currently using zone meters, yes ma'am. Okay, great. Um, and then you mentioned Kentucky Rural Water Association helping with leak detection and that your participation in the work group that you're using, utilizing multiple state uh, resources and agencies and groups. Um, do you feel like the work group has helped you identify um, access to groups and resources that you can use? Yes, ma'am. So would you say that you have tried, well, it, it looks like to me on the items that you've mentioned for improvement that you have focused on what you can control as the manager and the, the items that are left are the big ticket items that you're going to need assistance um, yes, as far as the infrastructure, the master meters and the big ticket items. Is that accurate? Well, replace, replace, replacing master meters is, I mean, it is, a, it's an expense, but it's an expense that we'll, we'll bear the cost of because it's essential to getting our, our process working. But, um, you know, I, I believe that, yes, we're attacking the, the things that we can control and then, um, you know, seeking guidance and then financial assistance for the things that are outside of our ability to control. Okay. And then part of that is also identifying when you need funds and, and that you have been um, analyzing your rate sufficiency and trying to maintain that. You said that you had identified problems in November and started to work toward applying for a rate increase. Um, okay, and then you also mentioned that the utility has not been able to pay down any of its debt because the surcharge funds were exhausted. And um, Okay, and so would you equate 
the uh, part of the reason that you are in for the emergency rate increase is because the utility is behind on debt service. It's behind on, uh, it's out of its covenants for its loans, and it also is behind on payments to Alliance. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And would you consider those that situation um, dire and an emergency? Without question. Okay. Thanks. I have no further questions. I have some. Do you think we can find the water wall? Okay, Mr. Miller, I'm looking at the January 2021 water loss, and it shows the water loss percentage was 74.64%. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, in essence, every uh, 100 gallons of water that the district produces, uh, out of every 100 gallons that it produces for sale, 74.64% 6, of that water never gets to the customer but is lost in the system through leaks? Uh, I think that I missed the first part of your question, uh, Mr. All right. Commissioner. All right. Your water loss is 74.64% during January 2021. Right. Yes, sir. Does that mean that for every 100 gallons of water that Martin County produces for sale, uh, about rounded to the closest number, 75% of that water in January was lost in the ground or somewhere else, but it was, it was processed but couldn't be sold, correct? That is, that is correct, yes, sir. Right. Well, it was processed and it was either lost through leaks theft of water or any other areas that well, it might have. Well, yes, whatever, whatever the cost was to produce that water through chemicals, of, pumping, elect, electricity, and so forth, you could all, the most you could recover was 25% of that cost, correct? Uh, well, yes, sir. I believe that that is correct, 25%. All right. All right. So, so a, a water utility cannot expect to be uh, solvent or to operate on a break-even basis as long as it is losing 75% uh, of the product that it produces and is never able to sell. Is that substantially correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now. That water loss, we know, and we've had a number of hearings, maybe 10, 15 hearings since 2016 uh, on Martin County, and we know that that water loss has been a problem for many, many years prior to the time that Alliance came into the system. Is, is water loss at the level of 70, 75 percent, which Martin County has been experiencing. Is that evidence, in your opinion, of a system that has failed operationally, structurally, its infrastructure is, is failing? Uh, miss, uh, Mr. Commissioner, I don't think I could have said it any better myself. Um, a, a system that has that kind of water loss is, is absolutely failed. Now, uh, absent uh, replacing infrastructure, uh, is there any hope of, of the system ever being sustainable from an operational or financial standpoint? Not without a rate increase, sir. Okay. All right. Let's talk about even with a rate increase. Uh, it is true, is it not, that the system will never be able to basically replace, fix the leaks, replace all of the old pipe, get the inventory that it needs 
uh, in place to run the system unless there's an infusion of cash uh, from somewhere else. Absolutely, sir. I think that, uh, Mr. Commissioner, just based on my presentation, if you looked at the amount of projects that I showed you that are that are are, are immediate needs for the district, not wish lists or things that we would like, I, I, we estimate $55 million worth of, of investment into this, this system that's not already accounted for in other projects. Huh. So absolutely, an investment or, or an infusion of cash is, is, is necessary. Uh, all right. I want to, I know that, that you, uh, I was present, I guess, at Secretary Goodman's uh, work group the last time a presentation was made, and I know that the first uh, session of that work group a couple years ago, uh, Mr. Stephen Caudill of Bell Engineering was there and he made an estimate and I'll ask him about his a little later. But based on your rough estimate, I understand it's your opinion that it will take $55 million to bring Martin County Water District's infrastructure uh, up to where it should be. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, as a person with 14, 15 or more years uh, in the water industry and water management, can you tell us for the record what the purpose of uh, allowing depreciation in rates is? What, what, what is the purpose for depreciation? To, to account for uh, making purchases for capital improvement projects. Okay. Uh, to account for depreciation in equipment that's that's bound to fail. When you're working in a utility, you, you can't, you don't fix things for today and just worry about today. You have to talk about the future. You have to continue to improve the system. You have to continue to upgrade the system. Capital improvement project. In previous utilities that I worked for, Mr. Commissioner, we had a $15 million capital improvement, five-year CIPs. We had capital improvement projects that went five years, 10 years. We're always working towards making the system better. Things You, you can't just put pipe in the ground and expect it to live forever. It, you know, Some pipe has 50-year life expectancy. Some of that pipe has exhausted its life expectancy here in Martin County, especially when you have a system with the terrain, the type of terrain that they have here, where you know you're going over mountains and you have poor construction habits that just put rock back or stone, you know, boulders back on top of pipe. It's it's it, it degrades if you don't replace pumps, if you don't prevent it, you don't do preventative and 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 long-term maintenance on pumps, and you don't replace them, you, you they fail, and when they fail, you can't. Uh, you can't produce water, which is essential. Well, when when a company, a water company, whether it's a, a, a publicly owned uh, uh, operation like Martin County's or, or an investor-owned utility, uh, in its rates, uh, it basically uh, should with put money back in reserve uh, and have an infrastructure plan so as to replace pipes, pumps, uh, and other uh, facilities and equipment before it actually wears out. Is that correct? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, we, you know, mo a lot of utilities develop a master plan, which is off oftentimes a 30-year projection of a utility. And in that master plan, that's where you develop your CIP, where you're replacing pumps that you know are going to fail. But these, the, everything has a life cycle. And a life cycle is, is you don't want to go to the end of the life cycle before you discuss how you're going to get the money to replace them. You have to plan for the future. So the rates absolutely, um, you know, uh, account for uh, funding towards those types of repa okay. repairs and replacements. And, and, if, and if the portion of rates that should be uh, accounted for as depreciation or put in reserve to make uh, uh, equipment replacements and upgrades is used for current operating expenses and payroll, et cetera. What does that mean in terms of uh, ultimately uh, uh, keeping and maintaining the system uh, uh, as it should be? Well, uh, well, Mr. Commissioner, I mean, if you're using those funds for operations, you're not, you're not preparing yourself for an inevitable uh, failures. You're not, you're not planning for the future and you're not, you know, we're not, we're not talking about making things pretty. 
We're talking about fixing things that you know are going to fail. They're mechanical failures, hydraulic issues. Um, you're not planning for that, and you're you are putting yourself immediately. You're putting yourself at a disadvantage, and and you're leading to inevitable failure. Had based on your education, training, and experience, had prior management over the last 25 years in Martin County Water District, basically uh, uh, appropriately maintained its rates and, and uh, used its depreciation reserve on infrastructure as opposed to letting the system deteriorate. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether it would be in the present dire circumstances that it's in right now? I, I think that, that uh, the answer to that question is, uh, is kind of twofold. Uh, if they had done so appropriately, yes, sir. Uh, but I think that that also comes with having um, a management that understands how to do such a thing. Um, you know, you, you can't just put money aside if you don't have a plan. So you have to have um, the educated um, knowledge of how to properly do that. Well, wait, so wait, wait, they, wait. But not only they didn't put any money aside, is that correct? No, sir, they did and, not. And is, if they had a plan, did you ever did you ever find out what it was? Well, no, sir, I've never seen a plan. Right, so they had no plan and they put no money aside and and whatever whether it was through uh, basically a lack of management skill or basically an in, intentionally uh, basically just uh, uh, never raising rates and allowing the system to fall apart the problem is, is that right now Martin County would Martin County system in your opinion will cost about 55 million dollars to, to fix or replace, correct? Yes, sir. And the customer base in Martin County for the water district is about 3,500 customers, correct? Yes, sir. And that system is no longer, uh, they might, it might be cheaper if they never had a system to start with and put it in than, than try to basically work through and repair what, what's there, correct? I don't know that I would say cheaper, sir. Um, I, I think that, you know, when you talk about building a water plant, you know, you, you're talking about a large expense, but uh, I, I don't know if I would say cheaper, but it certainly uh, wouldn't cost you as much <laughs> to maintain if it was new, so. Let, let, me, uh, let me ask you a couple questions about your emergency uh, rate uh, request. Uh, in figures, I guess, that we have seen here, uh, and, and yours may be a little different. We'll ask your accountant uh, and, and business people later. But it looks like that from January 1st of 2021 through April the 30th of 2021, the Martin County Water District has operated at a net loss of $188,657. Would you disagree with that? I... I, d I would not disagree with that. The debt to vendors, <laughs> find it here, was or is, according to these figures that we got from, from your all's records, that as of May 25th, 2021, the Martin County Water District owed vendors on past due accounts, accounts that under state law are required to be paid within 30 days of receipt of an invoice is $732,897.77. Is that, would you disagree with that figure? No, sir. Okay. So at, at the present time, correct me if I'm wrong, the Martin County Water District is running monthly deficits and is close to $200,000 uh, in the red this year, and if that is the case, it can not only make it can't make its current payments to vendors, but it can't it can't uh, go toward have any money to uh, go toward reducing the seven hundred and thirty two thousand eight hundred ninety seven dollars that it's owed for years. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now. I just going back, and I want to say this for the record, I want to ask your auditors, 
and your people is. But in 2017, the operating loss for Martin County Water District was $704,302. So I guess to the extent we've uh, saved, uh, <laughs> it's $14,000 $14, less than it was in 2017. But you can't continue at a 20, at a 75% water loss or a 70 or a 60% water loss and ever make any headway, correct? That is true, sir. And all that does is it means that the rate payers have to pay higher and higher rates because somebody, the system has to be maintained, the bills have to be paid, and, uh, and this old debt eliminated, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, until there's more money uh, somewhere from the state or the federal government or someplace, uh, these repairs have to be made by the district and that has to come out of funds it gets from the ratepayers. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Now, I know we're going to talk to Mr. Call a little later, but I want to, I want to approach this now to lead up to it. I know that the, the Martin County District was awarded money uh, from the Corps of Engineers, maybe Appalachian Regional Commission, the state of Kentucky, and other places, maybe coming totaling up to seven, eight million dollars uh, for infrastructure. But as I understand it, over the, the, the projects that have been bid out for line replacement, meter replacement in the Warfield area, uh, and for other maybe upgrades at the water plant, the bids are higher than the amount of money you've received to basically uh, undertake those uh, replacements and repairs. Is that true? Yes, sir, that is true. Okay. So one of the projects, uh, Warfield, for instance, uh, where I guess there are a lot of leaks and people have a lot of water problems, uh, their, their project has had to be put on hold until more money can become available and the money that was allotted for that used for something else or a, approvals been sought to use it for something else. Is that correct? Uh, approval has been sought to do the uh, we what we believe to be the much more important raw water uh, improvements and water plant uh, improvements project. Yes, sir. Based on your education, training, and experience, including the many years you've had in in working in water districts and water district management, do you have an opinion within reasonable medical probable reasonable reasonable probability as to whether the district's credit or operations will be materially impaired or damaged if the emergency rate increase requested uh, is not put into effect prior to a final order entered in this case? Uh, absolutely, sir. Uh, you know, I, I, as I stated earlier, uh, we we are estimating that the district is is going to be operating at, at, at a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loss, and we're six months into the year. So I mean, roughly just about six months. So at the six month mark, we're already going to be at one hundred twenty five thousand dollars loss of budgeted expenses. That's actual numbers, but that's budgeted. So absolutely, uh, if the emergency rate increase is not approved, the district is only going to uh, fall into further. Uh, uh, further <laughs> financial stress. In terms of the, there was a pump that was purchased at that basically would, would uh, pump water from the tug fork uh, to the water plant, correct? Yes, sir. And something happened to it. What happened? Has that pump been repaired? What happened to yes, it? Yes, sir. The pump, the pump has been repaired and it is, it is back in service. So that the raw water infrastructure for the Martin County Water District is the worst thing that I've ever seen in my experience in water utilities. I've never seen anything like it. Um, I say that a lot, I think actually, but, um, the raw water said the way that it's set up is that the raw water pump, which weighs about 13,000 pounds, the small one by itself, uh, sits on the bank of the river and it's a horizontal pump. And that horizontal pump pumps out of the river. 
Uh, so the Tug River rises and lowers, and uh, we can only get it so close to the river um, because it, the bank, the way the bank is designed, is set, is created. We also do not have the infrastructure or the equipment to pull that pump in the event of a flood. Um, early, early this year, late last year, uh, we had um, flood. The Tug River rose. We had a new distribution supervisor and myself, and uh, we didn't get to the pump before the water level rose to the pump level. Now uh, the pump was not running, um, so it didn't actually cause damage to the pump, but we pulled the pump and sent it to uh, the shop for repairs. Now when it went to the shop, um, just to have the motor dried out and make sure that there was no failures to the pump, they actually found that there was already pitting on the new, uh, on the new pump on the intake. Uh, on the uh, um, uh, on the uh, pump itself, and um, so their estimation was that because of the way that the bank lays, the, the the suction head is too high for that raw water pump to work properly, and we we're already seeing failure on a brand new pump. So we chose to have some repairs made to it now, so that we could try to keep it you know, running effectively until the raw water infrastructure. Uh, project is underway which now we're it, you know with the the bids coming in higher we're put we're looking at pushing it back even farther before that project gets started so unfortunately it did get underwater but uh, we actually pulled it and had it sent to the repair shop just to inspect it and make sure that there was no problems and they found problems that weren't related to flooding but were related to um the the infrastructure as set up itself which is um like i said i've never seen anything like it yeah <clears throat> When did that pump go back into operation? This week. This week. All right. The reason I ask is, is because uh, I have before me a uh, report prepared by the uh, Kentucky Division of Water that expressed serious concerns about the adequacy of the Crum Reservoir. Have you seen that? Yes. Or were you, uh, well, you're aware of that problem, correct? Yes, sir. I'm very aware of that problem. And as I understand it, uh, while the pump was down, uh, basically, because of dry weather, the Crum res Reservoir was got to 14 feet below normal pool level. Is that about yes, right? And the Division of Water estimated, and this is what I'm reading is uh, on dated May 21st, 2021, uh, basically seven to 14 days supply, and unless uh, the pump were put into place or uh, there were heavy rains, uh, the, the county might run out of water. Uh, at least, I suppose you could purchase some from somewhere else, but many sections of the county would probably have been out of water had that, had that happened. Is that, is that fairly accurate? Had, had the reservoir gone dry, yes, sir. Yeah. And I have, I, have no further, uh, I have no further questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, questions? Yeah, Chairman, I just got a few. Good morning, Mr. Miller. Morning. Um, give me one second here to get my stuff together. Um, Let me ask about the water loss for a second, just so that I understand the situation. You're selling about a quarter, maybe 30, 30 to 35 percent max of the water produced, right? <clears throat> so taking a step back, let me understand where you're currently metering water and where you think that you're accurately metering water, because that, that, that may be two different things. So when the water is, let's just say that you're not using, well, you have to use the reservoir, but um, let me take, take a step back. You've got the pump, right, on the tub fork. Does, does the Martin County Water District have the ability to bypass the reservoir when it pumps from the tub fork, or does it pump directly in the tub fork and then the intake to the water treatment plant? Is that just from the, from the reservoir? Correct. The, the water district currently pumps from the tub fork into the reservoir. 
and then the reservoir feeds by gravity to the water treatment plant. Okay. Uh, and I know there's been a lot, there's been a couple of projects proposed over the years to sort of bypass, so I just want to make sure that I hadn't missed one that had actually done that. So is, is there any metering of the amount of water that the water treatment plant takes in, either from uh, the amount that's pumped from the tug fork into the reservoir or from the reservoir into the treatment plant? Yes. Okay, so it's metered there at the intake to the water treatment plant, is that right? It's metered from the tug to the reservoir, and uh, I believe, I'm not certain on the raw from the reservoir to the plant. I believe that there is a raw from the reservoir to the plant, but I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if it's totalizing or not. I'm, maybe, I'm not certain on that. Maybe from the crime reservoir to the water treatment plant. Then, I believe so, yes. Okay. Then you have the process, the water treatment plant process. Um, and then is there a meter for the, from the water treatment plant to the distribution system? Absolutely. Okay. So water treatment plant out. Okay. So then there are a number of zone meters that are on the distribution system. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then those are those larger, uh, I think you have a chart, but, um, I think you're, I think you've had a chart in your, um, in your prepared. So you got, you, you have this INES master meter. Is the INES master meter the master meter at the water? Yes, sir. That's the, that's the total production meter. Okay. So then there are three sub three areas after that 40 West Turkey and 40 East, right? Correct. Turkey is the last in that section. Then well, from 40 West, it goes Marcellus Wells, then it's subbed to two areas. Then those areas are subbed to individual areas. 40 East is submetered to Rock Castle, Buck Creek. Rock Castle is then subbed to five areas. Rock Creek, Buck Creek, sorry, I'm reading very small. Buck Creek to three smaller, two smaller areas. And then R and J Pit is subbed twice separately, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you all, how many of those meters do you, in, in, in your experience, think are accurately reading usage? I haven't done any um, testing. It would be fairly simple to do a, you know, just a field test on it based on, you know, flow and a, and a stopwatch, but I haven't done any to give you a definitive answer on accuracy. We have a, replaced a couple of meters. Um, I believe in the accuracy of the 40 West meter. I believe in the accuracy of the water plant uh, production meter, and I believe in the accuracy of the turkey meter. So, um, uh, but we're going to be replacing that 40 East master meter, and when it's replaced, I'll, I'll feel confident in the accuracy of it as well. Okay. So, do you have an expectation of when you all plan to figure out whether your zone meters are accurate or not to determine where specifically, if there are losses in the distribution system prior to service lines, right? Uh, do you all have a plan in place as to when that would occur? Uh, a timeline for accuracy on those meters My, you know, when you're talking about accuracy, low flow versus high flow, my efforts right now are identifying water loss. I, I haven't looked at identifying the accuracy of the zone meters. Um, so I, I haven't really put a timeline on that because I believe with the meters that we have now, we can identify because we're looking at large portions of water loss here, right? We're not looking at, you know, a, a, we're not talking about a system that has a 30% water loss. We're talking about a system that's a, currently sits at 65%. So um, for me, we can, we can, get a really good idea just with the meters that are currently in the ground on where a large portion of water loss is going. Um, but I have not looked to look at, you know, accuracy versus high flow. So in order to get it to be test, we'll have to remove it and send it out to have it tested on a, on a big meter uh, bench. So. Well, so, uh, but that's, you're using the zone meters now to determine Correct. where the water are. That's what Correct. I, that's what I'm wanting to make sure. Yes, sir, we are. Okay. And then, and then, then you have individual meters. Um, has 
since the Lions has come on, within let's just let's just say in, by a factor of you know we'll use dozens as a as a as a gauge or or tens. How many locations, individual meters or individual locations, has has the Martin County Water District found that were being served water but were unmetered, or were you know there was some sub metering going on, uh, but that those locations now have meters? And what I'm really asking about is, what's the difference in customer count, increase or decrease in customer count, as a result of adding meters to non-new, you know, new build home, right? So if there's a new business that showed up or a new home built, other than those, how many meters have you all added, let's say, in the last year and a half? I don't have a a good number on that. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't prepared to answer that. I I couldn't answer that accurately. I'd have to look that number up. Five, ten, or more like I would say it's more than ten. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that there's the the chairman said 55 and it and it's 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 within spitting distance of 56 million. Um, at the end of your presentation, just your sort of educated guess on what the upgrades are. It, it didn't seem like a new water treatment plant was on that list. Is that is that fair? <laughs> That is absolutely fair. That is, okay. uh, to me, in my mind, you know, the, the cost of a new water treatment plant is so large that, um, yeah. I don't disagree with you. I just want to make sure that I'm, it is good. not, it is not on there. No, sir. And, and I, I'm kind of familiar with, with some former case records, you know, the, the, the district has been discussing the need for a water, a treatment, new water treatment plant for 20 plus years. Would you, would you agree that, that in your experience, the, the water treatment plant has probably uh, is near or at the end of its useful life as a general matter? The water plant is one major disaster away from total catastrophe. It is, it is yes, it has met its life, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then last, I just want to ask about the, the raw water intake. Um, because it does kind of go hand in glove with this water treatment plant. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, it may even be four, time runs together. There was a new floating uh, apparatus put uh, for the water, raw water intake in the Chrome Reservoir. Are you, are you aware of that floating apparatus? Yeah, that floating apparatus does not exist. Yes, I'm aware of its uh, past existence. Okay, and then before that, uh, and not that much before that, there was, and I think it was about a 20-year-old project of a, a vault, um, I guess a pump vault that was supposed to be on the Chrome Reservoir that could hold, you know, three, two to four million gallon uh, pumps in it that uh, had problems, let's say, with, with um, sand um, with, with pumping. Are you generally aware of that, that previous setup, the one that preceded the floating? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm generally aware of, I don't know if that was at the reservoir as much as it was as, at the Tug River. Um, I, I'm fairly familiar with all the different iterations that have been down at the raw water. Okay. So my, my question is, if I wanted to know why this current project is going to work better than the previous ones, is that a question for you or for Mr. Cottle? Um, well, I think Mr. Cottle could probably answer the question, you know, with uh, much, he was, uh, I mean, he's obviously involved in the inception of the engineering of the project. Um, I will tell you that based on the current setup, um, anything will be better than what we have right now. Um, and just having the ability to pull those pumps up and move them up and down uh, with the level of the river, because, you know, the pumps have a, a, a head loss, you know, that they can only achieve so much suction head pressure before they start to cavitate. And we can't get them close enough, and we don't have, we have to hire an outside service um, to bring a bulldozer just to remove that pump when, when we need to get it pulled away from the river. So the, the way that the, the current raw water infrastructure um, uh, design will at least 
enable us the opportunity uh, as well as provide us with a larger pump so that we can meet demand as opposed to just um, break even every every day. Yeah, and I appreciate that it's better than maybe what you have, but I, I but when when the choice is now between the raw water intake and not doing the Warfield line replacements, right? That that's a different situation, wouldn't you agree? Than than what was present before when both projects were going to be fully funded. Uh, I don't think I understand the the question. What do you? What do you so the, the proposal initially was to do the raw water intake with one project, right? And then separately the Warfield line replacement, right? Correct. And the proposal now is to defer the Warfield line replacement and use that money because the bid for the proposed raw water intake is higher than what was initially funded for. Yes, sir. Okay. But I, I get that the proposed is better than what you have now but the, it's not the same as it was six months ago, right? Now now the proposed is exclusively to do the raw water intake at the expense of the improvements in Warfield. Um, well, I mean, I, I believe that it's based on uh, priority of need. So um, based on our, our uh, what we've learned about the system since we've been here, um, the priority of need is that raw water infrastructure over a water line replacement and Warfield. I appreciate that. I, I'll just make a statement, um, fall in the footsteps of the former vice chairman and make a statement uh, instead of necessarily say a question. But after after the, the number of years of, of previous attempts of getting the raw water intake right at the tug fort, I'm a little skeptical of, of any proposal at this point, especially when it comes to the expense of, of what we know it to be a a very troubling distribution system in Warfield. So uh, I, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Miller. That's all I have, Chairman. Commissioner Matthews, questions? I don't have any questions, thanks. Ms. Cromer? Yes, I do have a few questions. Maybe. Um, one moment, we get um, together. Oh, okay. Good morning, Craig. Good morning. Um, I have a few questions first about um, the infrastructure planning piece of it. Your immediate needs list um, that you all were just talking about. Mary, um, you're a little hard to hear. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? I can try. I have um, I a bit of sinus issues, so it's hard to project my voice. <laughs> Excuse me. Can you hear me now? Okay. So immediate list is uh, quite a wait, bit. Wait, Ms. Cromer, the reporter yeah. cannot hear you now. So I don't, it, it's difficult. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the issue is, but you, <laughs> you may have to get as close as you can to the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear? Can, yeah, she can hear you now. That's, that's good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to lean in close and, and yell. Um, so the immediate needs list is quite a bit larger than the infrastructure replacement plan that you all have provided in 2020. Um, and in that infrastructure replacement plan, you mentioned the, that the plan is to develop a five-year capital improvement plan. How does your immediate needs list, um, how does it mesh with that plan to do a capital improvement plan? Um, as far as meshing goes, I think that the, the, the immediate needs, uh, I think we could probably put it into the five-year capital improvement plan, but I think that the immediate needs kind of existed outside of a, a potential five-year capital improvement plan, um, because typically you base a five-year capital improvement plan on what you uh, expect to need improved upon, um, as opposed to what immediately needs improved upon. Okay, so if I'm understanding you, that would mean that the 56 million in immediate needs is sort of in addition to what would what would be found in your capital improvement plan. It could be. And are you all still working on a capital improvement plan? Yes, ma'am. And where are you in that? Um, still working on it. Um, is it an active document that you're working on? Are you working with Bell Engineering? 
we have not we it's something that we're going to be working with uh, an engineering firm on developing as well as internally uh, it's not something i've actively been able to work on as of yet um <clears throat> in the first item i believe on your immediate need is the smart meters our smart meters um and i noticed that in december of 2020 the board approved an application for a grant to do a feasibility study to look at the cost benefit of the smart of smart meters. Have you all done a feasibility study on that? No, ma'am. That the feasibility study has not been done. What is the? Uh, did you all apply for that grant, or did the board? Um, that that's probably a question better put to Jimmy. He might be able to answer that a little bit better. Um, but. I guess from, from what you've testified to, it sounds like it is your opinion that the benefits would outweigh the cost of smart metering. Can you talk a little bit about why you believe that is the case? I think that smart metering will pay for itself in less than a year. Uh, I believe that you know we'll see an immediate uh, impact uh, just in uh, the timeline for employees to be able to go out and continue to fight water loss and work our process. Um, that's an immediate impact um, that and also with uh, increasing accuracy and also replacing meters that have the ability to accurately meter low flows that old meters do not have the ability to do. So we'll be able to um, meter the water more effectively. I think that that will impact water loss. I think that um, uh, new meters and a meter replacement program will impact water loss uh, greatly. Um, I want to turn and talk a little bit about water theft. Um, and I think you, in your direct testimony, um, said something to the effect that uh, theft of water in the market time system is, is beyond what you've seen in your previous years of work in water districts. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you base that on? Uh, the 13 plus years that I've been in water treatment and I've never ever seen any water theft like this before. Maybe one a year. We've had 21, and then in the recent past couple of weeks, um, we've seen, I think, five new ones. So in the past week, uh, we're up to 26 now. That's, and that's just what we're catching, right? That's not, you know, you have to talk about what you're finding versus what's out there, right? So the, you know, based on just in my mind. Um, the law of averages, you know, we've cut what we're finding versus what's out there. Um, you know, more, most recently the register, a register removed from the top, which is something that I've had a feeling is out there, um, but we haven't been able to identify, uh, but we actually were able to find one. We actually found one this week and, you know, it's a customer, if they know when you're reading the meters and they know they can take the top off the register so that it doesn't register flow and then put it back on before you come to read the meter, uh, if you don't catch it, then you don't know it's there. But the average water use in the water district at 3,300 gallons is uh, much lower than what the national average for customer usage is. Um, in my mind, uh, 3,300 gallons is uh, per household is uh, enough of an indicator for me to show that there's an issue. That's meter usage. Right. I mean, the 3,300. What what is being metered? Not it does not include amounts that are not metered. Correct. That's correct. Um, so I, I don't understand how that would be an indicator that there is theft in the system. If um, you know your households are using less than the national average, are you saying that the the households are stealing water on and off throughout the month and not so therefore? Absolutely. Okay, and have you have you found any instances where that's happening? Well, I mean, with the instances of theft of water that we found, I think it's an indicator. You know, if you have a register off the top of the meter, that's an indicator to me that you understand how meters work well enough to know that when you put it back on, it'll register. Um, and you have a new um, SOP for theft of water I believe in the board meeting minutes, it was um, indicated that that was going to be sent to the PSC. Has that been sent to the 
testing for review? I'm not certain. I'll have to follow up with that. I'm not certain. Okay, that was the June 2020 board meeting. It's, it's in the board packet, which is submitted to the PSC. But well, I, the board minutes. Yeah. Just, I'll have to I'll have to review back to June and find out. Um, and in this um, regard, we've talked several times about the negative um, negative read meters that seem to. Throughout the time that you were doing the meter audits, that was a pretty consistent problem. I think the last meter audit showed 41 negative reads. And I think from past discussions uh, that you and I had had that you believe that those may be instances of theft of water. Um, I would like to ask you what you have done to pull those meters, see if they're working, um, basically uh, investigate those situations to determine whether or not it actually is theft of water or a problem with the meter. So um, as far as pulling the meter and testing them, uh, we do do that, but um, we, haven't, we haven't actively looked at those customers to see if, it's not my, it's not my goal really or my desire to go out catching people for theft of water. Uh, that's not, that, I've, there's so many things that I need to do on a, on a daily basis that going out to intentionally try to catch somebody stealing water is not something that's high on my list of priorities. So I, I can't say that we've actively gone out to try to do anything to look at those. Um, I just looking at numbers, if you have a customer that has a 4,000 gallon negative read and um, they keep that, unless they have a 4,000 gallon storage tank in their house, or a well that's pumping water back into our system, there's no other way for that meter to go backwards. Well, Craig, I understand um, you saying that it's not your goal to be investigating every instance. However, you do mention theft of water quite a bit um, as one of the big issues with the water district, that the water district faces. And that is an accusation directly against the customers. Um, and to be throwing that out without, um, you know, backing it up with investigations um, and to make sure that you're, you're correct in what you're saying only sort of breeds more distrust between the water district and the customers. When you're saying publicly that one of the biggest problems is theft of water and you've never seen theft of water like this before, it does continue to breed distrust. So I would suggest that it would be a good thing to investigate every instance to make sure because it is, it is harmful to the customers, of course, if there's theft of water occurring because the customers that do pay are the ones who are paying for that water. So it's in everyone's interest that these be investigated. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, customer service complaints. Does the water district currently um, maintain a log of all customer calls and all customer um, communications through Facebook messaging or however those communications are done. The district currently logs every customer complaint. Um, and when did that process start? When did you start logging every customer complaint? Well, with, with ENCODE, we started putting notes on customers' accounts immediately. Um, I don't know the exact date, but I know that we've had discussions with your group several times and then trying to work together when we've tried to improve our processes. And that's something that we're always trying to do is improve our processes for customer service and continue to assist um, all of those uh, situations. So as far as an exact date, I, I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head. Okay. Well, when we last talked about this, I think when you last sent a report, it was in um, March. And that report included customer service orders and work orders, but it did not include a log of calls. And we noted to you that it was during a period of time when there were lots of issues with billing when ENCODE had been changed over. And we knew, you know, anecdotally, we were hearing a lot of people saying they were calling the water district and those, those calls were not showing up on what you had provided us. So we haven't seen um, anything to show that you are logging each customer call. And I think if you look at the um, record customer complaints in, in, that have been filed in the last couple of days, especially one that was filed yesterday, there are customers saying, I have called, I have contacted the district, I am not getting a response. And those, we, we don't have any way of tracking that. And so it's very important to us that there is some kind of log that we can see, shows how many customers are calling, 
what they're calling about, even when it doesn't support order or service order. Um, Is that a question? No, I, I'm moving on now to the, the lease the lease issue. So the um, the district currently has a customer service um, rental at the the RF call it, call your community center and Alliance has its own separate office. Is that correct? That is correct. Alliance has a separate office that is paid for by Corporate Alliance. Have you all looked at the possibility of combining the customer service center with your with the Alliance office to save the district money? No, one, there's not enough space. Two, they're separate entities. And why is it necessary for Alliance to have a separate, a separate office, a se an office that is separate from the water district? It would be the same as though if you were to have a satellite office in Martin County um, to go to when you work. I, I have the goal is for me to be over multiple divisions. This is an east. This is a, the uh, this district is the farthest east from Corporate Alliance. So Alliance has a corporate office here. So when we have corporate employees that come in, they have a place to do their work. And so do you work for other divisions of Alliance or do you just work for Not currently. Are there other Alliance employees who work regularly in that office who work for other divisions? There are. Who are they? Tony Sneed, Ann Perkins, Mark Mailer, uh, our corporate president, Tim Garrity. Okay, so they're not there regularly. They do. They come in. Correct. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the customer assistance funding. Um, in December, you all reported that um, as a result of, I think it was hard to keep track of all the different funds that have come through, that uh, 240 customers had been, um, had received $94,000 in customer assistance funding. Um, and I think that was the Healthy at Home uh, funds that were provided in 2020. Has, and this may be a question for Ann rather than you, have any uh, customers received funding in 2021? Um, that may be a better question for Ann, but I, I believe that there have been some, but I'm okay. not, I, I don't know the exact number. Okay. And so I guess you probably also would not know whether they received funding through the eviction relief fund or through the funds. Is, the, is the, is the eviction relief fund the one that comes to the county? Is that the um, new one? There is a fund that up to $200,000 that the county or could apply for. Um, yeah, nothing, there has not been any, uh, the, the, I don't believe the application has been made yet for that from, from the county. So I don't know that there's been, I know they're working on it and we've had discussions with the county about it, but I don't believe anything has been done to, to gain those funds yet. That would be a question for the county because it has to go through the county. Um, and who at the water district is responsible for talking to the county about that to make sure, since that's money that will ultimately come to you guys, well, who's, who's handling that on your end? Well, that, typically it's Jimmy, the board chairman, and myself, and then we've had discussions with uh, uh, the judge executive. Okay. And that, that's with the new judge executive? Yes. Okay. And do you remember when the last discussions were had? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember exactly what date it was. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, late fees. As you're maybe aware, a bill was passed um, this past legislative session, um, and one component of the bill is that the district would be unable to charge late fees or um, bills where customers receive customer assistance. What have you all done? Um, or what, are, what is your plan for complying with that? How are you um, managing, you know, tracking that? Um, what, what have you done so far for that? If a customer receives customer assistance, they do not have a late penalty on their account. And so is that something that you've set up in ENCODE that automatically would remove that late penalty? I don't know if there's an automatic late penalty removal or if it's done, if it only has to be done manually, but um, I know that it is done. 
And going forward, is it the district's intent to continue charging late fees for customers who are eligible for LACI? If customers apply and receive funding from any other third party entity, they would not have a late fee. Okay, but it's only if, like currently, um, there may not be funding. There's LIWAP funding coming is the water version of LIHE, uh, but it's not been implemented yet. So until, is, is your testimony that until it is implemented, those customers will continue to get late fees? If the customer has received, has not received third, third party funding, they receive late fees. If they have received third party funding, they will not receive a late fee. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, some about the um, current policies around developing payment plans. So what, when a customer is um, potentially about to be disconnected for non-payment, what are the current, what kind of terms are you currently offering for payment? We're giving customers, and this is in a board packet, which has not been submitted, for example, but we give them, automatically give them 12 months. I think that the rule said that you could give them anywhere from six months to two years, six months to 24 months, and we just went with 12 months. Um, and I, so I think that rule is part of the moratorium, which is no longer in effect, but are you saying that you're continuing? We're still using, yeah, we're still using 12 months. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then I'm, I want to understand based on the tariff, and this is you know, in our data requests about disconnects, you referred us to the tariff. So I want to make sure I'm understanding the timing. Um, so my, from what I understand on the timing, it sounds like, let's say I get a bill on the 1st that's due on the 20th. If I don't pay on the 20th, then I get sent a disconnect notice. Is that correct? Or I get sent a, what, what happens, I guess? What, it's actually... It's not, it's not one month. You don't, it's not one month in arrears where you would get disconnected. The customer would have to be two months in arrears before they would be subject to disconnect. And then once they're subject to disconnect, they're issued a letter that tells them that they're subject to disconnect. And then additionally, which is an internal audit of our own or an internal implementation of our own, that's not part of our tariff. The day before we go out for disconnects, office staff take the disconnect list and call every single individual and say, we're going to be, you're on our disconnection list. We want to provide you an opportunity to pay your bill. We're offering a phone call as a courtesy to ask you to pay your bill so that you will not be disconnected. And then um, if they do not respond at that point, then they're subject to disconnection the following day. And what is the time period between when that disconnect letter is mailed and the phone calls are made or the, the people go out to actually do the disconnection. What, what is that time period? I, I'm not, I don't, I don't recall at this time. I could find that out for you though. Well, I guess, and I, the reason I'm, I, what I didn't, one of the things I didn't understand in the tariff, it looks like it's, it's the five days, but I didn't know if there was an allowance for mailing or, you know, if it's just five days from the date it's mailed to. I, I, if I, if I, I believe it's five business days, which would automatically allow for the weekend. So, um, so do you, it looks like from, from what you sent in response to our data request, it looks like there were quite a few, um, disconnect notices that were sent in February and March, about 320 each month. Um, <coughs> I did not see a corresponding high number of payment plans being set up, and maybe it's in the reporting, but can you, can you talk about, um, you know, with, you know, 600 disconnect notices being sent in a couple month period, how many of those were resolved through payment plans and then how many were actually disconnected, roughly? I, I don't have those numbers in front of me. I'd have to, I'd have to look at our reporting software and find out for you. But do you believe that most, most customers are able to basically get on a payment plan or not any any we lost the connection we've lost no audio. sound hold it i get i don't know if they may have lost photograph for all, picture for all i know miss cromer can you hear us
hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Miss Cromer, can somebody see if I, I've got her cell phone. I'm trying to let her know there's no audio. She just Okay. Um, I think she just said audio, I think. Okay. I think she just looked at the text. Okay. And it says she's unmuted, and I know that IT has been muting and unmuting her to try to get feedback out. Yeah, it's going to be a minute. We lost our audio back here. Okay. So, I don't know if anybody else can hear you, Chairman, if you want to talk. I assume they can. No. Okay. Brittany just text again. They're working on it. I'm going to step away for one second and get headphones to see. I doubt that'll help, but I'll be right back. I'm going to. It, are we fixed? The reason we haven't taken, we've got, we'll be two days on this if we don't get, maybe it'll go. I think they can hear us now, Chairman. Maybe. I don't know. Can you all hear us, Craig? Uh, we, can, we can hear you now. Right now, it's us. It's us. I think he's working on it. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Can, can we do a recess? Oh, but IT said we're good to go. Yeah. We're good to go. Okay. Um, so, in the most, I'm just going to return to talking to questioning Craig that I. I'll give Brian a second. Are we good now, Brittany? Yes, we're good. Okay. okay. Brian, are you all ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay. Um, so, where do I need to back up? Where, where? I don't know where. Yeah, I think it was just probably your last question, or maybe the last, because you were still talking. Yeah, you, you were talking about they would still work with people, I think, with customers who were behind or who had a disconnect notice on a payment plan. And I believe that's where where the sound last cut out, according to our reporter. Okay. Um, well, I think the the next thing, um, Brian and Craig are frozen for me. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Um, well, the next question, I'll just go ahead and sort of re-ask it, um, was that February and March, there were about 300 um, disconnect notices sent every month. Um, and I noted that it didn't look like there were, from what we got in the data request, it didn't look like there were a corresponding number of payment plans being set up, but it could have been, in my understanding of the way they presented the data. And so, Craig, I'll just pitch it to you and let you say again what you how you explain that so yeah so disconnect letters is not an indicator of how many disconnects we have um, I know one of those months the disconnects was in the 20s one of them it was fairly high um, maybe a uh, hundred and hundred hundred or so I'm not sure on the exact numbers um, I'm not in that office every day but um, they uh, any customer that calls in that wants to make a payment plan, we, we try to arrange for our payment plan for them. And additionally, customers, you know, when they receive the letter or the phone call, they, they pay. They don't want to be disconnected. Um, so, and so based on what you just said, is it the case that typically that last um, you all make to connect us to 
talk to customers and get a payment plan set up is successful, that you are usually able to to get some negotiate some type of payment before before the actual disconnect. I think that people take advantage when you know just it depends on the person. You know, I mean, I don't I don't know how to answer that to say that it one way or the other definitively effective or not. But I mean. I, if a customer needs a payment plan, that they set up a payment plan and we're happy to oblige. Okay, and then maybe the way I was understanding the, the data you all presented, and I may ask again for, um, just so I can understand, you know, how many disconnect notices are sent, how many payment plans are set up, you know, how many, how many are actually disconnected and then reconnected um, to see what what's happening. And might so I think that's probably the better way of doing it. So I will. Um, plan on getting back with you about um, providing some data, some more data, and some questions I have about what you did provide. Um, moving on to the the cost for setting meters in the uh, December or the budget that was approved, there was a ten percent increase in meter setting cost. It went from a thousand to eleven hundred. Um, are you? Was there a cost? basis for that what what is that based on uh, I, I, that's, I'm not I don't recall there being a, an increase to the tap fee that, okay. that should be you're talking about the tap fee we haven't increased the tap fee um, it might have been a, you know a calculation error a number error but there's not there's not been an increase to the rate to that tap fee nor is that a part of this rate hearing okay it was, um, um, are the meters currently read to the tens or to the thousands? Tens. To the tens. And so does, it, does that apply both for radio? You're, getting, radio? you're a little glitchy, Mary. Your, your that, feed's in and out. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. I may try to move closer to my router. Um, is that for radio read as well as manual read? Can you repeat the question? Are, are radio read met meters able to be read to the tens just like the manual reads are? Yes. Okay. Um, the one of the issues regarding um, meter reading that we hear about a lot is that the bills still show that meet, all meters are read on the 20th. Um, why has the district been unable to put the actual meter read date on the bills? Uh, that's probably a better question for Ann. She's more familiar with the ins and outs of the programming of the billing pro uh, software. Um, but you know, you're talking about. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question, Mary. Okay. Yeah, um, if we had a radio, if we had a radio read system, we absolutely could. Uh, uh, you know, if it was smart meters, you know, that would be a given. Um, what are the district's current uh, procedures or practices for flushing? The current practices and procedures for flushing? Yes. Um, they're standard AWWA practices, so we biannually bi we'll flush the entire system and we try to flush it from the inside out. Uh, so you all, have you flushed the system this spring? We have not done so yet this spring, no. Were you able to flush twice last year? Yes. Um, you've worked at several other um, water districts, water associations um and i guess you know based on uh what we've been provided by the psc 
if you all get the rate increase you're asking for now, uh, Martin County will have the highest minimum rate of all water districts or associations regulated in Kentucky. Um, what is, why do you believe the poor cost customer is so much higher in Martin County than it is in other districts? What are the, the top three reasons? Um, the top three reasons that the, the rates are higher here, I think that um, there's, well, I could give you a bunch of reasons, uh, Ms. Cromer. I think that uh, one, and we'll talk about um, lack of, of management of infrastructure. When you talk about not putting money aside for not accounting for depreciation, not having a capital improvement plan. Um, not going for rate increases. A typical utility does a does a uh, a rate evaluation every three years, and that rate evaluation would typically come with some type of increase. Not always, but sometimes it comes with a rate increase that allows for um, CI, you know, CIP and uh, and uh, uh, just the increase in in, in everyday costs. Um, you talk about terrain. Um, our ability to get um, water to areas that most utilities don't have to the difficulties of doing so. Um, the amount of water line per customer, um, you know, for example, in, in a district that has uh, 15,000 customers, they can run a, a thousand foot of water line and feed 25, 30 customers where we run a thousand feet of water line and you feed five. Um, there are a lot of reasons for why the rates would be higher in uh, the, a, a system. That kind of two. One is the structural, that it's, it's the um, amount of line per customer, it's the terrain, it's just even in the best of circumstances, this would be an expensive system to run. But then Absolutely. the second one was this sort of deferred expense piece of it, the fact that the system has not been maintained um, over the years. So where where in the, the current expenses that you're paying, where, where, how, where do those deferred costs, so where that is that building up? Is it just in the repair costs? There is um, none right now. I think that that's the issue. There are none because there's not any money available for deferring any. I mean, we're not paying our bills. If we can't pay our bills, we certainly can't put money aside for any depreciation or capital improvement projects. Uh, that's, that's the whole point of this emergency rate increase. Well, it, so it looks like you have been able to pay most of the bills except for to Alliance. Like on an ongoing basis, most of the vendors, except for the past due amounts that are prior to Alliance coming on board, most of the vendors are being paid. Um, it's you all that, that have the, the past due amounts. Um, so it, it looks like the, you know, as far as like the repairs that are necessary because those those expenses have just been ignored and deferred, you know, year after year. Those those are being kept up with. Is that is that correct? Well, that's because those repairs are being made through the alliance contract. Alliance is paying for those repairs through the repair cap. So when they don't, when they're not paying alliance, they technically they're not paying for those repairs. Alliance is. And payroll. And and additionally, it's important to note that alliance is payroll, right? So if they're not making their payments, then alliance is fronting payroll. I think it's important to note that the, the district pays electric, electric utility bills, alliance, and uh, as some other, a few other expenses. There's not a whole lot of bills that the district actually pays. Alliance covers salaries, repair cap, chemicals. So if alliance isn't getting paid, then those really aren't getting covered either. Right. Okay, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Combo, anything? No, no, no further questions. I just have a couple, I'm sorry, yes, I just have a couple of clarifications. Um, Mr. Miller, could you just reiterate, Alliance does not charge Martin County Water District for their separate office at the Collier Center. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Oh, we can't we, hear you. We have a problem. We, we have a voice, a audio problem here somewhere. We're frozen. It's us. Yeah, I think you might be back on. 
Are we, are we here? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you please answer? That time it might have been us. Okay, we, can you please answer my question about the office at the Collier Center? Yeah, can you see us? Because we look frozen. Okay, um, as long as you can hear me, that's all that matters. Absolutely, uh, Alliance Water Resources does not charge the Martin County Water District for the separate corporate office. It is an Alliance corporate expense alone. Okay, and then just for clarification, Alliance has fronted the water district money to keep things going, and I believe that you submitted the amount that it has. That is correct. And it's approximately 65, well, no, I found the amount, $65,989 that Alliance has paid outside the contract, correct? Yeah, that, that's outside of the contract, yes, ma'am. Not, not repair costs that are built in. It That's is correct. over and above. O over and above the 200,000 currently. Okay. So Alliance is trying to keep things going while you're waiting to get better finances, better rates to be able to pay the Absolutely. basic bills. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, I think that at one point in the, in the work group that you explained, um, in response to the water reports that we were discussing. Oh, are, can you still hear me? We lost your picture. Yeah, we were frozen. I was trying okay. to make sure we were still there. Okay. That's fine, that's fine. Um, that you explained, uh, maybe the comment was made, you're still at about 65 to 75% water loss, but because data integrity is better, because your water loss reporting is more accurate, that your water loss has improved um, since uh, since Alliance has taken over um, with different improvements that you've made, but um, that the reports, you can't compare this 75% loss to the reports in the past because you can't really speak to the accuracy of those records. Is that true? That is true. Okay. Okay, and would it be better to look at the actual improvements that you've made and, and like the heart the programs the meters the the actual progress uh pro projects to look at those as the progress rather than just the number of the water loss i i think that that would be a good way to look at it you know i think that absolutely okay okay i have nothing further thank you i, I have nothing further uh, mr chandler questions no, I do not. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I do not. Okay. Ms. Matthews? I don't have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> Ms. Cromer, anything further? No, thanks. All right. Mr. Combo? Yes, sir. All right. If there's nothing further, uh, may this witness be excused? Yes, you, sir. you may step down, Mr. Miller, and thank you. Uh, what thank we you. ought to do, I'm sorry, that's a... Uh, it's now about eight minutes or so until noon. Uh, why don't uh, I, your next witness will be whom, Mr. Cumbo? Tony Sneed. Okay. Well, we might as well take a lunch break until one o'clock and come back, and we'll try to move a little, maybe a little more quickly with uh, with some of the others. Yeah, so, I expect Tony will be lengthy. Okay. Thank you. We'll be uh, in recess until one p.m. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>
back on the record. Ms. Cromer, Mr. Kumbo, are, are each of you ready? Turn it up. Chairman, you're, okay. Chairman, you're, uh, you're on. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm on mute. All right, yep. is everybody ready to proceed? Uh, Mr. Cumbo, uh, Ms. Cromer? Yes. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Right, Mr. Yes, Commissioner, we're ready. All right, Mr. Cumbo, please call your next witness. No, Tony Sneed. Okay. Mr. Sneed, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Cumbo, you may ask. Thank you. Uh, Tony, would you introduce yourself to the commissioners? Yes, sir. My name is James Anthony Sneed. Um, I go by Tony, and I'm the operations director for Alliance Water Resources. And would you uh, tell the commissioners a little bit about your education, training, background, and certifications, please? Sure. Um, I've been in the utility business for roughly 29 years. I'm a registered professional engineer in four states, including Kentucky. I hold um, multiple certifications in various states, including the highest water treatment, wastewater treatment, distribution and collections in Kentucky that they offer. I have a degree, bachelor's degree in engineering. I have a master's degree in management, organizational development. I spent uh, 25 plus years in the Army as a sanitary engineer running the uh, water and sewer for field hospitals. A combination of reserve and active duty time. <clears throat> Sounds like you're pretty qualified, Mr. Sneed. The, uh, obviously, we're here today relative to uh, the district application for a rate adjustment and, and particularly an emergency rate adjustment. And, and let's jump right to that if you don't care. Why, do you have an opinion based upon your background, education, and experience whether the district uh, is in need of an emergency rate adjustment at this time? Uh, well, yes, I do. Uh, first, just let me thank um, all the commissioners for taking the time to hear us and, and everybody that's on the call, because I know there are a lot of people involved, even getting to this point where Alliance was here, and we're grateful for the opportunity. But um, as, as Brian said, you know, the big question to me is, does the current revenue stream meet the current expenses? And that answer is clearly no, and I hope we've shown that in the submittal. We can walk through some documents later. And then the other big question uh, do we need the rate increase is it an emergency or is the is the system distressed to the point that the rate increase denial of cause continued harm and i believe that answer is yes and hopefully we can walk through some documents that will show that through numbers as well and uh, take us if you will through with the calculations uh, alliance uh, has utilized to get us to the to the rate application that we've made today Sure. If the um, IT team could pull up attachment 4D, I think that's a good place to start. Or if you wanted to give me control of the screen, I can walk through it. So he is asking for 4D to the application, Travis. Yep, I'm getting there. Okay. I mean, I could talk you through, I just want you to be able to see the document while I'm discussing it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Especially with uh, these are physiques that we possess. Does Mr. Sneed need permission to share his screen IT or can he just go ahead and share it in case? Oh, here we go. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Charles. 
And typically, if you, you make me the presenter, then I could share my screen. We use GoTo every day, so. Okay. But he's got it now, 4D. Uh, if, you, if you'll scroll down to the attachment, please. Okay. Okay, that works. Uh, can you scroll down just a little bit further? I'd like to be able to show the, that, that works right there, that's perfect. Um, that is actually not the corrected one that was submitted. I, I think at this point it would, it would be much easier if we could allow Mr. Sneed to, to share the screen. Um, Jim, can you, can you grant him permission to do that? Yes, you, anybody can share. You don't need permission. So go ahead, Mr. Steen. Yep. Okay. Doing it right now. Okay, thanks. Is this it, Greg? You're on the second. No, no, no. Go come on down. Come on over here and help me. Hang on one second. My IT guy is going to give me a hand. Okay, great. Oh, perfect. Screen one. Can can you see that now? Yes, we see. Okay, this is an Excel version of the uh, attachment, and what uh, just a couple of things I want to point out. Um, the way we set this is, uh, I believe it was mentioned earlier uh, by Craig. We set the budget back in November, and we are legally bound to budget to at least meet the minimum debt service coverage requirement. And in this case, uh, we checked with Raymond James who handles their long-term debt and the KIA loan requires a 1.2 debt service coverage. So I also sent this Excel spreadsheet to the PSC so they could see, but so what we have to do is we, we know the expenses, they're pretty much set, there's not a fluff. We drive the uh, revenue up until this number reaches the 1.2. But a, a couple of things I'd like to point out for you is now we have audited numbers. So the actual expenses in 2019 were 2.5 million, if you can see in that column B. And then the expenses in 2020, and this is with professional management, it's two million five oh seven two eighteen so I, I think that's important when when we we ask ourselves um is it is it cheaper not to have professional management I, I think you could infer that it really the question you should be asking is why we didn't do this sooner uh it, it the expenses are less now with alliance here but back to setting the rate increase for 2021 we set the revenue so that we could reach this 1.2 and there's the, the spreadsheet will lay that out for you and you can play with the spreadsheet there. Once we did that, we noticed there's about a $250,000 deficit. And so on this same sheet, which is also submitted as a, um, let me see what attachment that is, but I'm going to walk you through the spreadsheet. This was also submitted. It is the impact sheet. this so we had the, we set up a spreadsheet that it basically takes the existing rate structure as it was and we do what ifs until we can drive the revenue to the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that was required to meet the 1.2 and i know there was some question before about the six thousand gallon we simply showed what that would do to the average user the average 4,000 gallon user, what those increases would be. So really this, this is pretty simple. We took the audited expenses uh, for 2020, we took the audited revenue and we had to increase the revenue to get to the 1.2. Now, uh, please keep in mind that we did not use any depreciation in this number and that's been discussed earlier. And one of the reasons is that in a previous um, PSC order, the district was allowed to set the budget without using depreciation. And, and 
I would not be comfortably comfortable with that in a normal situation. But the reality is here, we have eight to nine million of capital money out there now. Uh, the president has talked about releasing new money for infrastructure. And our hope is that we can avail ourselves of that capital money to help offset the fact that there is no depreciation. This rate increase simply gets us to the point where we're able to maintain the monthly operating expenses. And again, it's important to note that the operating expenses are now less than they were in 2019 with Alliance here. In addition, $125,000 of the Alliance fee goes to capital improvements each year. So that's, that's kind of how we, we set the rate. It really is like triage. The, the situation was so bad here, we didn't have to look at a bunch of rate alternatives. It was simply a matter, we have to get to 1.2, what revenue is it gonna, going to need? And then we're using the spreadsheet uh, that's in front of you now to do what ifs until we could drive that revenue to 250. Anything else, Brian? Uh, did you uh, do any analysis as to the impact of the, the proposed rate increases? Yes, uh, and that, that, that sheet also shows this. It, it shows that the average uh, customer will have a, a difference of $4.51. If it's a 6,000 gallon user, the average customer will have a difference on their bill of $5 for a 6,000 gallon user. A 4,000 gallon user would be 451. <clears throat> Are there other relevant factors that you believe the Public Service Commission should consider or that have a bearing on, on their, their review of this request? Um, I, I, I think you covered most of that. I did. I, there's one other thing I'd like to, um, uh, 4F, which I'll need to close I'll pull this up on the screen so you can see this. This is the, bear with me one second while I pull this up for you. This essentially is the cash flow, which I think is important. Let me just get to that. Okay. You rotate this thing. There you go. Can everyone see that? This is 4F in your submittal. This is the cash flow for 2020, and this shows that each month we're operating at a deficit. And keep in mind that when we operate at the deficit, it's structured so that that debt service surcharge goes to pay normal operating expenses. So while you're operating in the deficit, you, you are not able to pay the vendors. But the most important thing is you say, well, where is that money going? If we're short, that's not a cumulative, that's each month how short we are. Well, what happens is that money gets kicked into the Alliance bill, which essentially is most of the district expenses being pushed down the road and um, covered by Alliance. Currently, we're around on the water side about $200,000, which that number should sound familiar because that's the number that the chairman talked about us being behind right now. So those numbers line up and that's how we're able to keep running because Alliance is carrying that cost. So our hope is with the rate increase, we can uh, get everything caught up and we can start using the, the um, debt service surcharge the way the commission intended it. Um, another factor I'd like you to consider is that in setting this rate, we did everything possible to ask for the lowest amount that there could be. You know, I had guidance from people with other, had worked with other commissions that said, oh, you need to go in there and ask for the maximum the form says, and then let them cut it back. But there have been so many people across the state working and involved to get us to this point, And we're very cognizant of the impact that it has on the average customer, even if it's $5. We recognize that that is a burden. But, but the issue here is even if that's a burden, is it right to allow the district to keep spiraling down without uh, initiating a rate increase that that sets us to zero every month, you know, that, that gives us a starting point? So this is also designed because of the 1.2 debt coverage is about 50,000, 40 something thousand dollars that can be added to the infrastructure along with the 125. So I think you should think, think about that. I know you have. Um, and I think there was a question earlier asked, uh, 
by, by Brittany about the data when we first got here. So I've looked at uh, every report submitted. I've looked at every rate study submitted multiple times. And I think the data was not far off. I think the PSC's concern, if I read the reports right, and I think it's a legitimate concern, is that data was not audited and it was really hard to verify that it was accurate data. But I, but I feel like at this point, the audits are caught up. We've got professional management happening. You can ask any of the state agencies that currently deal with the Lions and the district. And, and I know there's always things we can improve, but I think you will find that we are much more responsive, that you're getting more work done. Um, Ms. Cromer even mentioned in one of her letters that the customer service has, has improved. So all those things we identified we are working on and the costs have not gone up from 2019. We need this rate increase so we can sustain it. We took this job in good faith. We really did. We believe in what we're doing here. We believe what we can do to the area. There are other systems like this in the state, I'm certain. And, and we want to show what we're doing here with our partnerships and move forward, but, but we can't do that without the rate increase that we're requesting today. <clears throat> what about the water loss situation? Yeah. In? yeah, that's a great that's a great point. So if I were going to be uh, disappointed in something, it would probably be, but, but on its face, you might think, well, we haven't solved the water loss. What, what Craig didn't mention, it was 74% in January. He's now got it worked down to, I believe the last report was around 64, 65%. That doesn't seem like a lot, but given the state of the infrastructure and how dynamic this system is and how when you fix one leak, uh, it moves to another location. And the fact that our staff are spend as much time on emergencies as they are able to address the water loss, then, then I think they're in the right direction. The reality is it's probably going to be three years before you see significant water loss reduction. And by significant, I'll be candid with you, I don't think 15% is really achievable without the amount of money that was discussed earlier. But I do think us getting down below 40 uh, is achievable if we keep working our systems uh, and keep doing what we're doing and we spend less time fighting fires and, and we get everybody behind us that has been behind us so far, but I do think we can achieve that. And so really the cost of water, we talked about it's the 90 something cents, the uh, chemical and electric cost together is around 64 uh, cents a thousand. So you're talking about if we can drop it down to under, under say 39%, that's around a hundred thousand dollars a year um, that we could save, you know, and so so my hope is we get this rate increase, we keep working and dropping water loss, and then that allows us to keep doing the things we're doing without future rate increases, because you'll have costs go up, but our, our goal is to keep working our system so that we can balance it out, right? While we're trying to avail ourselves of the capital funds. We have asked for the minimum increase that we can ask for. And I hope the commission considers that, that we have not asked for one penny more than what is legally required and what is needed for us to just operate on a day-to-day -day basis. It's also, you, I know the staff has looked at the form, but, but it's under the requested amount if you use the uh, multiple forms that we did that the PSE supplied to calculate the uh, debt coverage ratio and the adjusted income forms. You'll find the rate increases are in, in line with each other and less than the, those forms suggest. Okay. Craig, I think you've done it, or Tony, I think you've done a great job addressing these issues. Let's let's circle back around here. Why why is this an emergency? Yeah. And that that's really the key question. I know when we we first talked about this in November, I was working with the PSC staff. And by the way, everybody I've worked with on the PSC staff has been incredibly helpful to us. And that's I'm I'm grateful for that. But we it was it you know it was suggested that we wait until we finish 2020. So we had a full year of Alliance operations here, get those numbers audited and then proceed. When we made the budget, and I believe Craig mentioned this early, the budget is designed to generate roughly $250,000 a year. So if we get the increase passed today and institute it in June, we're gonna be $125,000 behind 
right away, but at least we'll have a road and can see the light to catch up. But if we postpone the rate increase, it's going to continue to spiral. The, the other issue that concerns me a lot about postponing the rate increase, I'm not sure about the equity with our past creditors and them having to carry the debt for the district. There's something that seems, uh, in my opinion, seems wrong about that. So we need to do, and I know the commission tried before with the debt service surcharge, but because the rates were still short, that hasn't been used for that. But you're asking people in this community to uh, carry the debt of the district, and we need to work towards solving that. It'll, it'll make us more sustainable. Once we get the rate increase and we can show positive finances, then we can go and talk to banks about consolidating debt then we can leverage debt to improve the district's financial situation. But uh, so, so I think, I think that's another. And finally, one of the biggest reasons, and I will say this, I know that a rate increase is hard. There's nobody that wants to come in and say, Hey, let's do a rate increase. That's going to be fantastic. Nobody wants to do that, but we were hired to give you an honest assessment of the situation. And, and to do the tough things like say, hey, you have to have this rate increase. We need to get it behind us. We advertised this in, uh, it was in the newspaper in November. It was posted on Facebook. The community knew about it then. And we have just drugged this out because we had to, to follow protocol, I get it. But if we drag it out another six months, I think it's harmful to the community. I think a lot of the media we get and a lot of the press we get is the same things just over and over uh, without really being able to focus on the positive strides that are being made here. And I think it's good for everybody if we can rally and get behind this and say, hey, we're on the right path. I do not discount the woes of the past and I do not discount the efforts of the concerned citizens and other groups that get us to this point. But, but right now the numbers are what they are. They're not made up, they're not inflated, they're audited. And the minimum increase is what we've asked for just to get to where our legal requirement is for debt coverage. I think that's all the questions I have for you, Tony. I think. Mr. Combo, would you like to admit this uh, chart and your spreadsheet and the evidence? Oh, yes, I, uh, yes, I, we would, uh, uh, Commissioner, those, these charts, I believe, were part of our submittal with the application, and, and we would ask that they also be considered and be admitted as evidence at this hearing. Sustained. Ms. Koenig, questions? I, I just have a couple of questions, Mr. Sneed. Good afternoon. Uh, who am I speaking to? This is Brittany Koenig. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I was trying, I've got a bunch of these things on the screen. I was trying to zoom in. Hi, thank you, Brittany. You're fine. Okay, so I just want to confirm um, your testimony was that in figuring the rates required at this time, you went with the lowest percentage that you could possibly use the minimum. And the thinking was, that at this time you would do the minimum so that it, because your plans are that you will make so much improvement or the improvements that you will make will cause savings that will supplement that required amount in the future. Am I understanding you correctly? Well, that is, that is correct. Um, we, we, we chose the minimum for a couple of reasons. One is it's we, we had to do we had to make a budget based on the uh, debt coverage requirements. So we met that the earlier PSC order allows us to not include depreciation in this. Mm -hmm. and, and our thinking there was uh, uh, there's a lot of money being given to the district now for capital improvements, which would offset your need for depreciation. Now, granted, we've ignored depreciation for years, so that's why we're in this point. But knowing that we have that money and knowing that there's a strong likelihood of additional capital funds coming, coupled with, I still believe we have savings and water loss that we can start. It'd probably take us three years to realize those. I think we can stabilize the rates if we can just get to a break-even point. Um, it's the fighting underneath the break-even point that 
that magnifies every other difficulty we have. So, so that's our thinking. And, and we're not, again, we are not um, unaware of the impact or the, or the current rates of the district being as high as they are. But, but every water system in the United States and across the world, they each have their own cost to operate. And there are many variables that go into why each district's cost is what it is. I hope that answered your question. Yes, I understand, thank you. Um, and so in your calculations, are, are, are you saying that you performed a cost of service study when you were trying to calculate the rates? We, I, I know exactly what the a cost of service, if, by cost of service, if you mean I did a rate analysis, um, I'm not sure if our terms are the same, but but I, I, I can tell you, I know exactly what water cost us to produce Okay. and what it costs to deliver. Okay. And I didn't, oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm just honing down on your analysis. So. Um, I think that you answered all of staff's questions. Um, thank you. I, I don't have any further questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we take the chart down, uh, Mr. Sneed? Yes, sir. Good. I will do my best. I think I can unshare my screen. Is that right, Craig? Okay, I'm through okay. sharing, Mr. Commissioner. All right, Mr. Sneed, uh, I know you uh, you weren't here in 2018 when the Martin County Water District for the first time in six or seven years or so, maybe eight, had asked for a, been in for a rate increase. And at that time they asked for a 49% rate increase and the district didn't give them a 49% rate increase. It was much less than that but we had a couple of surcharges. At that time, one of the, had many problems. One of the problems was that they hadn't had an audit uh, in since maybe 2015. And uh, so you couldn't tell what their, uh, uh, what their financial situation was other than knowing it was uh, severe. Uh, the district over time, over the next two or three years, we came to find out had spent a lot of money on expenses, but they didn't have any invoices, or they didn't have very many invoices. And so their uh, previous auditor, White and Associates, uh, told us, told me personally, and uh, Vice Chairman Cicero at the time, we were on the phone and talked to those people and had them in, and they said, well, we can't do an audit because we don't have invoices. And the claim was that the, the, the records were kept off site in violation of Kentucky law. Uh, a Mrs. Sumter, who was an accountant, uh, said she didn't have the records, and somebody else said she did. And wherever the records were, they were lost or never found. And so that was one of the problems and one of the issues. Another issue was that, that the district, the, the state regulations, PSC regulations, had a 15% water loss rule. That, that water law, that expenses associated with water loss above 15% weren't permitted. And that had been an ironclad rule for years. Over time, in large part because of Martin County and others similarly situated, uh, that rule's been relaxed so that when water loss is now above 30%, we not only will allow it, we require the water district to take the money. And it's put into a, an account, a surcharge account, uh, used only for infrastructure and other purposes as permitted by the Public Service Commission. So I guess what I'm saying is, and third, there were management problems that I don't think the district, while it may have operated in good faith, didn't really understand what was needed in terms of professional management because the, the system had deteriorated to the point over 25 years or so that it was almost beyond any uh, redeemable situation. And I take it that right now, your testimony was that that ultimately, uh, absent a significant amount of money from state or federal government, ultimately Martin County water situation cannot be brought into a normal 
uh, or an operative uh, or optimal operational situation. Is that true? If you don't have 50, 60 million dollars, there's no way you're going. that system is ever going to work because nobody fixed it and it fell apart and now there's not enough money around to get it back into shape because the ratepayers can't afford 50 or 60 million dollars. Not I saw 3,170, 3,170 residential customers on your chart. I mean, if you divide that by 55 million dollars, uh, that's not possible, is it? No, no, sir, it's not. That that's one of the reasons we've set the rates like we are, and I and they're going to be high, and 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 hopefully to get capital funds that are free because we don't have the ability to acquire debt so we're hoping we can avail ourselves of that but you will again you will your cost of operation you're going to have to operate with at best water loss in the 30 percent until you have the money to replace infrastructure a, a large amount of money so that that's just a reality when you have a system this old that hasn't been replaced and not only that, most of the um, repairs or fixes didn't consider the life cycle cost. And you really can't, I mean, these guys were firefighting, so they're, they're fixing what they can to get to tomorrow, as opposed to laying out a plan and saying, hey, really, it is cheaper to spend a little more now, which we've done that quite a bit since we've, we've been here. You know, in the first four months I moved here with Craig, and we've we spent a lot of that repair cap right up front. But, but you're correct, you're, you're going to have to operate this system at a higher cost because you don't have the capital money currently available to completely replace the infrastructure. And for purposes of concerned citizens or other people who may be watching this, we've had so many hearings in several different cases involving Martin County since 2016. And at least on two occasions, uh, uh, Greg Heitzman, who was in with Blue Water, still is I guess, and was a, a, an outside consulting expert for Martin County Water District, and Mr. Kerr uh, as a board chairman, both of whom testified that, that they understood uh, that the rates that the Public Service Commission uh, granted in, two, in a 2018 case were insufficient. And irrespective of whether uh, uh, an outside uh, management team or alliance was brought in or not that the water district needed another eight to ten dollars a month uh, or it couldn't survive. So the system was burning what would have been normally depreciation reserves to start with and basically in order to get professional management on board the Public Service Commission just let them burn a little more because there was no other way to solve the problem uh, and a bankruptcy would not have done anything other than make the rates go higher than you could ever imagine. Uh, the last thing is, and I make this editorial comment, because we had thought as a public service commission, maybe there might be money available, there might be uh, uh, rural development loans, KIA loans, bank loans, but the district could never qualify because it didn't have an audit. And nobody is going to loan money without an audit. I mean, the INS Deposit Bank at the time was a locally owned bank with people who were dedicated, as far as I know, to the community, and I grew up and lived my whole life in an adjoining county, but they couldn't loan you money. Nobody will lo can loan money uh, to a business that doesn't have an audit, and of course you couldn't have an audit unless you had business records. <laughs> so, in any event, I've, I've had my, uh, uh, I, I've preached my sermon. I want to ask him, uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, if he has any questions or statements. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just a clarifying question. I just want to make sure I understand the audits for, and I think it's, is it 17, 18, 19, 20, or 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 were outstanding when Alliance arrived? It was 16, 17, 18, and 19, and right. then we did 20 and we got here. Yeah. Okay, and so 16, 17, 18, 19 have all been completed since Alliance arrived, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and how many of those are qualified and unqualified? Uh, I, 
Mr. Chandler, you, you're probably better asking Ann or our auditor when he comes. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Okay, but I just want to make sure I understand. Not only are the four that were outstanding when you arrived completed, the 2020 is now done, and those figures serve as the basis for the application. Is that right? Yes, sir. We Yeah, that was his own suggestion of staff, which I think is a good suggestion because it was our first year here. We Those are audited numbers that we used. Uh, and, again, what I find really interesting is that the expenses in 2020 with the Lions are less than they were in 2019 with no professional management. Um and a, and a lot of extra work that was free. You had a manager paying himself 9000 a year, and you had board members working countless hours with no pay. So I appreciate it. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Sure. I will Thank say you, that I, I think it's subject to be a, for the accountant or auditor to testify. I think all of the audits were qualified or uh, with a statement that they couldn't couldn't stand up for their accuracy except 2020 and the 2020 audit I believe was without qualification uh, Commissioner Matthews questions um, I just have one yes ma'am have you seen given that you've done some work on meters and billing system have you seen an increase in revenue um, that's a that really is a good question because I it's something I did notice doing the budget actually the revenue dropped from 2019 to 2020 and I and I think there's a couple of reasons for that some of that was the um, you know the COVID moratoriums but some of that was there was so much um, estimating of bills in the prior years that I believe the revenue was falsely and the consumption was maybe not accurately driven up. They weren't, the meter reading then was done by two part-time people and candidly, they did more estimating than they did reading. And so, so if you look at the 2019 on the audit and the 2020 revenue numbers, the revenue is actually lower in 2020. Could some of that be folks are using less because it's more expensive? It could be. I said there's a variety of factors. I don't have them broken down. I ha I, what I do know is that I was not comfortable with the 2019 meter reading and, and, and the accuracy of those reads. But there, 2020 was an odd year, as you know, so there's a lot of uh, variables that would probably go into, go into that revenue being lower. Um, and I know you answered this question earlier, so um, I'm going to ask it again, and I apologize. Did you see customer count go up? because you had seen people who were previously not metered or previously multiple homes on one meter? C customer count went up from when we first arrived. I think it was lower than what I saw in some 2019 numbers, but we have not, and this really is a better question for Craig, we've not aggressively attacked yet the multiple meter issue, which I think okay. will raise the customer count. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Cromer, questions? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Combo, any redirect? No redirect. Okay. Anything else of this witness, uh, Ms. Coney? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you. May uh, Mr. Sneed be excused? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Sneed. You may be excused. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Combo, would you like to call your next witness? I'll call Ann Perkins. Ms. Perkins. You need to activate your camera and uh, unmute. She's on her way. Is somebody going to call the auditor and let him know he'll be next? Yes. Okay. Ms. Perkins, please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Mr. Kimball? Thank you. Annie, would you introduce yourself to the commissioner, please? Just one second. I apologize for that. Yes. Okay. Um, I have been with Alliance for about 28 years. Um, I started out working in accounts payable, receivable, um, did my stint in the human resources department and the payroll department, and um, over 20 years doing client financial statements. Um, I have a bachelor's of science degree in business administration, majoring in accounting and management. I also served in the U.S. Army Reserves and was um, in ROTC for a brief, brief uh, time while I was still in college. Um, started out as an accounts payable clerk, worked my way up to where now I, I serve as Alliance's Director of Finance and Administration, and I have the HR department, accounting department, and um, the IT department. Great. <clears throat> when, uh, what role have you played in in the partnership with Alliance and the Martin County Water District? Um, so I came up for a visit with the Alliance team in December, um, evaluated the office, the billing software, and um, the overall admin of um, the district back in December and have been back since. And uh, <clears throat> what 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 role have you played in the uh, streamlining improvement uh, in the administration uh, of the office and its uh, practices? Um, so when we started in um, January, um, my biggest task was to get the audits completed. Um, 16, 17, 18, and 19 were behind. In looking at um, what the ladies in the office were doing, the billing software, um, I noticed quite a bit of items in the billing software that wasn't quite on par with other billing softwares I've seen with what we either use or what other clients have used in the past. So. Um, I uh, brought to my team's attention to the billing software. We lost, we lost the audio. It looks like it's statewide because it's everybody that's either in the building or up, up at the 300 building. Because um, Travis, I know Kent, that Zach. Miss Lefevre said that she was losing audio and wondered if it was a plant board issue. Cause yeah, because I mean, it's everybody everyone. on this street basically because I think those other people are all remote. Did you really make those cookies? You tell me that before, and I believed it, and now you did it to me again, right? Okay. We're good. Mary Cromer can hear. I don't hear. know if Ron or not. We can't hear them. Maybe they can hear us. We can't hear. They can't hear? We can't hear. We can't. She, like they're trying to fix it here but I think it's in the building because well maybe not I don't know well that's bizarre what happened to uh, the camera? Nancy said she could hear us on YouTube so the lady Mr. Fever up on the hill she can't hear you she said but we, they can hear us on the YouTube apparently can you hear us now yes yes, okay. yes. Okay. Oh, are we ready to resume? 
Let's go. Uh, what was the last part you heard? Uh, billing software was not up to par. You had let your um, partners know about oh. it. You were looking at the ladies' processes and there were. Yes, uh, to where um, in investing in the community, we this, we alliance management decided that this was a dire enough need that we wanted to go ahead and put this in place. Okay, then I think uh, you had segued into uh, some office practices, the uh, practices of the current office staff and their training. Okay. Um, yes, so uh, we um, took a look at office and what, what, what's going on in the office. Um, we uh, proposed to the board and the board adopted the red flag policy in the spring last year. Um, in the office, we've trained staff on securing passwords and how to treat uh, customer sensitive information just to make sure that we are protecting our customers the best possible way possible. Um, prior to Alliance being there, there would be instances or times when um, significant amounts of cash or checks would be left on premises in the safe overnight. That is not something that we do anymore. All payments received by the district is taken to the bank daily. Um, monthly financials are now issued to the board. Um, we have also, uh, a year after we've been there uh, this past spring, um, one of my accounting staff members actually came down and performed an internal control audit. Um, we have additional to-do items in the office as procedures are changing and updating SOPs, but we now have those on board and we are continually uh, cross-training staff so that we don't have one person that does everything and understands how the billing software works. Very good. What about uh, any cost savings? Were you able to bring any cost savings to bear uh, in your area? Um, so another item that we saw when we um, came in was there were um, some lines of insurance that were duplicated because Alliance had, were, was already carrying some cost and the district was also having to carry some cost. And so um, uh, we put a proposal uh, forward to the board and uh, were able to save the board $25,000 a year on their property casualty insurance lines. Uh, they were paying $46,000 um, before us and what we presented them with was uh, $21,000 paying going forward. Um, yeah. And then, um, sorry, Brian, there is one more. Um, also, um, as far as the audits were concerned, um, so we had 16 through 19 that we needed to do. Um, just uh, based on um, the amount of audits that we needed to do and the lack of responsiveness from the other firm, we sent out uh, RFPs to uh, five different audit firms located in Paintsville, Lexington, and Missouri. And two of the firms from Paintsville responded, but their proposals were quite a bit higher. Um, so we ended up uh, uh, recommending that the board uh, engage uh, Wade Stables, who is out of Missouri. So uh, the audit costs for the district for 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 are as follows. 14.4 in 2016, 10,000, 7,500, 7,500, and 7,725 dollars in 2020. So from 2016 to 2020, we've cut the audit cost in half. Yeah. And while we're talking about audits, there was questions put to Tony about the the status of those audits and how many were qualified. Can you speak to that? Um, so I, I looked briefly, 16 and 17 were unqualified. 18 and 19 were because of the lack of uh, enough documentation mentioned earlier. Uh, 20 was also unqualified. And finally, based upon your experience uh, with Alliance and in the uh, utility industry, uh, and have you 
do you have experience in, in your time with Alliance in helping to turn around districts who are similarly situated as far as financial distress? Um, so we had that client water district that in the early 2000s, um, they lived in a suburb of a larger uh, city. And so they were building houses like crazy. So their connection fee revenue was up. And so uh, forward thinking ahead, they, they noticed, they knew that there was going to be a need to build a brand new um, wastewater treatment plant. And so they built it. And then um, in 2008, the, the housing market kind of, well, the housing market crashed and this district found itself in, in, in uh, dire straits financially because they have this awesome facility, but no customers to support the operating expenses of that district. And so through various uh, tools, this district was able to turn it around and they're now in sound financial condition. And let's talk about the, I guess what we're really here about today, Ann, is whether uh, the district uh, should be uh, afforded a rate adjustment, whether it is an emergency. And uh, based on your education, training, experience, and background, could you speak to whether the rate adjustment we've applied for is necessary and is that uh, an emergency? Um, so to reiterate what, uh, Craig and Tony have already shared, and uh, Tony actually beat me to the punch in showing the, the uh, Exhibit 4F, uh, the snapshot cash operating $50,000 in the deficit each month. You know, we need to actually operate without the deficit so that we can um, look at other projects like, uh, you know, being able to negotiate the payment of the, the outstanding vendor debt. You know, according to, to that number, you know, $50,000 short, I don't know of any banks that would really lend any money to the district. And especially since uh, really until this year, the audits were so far behind that no, uh, nobody would, would, would do that. And so um, we need this rate increase now so that the deficit don't continue. And I think that's all I have for you. Ms. Koenig? Yes. Hi. Hi, Ms. Perkins. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, I think you covered a lot of what I was going to ask about, but I would like to just note that um, I'd like to ask you some questions about the depreciation schedule. It was in attachment seven of the application. I think, okay. that, I think that our staff has that to pull up if you can, Travis, or if you want to, if you have it for reference there in hard copy form. I do. Did you prepare the depreciation schedule, Ms. Perkins? Uh, no, the depreciation schedules are prepared by um, Wade Stables. Okay. I might just ask. Might just ask them. Yeah, I'll, I'll, he, he are next witness, Brittany. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just ask them about the depreciation schedule. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry that you guys had to pull that up. <laughs> okay. Um, let me go ahead and. But I guess just to point out that, you know, that the current proposed rates do not include any portion of depreciation expense in the calculation. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then um, you mentioned a little bit about the audits that you caused to have uh, performed. How were you able to reconcile the um, accounts receivable to get an accurate number for the auditor for 2020? <coughs> um, so what we have at the end, um, when we, did the billing conversion in, in June. We made sure that the, the balances from the old billing software is what carried over to the new billing software. And at the end of the day, we ran um, ending balance reports on accounts receivable and uh, 
to be frank, we, we had to uh, make adjustments to tie to that ending accounts receivable number. Um, based on what I saw from 2019 numbers, um, the bank reconciliations performed never really tied to ending accounts receivable on a monthly basis. Um, I believe that uh, the prior accounting firm maybe did the adjusting entries at the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Can you elaborate on some of the reasons you you note you noted that when you did your um, first audit of the um, internal controls that you noted the billing software you had concerns about? Could you go into that a little bit more? Um, yeah, so in looking at, um, you know, interviewing various staff members, I would ask, well, why is this that? Why is it this? Um, nobody really understood more than what they did on the billing, how to process, how to reconcile it. Nobody that I talked to uh, when we actually got here could actually tell me how that was done because everybody had pieces of it but nobody could really, um, nobody really used it to do their month to month so that uh, whoever the auditor was or whoever the, the, the accounting firm actually had to do adjustments for them at the end of the year. Okay, and also could you get reports from the other software? Yes, uh, so on ENCODE, uh, we actually run reports monthly, we tie, whatever is reported in the billing software is what we use to to do the bank reconciliation and so we are agreeing accounts receivable on a monthly basis okay and who who purchased the new billing software um the new billing software was uh put in place by alliance okay does martin district owe alliance for the billing software uh no they did no, they do not. We are not billing them for that. Is that because it was included in a in a, an account that was part of the services to the contract? No. Or is that okay? No. So typically, capital improvements. This would be a capital improvement is purchased by the client. In this case, uh, Alliance made an investment because we were in it for the long haul. In, in you know in good faith of a partnership and being here for a while, we knew that there was a need and we knew that uh, we needed this, this item. And so we didn't wait for funding uh, for money to be there, to be available. We, we, we saw a need and we, we addressed it. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm just a little bit confused then. So, in your responses to DR2, in uh, the data request, the second response, we asked for a list of items that, that Alliance Water Resources ha had paid for, but th that Martin District was going to need to repay. Um, on, yeah. this, on the amount, I mean, it, it, ENCODE is listed ten thousand dollars and the and the total is sixty five thousand nine hundred eighty nine dollars are you saying that alliance is not asking to be repaid for that whole six that is that that is correct yes that whole list that sixty five thousand dollars is not going to be billed to the district okay I, I didn't understand that previously thank you for clarifying that okay is that, I mean, have you done that before for other water districts that have been similar, similarly situated? Um, I, I, I don't, as far as vehicles, I've not been privy to those, but as far as the billing software, we had one other client that did not have the funds, so we, we bought it and we, to this day, we, we own it. Okay. Um, so on the items that you purchased for Martin District, are those going to be are those going to remain purchases for alliance like that they will retain ownership um as far as the vehicles are concerned those are alliance vehicles okay and as in past 
typically alliance does retain ownership of assets that we we have okay okay i think i think that covers all of that um i i do want to ask your opinion about um the bad debt expense and the amount of it um a bad debt expense for 2020 was recorded as 118,530 and represents a, approximately 5% of the total sales of water for the test period. In your expense, experience, do you think this is a typical level of bad debt for the water utility? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? Do you, do you have any other explanation or... Um, I just think that so um, I pulled a couple of clients and I, I in looking at um, averages I've seen one that is very proactive it's about uh, uh, their av average over the number of years that I had was about seven thousand dollars another customer um, in another area was about uh, twenty two thousand Mm -hmm. was an average so Martin County's is higher um, it is something that uh, with all the laundry list of items that we need to be working on I knew that uh, I was going to be talking to Craig on when can we put this as a priority okay and so in your experience um, have you ever seen a water district and its financials in the state that Martin County Water District was in when you started in 2020? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. Yeah, I've never been four years behind coming in when we signed the contract before. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I don't have any further questions. I have no questions. I ask the Chairman Chandler questions. I have no questions. Dr. Matthews? I have no questions. Ms. Comer? Uh, yes, I have a few questions. I hope you all can hear me. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so, my first question um, is about Boss, did they request them if I can get my please? I'm having a hard time hearing you, Mary. So my first question, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, in response to the data request about miscellaneous revenues, um, you said that, and, and I guess, did you answer that question? Was that yours? Yes, I believe so. And you listed a number of fees, four different fees, which ended with other fees, including those for theft of water and tampering. Um, but you didn't break it down to say, because my question was, you know, what are those 43,000 in miscellaneous revenues? Is there a reason, like, that you weren't able to break down how much each of those fees constitute? Um, so Mary, you kind of broke up on the end, but if I understand you correctly, you're asking if my, if you wanted more detail than those, is that right? Correct. Okay, so um, in typical financial statements that I've prepared, usually giving the detail that I gave was sufficient. I did not understand that you actually wanted them in that level of a detail. Okay, so, so it would be possible to get to get those amounts um, it, after this hearing? Yes. Okay, great. I will follow up with that. Um, so you had just been talking about the bad debt expense and the need to prioritize that. What, what would prioritizing that look like? What, what were you talking about? Um, so Craig is my since I am not stationed in Martin County 24-7, Craig is, I have to, 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 to um, say, Craig, these are needs that we have on the office admin side. 
what are how can we prioritize this as far as the other requirements needs that 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 Craig and his staff have um, so just more of you know last year we had to get through audits four years worth of audits we have to go through a billing software upgrade and and those are not uh, typically a billing software upgrade may be your only project for the year to where there's a lot of items that maybe need work but you have to prioritize it's a matter of a limited number of resources that you have and where does that yeah, uh, that, yeah that fall in place yeah just, what what um, are you talking about increasing collections efforts or, or what would that uh, be? You know, really even just the discussion of what are all the options, you know, just because um, something works in a particular area, you can't assume that it will be a successful in a new area. So re even really the group brainstorming on what the best way of doing this would be. Right. Well, and I guess that sort of leads to something I wanted to ask you about, I've asked Craig about, which has been, um, you know, a big priority for us is making sure that whatever customer assistance funding is available um, is being used by, by the district. And, and then, you know, as a side note, pushing for more customer assistance funding. Um, it, it looked like that, um, in 2020, about $100,000 in customer assistance and funding came through the Healthy at Home Fund. And so my question to Craig, and he said to ask you was, are, have there been customer assistance funds used in 2021? And if so, which ones? Yes. Uh, so we followed that question up with the office. And the answer to that is there were 25 customers that qualified or that received it, totaling about $3,000. And do you know which fund that was? Was that the eviction relief? Yeah, that I do not know, Mary, since I, I, I'm actually not here. That part of it, uh, we can get back to you and tell you exactly what fund that came from. Um, and have you been um, in any communications with um, Community Action of Kentucky or Big Sandy about the plans for the additional um, low, low income household water assistance program funds that are coming? Um, that may be something that Craig and the office manager may be working on. I, I can't I can't speak yes or no to that one. Okay. Um, and then just one one final question. Um, and this is something that that's come up uh, off and on uh, throughout the last year or so the meter read date it still doesn't show the actual date it still shows just the 20th and um the, why is why has it why have you all not been able to actually put the meter read date on the bills so unless we actually divided up the bills into multiple so um encode works in zones and right now ENCODE only has one billing zone because the district only bills one time a month. Uh, the one date for that, you can only have one date for that zone. And so unless we broke up that zone into 30 zones, there's no, currently you can't print the actual read date on every single one of those because it's controlled at the zone level. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of extrapolating a, little, extrapolating a little bit based on what you said, but it sounds like ENCODE is pretty standard in, in the industry. So it is correct to, to go on and, and conclude that throughout the industry, this is an issue that actual meter read dates are typically not shown on bills. Um, they are, but they are not, uh, Typically, you have the one date of either when you started or when you stopped, depending on what that office's procedure is. It doesn't get down to the level of the actual date precisely per customer bill. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that that you can have. Uh, you can have it, unless you want 
to build 3,700 300 zones, that is the only way to actually have it be that accurate. Okay, thank you. Uh, no further questions. Thanks, Anne. Um, I, hey, Mary, I do have a, an answer on your uh, question to Craig earlier about the number of disconnects. Uh -huh. um, in February, there were 322 disconnect letters issued and zero actual disconnects performed. And in March, there were 302 letters sent out with 54 disconnects. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Combo? Redirect. Another question. So, did say no? No redirect. Uh, anything? Uh, anything uh, further, Ms. Koenig or Vice Chairman Chandler or uh, Dr. Matthews? If not, may uh, may this witness be excused? Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Perkins. You uh, you may be excused. Uh, Mr. Cumbo, do you have another witness to call? Yes, we call uh, Steve. Bojano, and I'm sure I pronounced that horribly wrong, but he can he can correct us. I hope. That's close, Bojano. <laughs> Mr. Bojano, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, Mr. Cumbo, you may proceed. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, would you introduce yourself to the commission, please? Yes, uh, my name is Steve Bogiano. I'm with Wade Sables. I'm a uh, CPA. We've been uh, conducting audits of water districts for many years and uh, all over the country, uh, different audits of different types of entities. Um, and I'm here to answer your questions. I'm not on the, on the video feed. Thank you, Steve. I, I really don't have any questions. I, I We agreed to produce Steve as part of our case in chief because I it was my understanding from Brittany that the commission would have questions for Steve, and in that vein, I will turn it over to the commission. you have any questions, uh, Ms. Coney? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Bogiano. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions that uh, Ms. Perkins deferred to you on the depreciation schedule. If I can find that. Okay. 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 I, and I actually have mine pulled up, so um, I, I see it in front of me right now. Oh, okay. Um, are you asking to see the depreciation schedule? Or you have I it in front have of you? our copy of the depreciation schedule. I'm not sure what was uploaded, but I, I would assume it's the same. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, I just... On the, on the schedule, there are no additions for the calendar year 2020. Is that correct? I, there weren't any that were placed in service. Um, I believe there were some um, that were considered construction in progress. And let me see if I can find a dollar for you. Okay. Well, um, Travis, can you scroll down just a little bit? And you think that there were capital purchases outside of what Alliance purchased? Is that? Um, let's see. I do show, um, and this is in footnote number eight on page 16 of the auto report. Uh, and, and these are not reflected on the um, report that you have in front of you. Uh, it looks like there was about $331,000 of additions, uh, but since they had not yet been placed in service, they were not included on this report. Okay. And not yet placed in service, could that be um, additions that were planned for the projects that were not not bid yet or it, it would have been costs that were already incurred oh okay okay all right
Do you know who made the determination of reasonableness of lives included on this depreciation schedule? Um, yes, we work with uh, the clients on the uh, lives. Um, the initial uh, depreciation schedule came from the prior auditor, and those were the ones that were initially used. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, as part of our audit procedures, we always uh, verify with the client that uh, these are reasonable. Um, now, in our first year of the audit, uh, we were there physically, and I believe they did take a tour of the facility, our auditors that were there, um, just to, to see the reasonableness in person. Okay. Now, I'm sure they didn't analyze every single asset. So, however, they would have uh, had an understanding, at least, of the, the idea of the, uh, uh, the fixed assets. Okay, did you, were you aware that Martin County um, Water District had been involved in a rate case previously where, where assets were attributed depreciable lives? Um, I don't think so. How long ago was this? In case number 2018-17, the last rate case. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not aware. Okay, and in that case, the commission uh, staff recommended midpoint of the 1979 NARUC depreciation study, and then the commission adopted that uh, a, a depreciable uh, live in the order. But do you feel like that you have, you know, enough evidence that changes what your recommendation for reasonable lives would be, or? That there's enough substance there on you said you did a physical inspection of the the assets is that lead you to believe that you That's have enough yes. I, I was not there for that um uh the initial audit uh the field work um but yes it's my understanding that they did make a physical inspection now they wouldn't have looked at all of the assets um they, they probably would have just um uh, reviewed a few Okay. Um, and obviously, any any of the underground assets would have not been reviewed, um, as well as any that were on um, any uh, individuals' homes. But yes, it is my understanding that uh, the the lives should be reasonable. Okay. Is um, it but typical? I am not aware of the study that was done a few years back. Right. Okay. I understand that. Uh, is it typical to assign uh, the portion of transmission and distribution mains on the schedule th 33 years? Of I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is it typical to assign transmission and distribution mains the um, depreciable life of 33 years? Is that just a standard that you use? Uh, no, that's not a standard number. Uh, you know, a lot of times it'd be 50 years, but those were the uh, the the values that were placed in or that were used previously. Okay. Okay, I want to switch uh, my questioning to the audits, um, and in reference to the 2019 audit that states you were unable to issue an opinion, but unqualified opinion. Um, can you state for the record? Um, for an audit specifically, what it means to not express an opinion? Uh, yes, basically that meant we were not comfortable um, providing our opinion that uh, the financial statements were materially correct. Um, and I believe um, much of 2019 had to do with, um, there were some figures that we were not able to uh, ascertain uh, specifically with some certain uh, income and expense accounts. You know, a lot of this had to do with beginning balances. Uh, for example, the, uh, the ending balances of the previous year's accounts receivable, uh, we couldn't rely on what we received. And the, by not knowing the ending balance or not being able to verify those figures, we were not able to provide an opinion that the financial statements were materially correct uh, as far as the revenue was concerned. Okay. And so generally speaking, what's your opinion on the record keeping practices of 
Martin County Water District prior to 2020? I mean, generally speaking, it was awful. Okay. And then after Alliance assumed operations of the district and you performed the 2020 audit? It was significantly better. Uh, and in fact, we were able to um, provide an unqualified opinion. Okay. Um, in reference to the 2020 audit um, and the compliance findings, were there any material weaknesses not listed or, address or addressed in that audit? Um, no, the only weaknesses that we had were the ones that were reported on page 25 of the audit report. Okay. Are there any red flags or potential weaknesses that would not have been material to Martin District's case due to the level of audit risk? None that I'm aware of. Okay. Is Martin District out of compliance with its loan covenants with regard to its reserve account? That's my understanding, yes. That they didn't have the reserve properly funded. And is a reserve account balance required to be in compliance with its loan covenants? $66,491? That's what the, uh, the, the loan documents say. Okay. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the, uh, the 2000 or 2020 audit, just to reiterate, the, the uh, district uh, did not have uh, uh, a, uh, had not paid the required amount into a depreciation and, re and replacement reserve or a special account, which was, should have been $66,491, correct? Correct. And it's noted that the, the effect of that could be the district could be deemed in default for failure of compliance with its loan covenants. Is that correct? That's correct. And as an accountant, does that mean to you that, the, that in order to uh, uh, basically uh, stay clear of any possible uh, action by the lender to call the loan due or take whatever action it might deem necessary that that money had to be or was supposed to be kept in a special account to protect the lender. That is correct. Um, you know, unfortunately, we, we do see this uh, finding in many entities where um, either by, uh, you know, the district not reading the, uh, the required information or the actual loan covenants. Um, now, uh, generally speaking, um, I don't know that I've ever seen a, um, a lender uh, default a loan because of this, but technically it appears it could. And in your audit, yes, two, be, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it would be my recommendation that the, uh, uh, the district does uh, abide by the covenants. In, in addition, it's noted that Kentucky Revised Statute 65.140 requires that purchases must be paid for within 30 days of receipt of an invoice, uh, and the district was not in compliance uh, with uh, that statute. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, the, the district owes its vendors uh, close to $800,000, which has been due for, for the most part, for a number of years. Is that also correct? That is correct. There are some uh, accounts payables that are uh, several years old. And just for the record, in your audit of 2019 and your audit of 2018, those same findings were present, correct? That's correct. So those findings were present before Alliance uh, undertook management of the district on January 1st, 2020. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Chandler? I have no questions. Dr. Matthews? 
I have no questions. Ms. Cromer? No questions. Mr. Combo? No questions. Ms. Koenig, anything further? No, sir. May this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, you may be excused. Appreciate uh, All right. Thank you very much. You all have a great day. Appreciate your cooperation. Uh, Mr. Combo, uh, let's try to call another witness here real quick, if we can, before we maybe take a break. Well, I was going to call Jimmy Kerr, but, but if you want somebody maybe, quick, maybe, I'll have somebody else. <laughs> maybe, maybe we ought to take a, let's take a, a 15 minute break until, well, let's take 10 minutes until uh, 20 minutes until uh, 3 o'clock. I know I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for Mr. Kerr. <laughs> All right, we'll be uh, uh, in recess until uh, uh, 2.40 o'clock p.m.
He's ready to go. <clears throat> He's ready to go. I, I don't even have a, a list of questions to ask Mr. Kerr. <laughs> Well, I figure whatever it is, he's just going to do his own thing anyway. There's a pretty good chance he's right. And uh, I want to say before I get started that I've still not received my plaque for uh, most appearances in front of the Public Service Commission. I, I'm still I, waiting I, on it. I think you deserve one. Yeah. <laughs> please, please raise your right hand, uh, Mr. Kerr. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Cumbo, do you have any questions, or are you just going to let uh, everybody take a, t I don't say take shots, but ask Mr. Kerr? I think he knows. He knows what we're doing here. <laughs> well, I, I figured I'd give him an opportunity to talk as long as he wanted to, and, and maybe he'd get you guys more out. Uh, no, Jimmy, state your full name for the record, please. James D. Kerr. And uh, what is your relationship with the Martin County Water District? I am the chairman of the board. And we're here today, Jimmy, obviously on our application for rate adjustment, but I want to talk first about uh, about Alliance, the contract with Alliance and how, uh, in your opinion, uh, Alliance has performed uh, since they've uh, come to partner with us uh, since uh, January of last year. How would you characterize their performance? Uh, it's been great. I, I go back to, I don't know, it was a hearing probably a year in when we took over and the idea got floated that I'd be the person uh, to come in and run the water district. And you don't know how amusing I find that now. Um, knowing what I know. Number one, because I was that arrogant thinking that I could actually do this. And two, now that I've seen what Alliance actually does and what professional water people can actually do, um, uh, I, I in no way was uh, capable of performing uh, the job that Alliance has. Uh, I've said it many times, and I, I think Chairman Schmidt has said it many times, that one person could not have came in here and really shouldered the burden of what has, had, what has to be done, has been done, and has to be done in the future that it really was going to take a team of people. And that's what we got uh, with Alliance. Uh, from Craig, Tony, Ann, uh, Tim, uh, to the other divisions of Alliance, uh, the, the men and women who have been in and out of this system uh, you know, since January uh, and really uh, worked hard um, to make it better. And it is clearly better. Um, it is unrecognizable. Um, as a business from the day that John Paul and I came onto the board um, uh, to now. Um, it is much better managed. Um, we do have accurate data. The board um, has good information to look at and can make decisions on. Um, and so they have shown me uh, what is possible uh, for the Martin County Water District. And I don't know that I always believed that it was the case that we could fix this. I, I know I wanted to believe it, but I'm not sure uh, that I really believed it, and I do now. Um, I believe it's going to take a while, a lot of hard work ahead, a lot of money needed, a lot of infrastructure work that needs to be done, uh, but I've seen glimpses of, of what is possible. <clears throat> Very good. And for what it's worth, Tim, Jimmy, I agree with you. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk now about the, our application for or a rate increase, and particularly our emergency request. Uh, in your in your opinion, as chairman of the, uh, of the board of the uh, Mark County Water District, would you, uh, you explain to the commission why you believe uh, you not only need a, a rate adjustment, but an emergency rate adjustment? Yeah, sure. Uh, we just can't keep uh, digging the hole that we're digging. Um, at some point, we have to become, basically get to a break-even point. Um, and that way we can get our vendors paid um, and we can truly behave like a fully functioning business. And until that happens, we're not going to be able to do so. You know, Brian, this will be the third time I think I've come before the commission um, for a rate, rate increase request. Um, and it's not fun. Um, and the way that I see it, is it fair? It's not fair that myself and John Paul and the other members of the board are the people that are having to come here and ask for this. Um, it's not fair for the customers necessarily um, that we're having to do this again either because this wasn't done historically 
over the last, say, 20, 30 years, but it is 100% necessary to move this district forward to the water system that our people want and deserve. Um, and I think the numbers and the presentations that have been given by Craig, Tony, and Ann today uh, clearly uh, point that out. We sit in the board packet every month um, that we are still running a deficit and obviously are you know behind with the lights, uh, three payments at this point. Um, and you know, it is, it's detrimental that we do this or else we just keep digging, our, digging this hole. You know, we've got to get ourselves financially soluble to the point where we're breaking even and can pay our vendors and pay all of other bills each month. Very good. That was uh, refreshingly brief. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're lucky to get just yes or no answers after your smart comment. That's all I have for this witness. Thank you. Ms. Connie. Thank you. Uh, hello, Jimmy. How are you? Hey, Brittany, how are you? Just fine. Um, I think he answered all my questions, except for I just have a clarification for you to make. Um, I did watch the uh, board meeting on Tuesday, I guess it was, that, that you're live streaming those on Facebook so customers can see those. That's great. Um, but so do you have, there was a, a board member that was on the end, and, and I just wondered if you have a new board member or... We do. We have one. Well, we have a couple. Okay. Um, Greg, I think since the last time we were there, Greg Crum, um, who is the head of uh, the Calvary Temple um, School, um, uh, B.J. Sloan, who is a pharmacist uh, here at a local office, and then Lee Mueller, who worked uh, for the Lexington Herald Leader for years and was appointed by the Public Service Commission. Okay. 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 I think that you um, you spoke well of Alliance and the track that you're on. Um, has your role as far as day to day with the district has it changed since Alliance has been there? Oh yeah, greatly. No, I mean literally, John Paul and I were doing all we could. I, I, I don't know, John Paul sitting here, we were probably putting in 20 to 40 hours a week a piece, just trying to, you know, help keep up and keep the thing from collapsing. Um, and now, I mean, I still talk to Craig, like he said, when, when they first came in, I was so invested that I literally called him every day for probably three months. And now we still talk and we talk a couple times a week if we need to, if I have questions or if he needs some guidance for me. Um, we speak and then of course, you know, at the board meetings, um, yeah, it, it's changed drastically instead of being involved in the day to day, which we had no business being involved in because we did not have the proper experience to be involved, uh, that way we do get to kind of give the 3000 foot view and, and help give guidance, uh, based on each of our, our different expertise. So okay. yeah, it's a lot different. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thanks for <laughs> Mr. Kerr, I guess uh, I stated earlier, and I'd, I'd like to, if you would, confirm that that after the uh, 2018 rate case, uh, where Martin County Water District asked for a 42% rate increase, the Public Service Commission did not award uh, the water district the rate increase that it had requested. Is that correct? That is correct. And I think both you and uh, uh, and your expert uh, had testified here, Greg Heitzman, that that it was clear that the district needed more money from that rate increase forward, and that irrespective of whether a professional management firm was hired or not, the water district had to have more money going forward. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. The, and I, I'm going to talk, I guess, in more detail with Mr. Uh, Caudill of Bell Engineering in a few minutes. But the, the, the district was awarded, uh, I guess, got some grant money uh, uh, for the Warfield uh, service line replacement and meter replacement, and then for the uh, uh, basically the getting water from the river to the 
for the raw water intake. Uh, apparently, that those projects were bid what once or twice? Twice. First time we bid, um, it came in over. We only had one bidder, um, so we decided to put it out for a second bid and actually contacted some other companies to try to draw some interest in the project. Um, and ultimately, uh, we did get a second bid, but only one company bid, which was the same company that bid the first time. Okay. And ha how did the bids compare with the projected cost or estimated cost of both projects? I want to say for the plant and intake project, we were, what, a million two short. I believe that's the number. Um, and then the project over in Moorfield, the lime project, you know, had obviously different components of it that could be taken away to match up with the grant money because it's, it's line replacement. But because we had such a shortfall and the immediate need at our water plant and our intake, which is where our water comes from, um, we decided to divert those funds for the Warfield line project um, to that project. And then we are seeking other funding uh, since the Warfield line project is shovel ready right now. We're trying to uh, get some other funds through how Roger's office um, to get the money to get that project going as well. And I know uh, uh, these problems that uh, uh, the water district has faced predated your, uh, your appointment to the board. Uh, and I know in, in previous testimony, uh, you've discussed uh, the fact that uh, you spoke with several banks uh, uh, several years ago trying to see if loans could be obtained on behalf of the district to help pay down its debt and so forth, uh, and you were unsuccessful. Is that correct? That is correct. And is that because the financial status of the district at that time had gotten to the point where nobody was willing to loan money to, to Martin County? Yeah, absolutely. We did not have the audits uh, that, like you said earlier, nobody's going to loan you money if you do not have audited financials. Um, and, uh, yeah, and two, just the, I guess the, the negative light that had been placed on us through the media and things like that and the struggles we were having, uh, nobody was interested in talking to us at all. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Chandler? I, I'm just curious, Mr. Kerr, have you, have you spoken to anyone since the audits have been complete? I have. Um, I have a what we would call in the banking in industry a commitment, non-commitment letter <laughs> um, for the debt service surcharge funds from the new bank, the bank that purchased Ines Deposit Bank, uh, State Farm. What is it, Farm? First State. First State Bank. Um, and uh, that's something that we will be submitting uh, to the uh, commission for review um, at some point. Of course, that is going to be contingent upon, you know, the ability to use that debt service surcharge um, to pay uh, that loan payment, um, uh, which is, you know, totally upon whether or not we get this increase so that we can use the service surcharge for what it was intended for. Um, and then there will be, of course, some negotiation. I got their initial offer, um, kind of relayed that to the board uh, in our last board meeting on Tuesday. And then I did get a commitment letter. As I said, it's a commitment, non-commitment letter. It basically says, yes, we'll loan you this money if, and, you know, lays out some things, but none of which seemed like was, you know, unattainable for us. So uh, we'll send that down for your guys' review uh, at some point, and then we'll start negotiating with them if, if the rate increase goes through. And specifically, what is the loan for? It is to pay off our vendors. Right, it will basically cool. take care of all that, consolidate all of it, and then that debt service surcharge account would be used specifically to pay that one loan. And does the the uh, we'll, we'll call it a non-binding uh, commitment, right? Um, yeah. With with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things that have to happen. Um, what did, did did they did they commit to specific terms? Not did they commit by not committing to specific terms? <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, what was it, two over prime, which is roughly about five and a quarter right now. Uh, probably a five-year term, which the debt service surcharge uh, with what we collect right now uh, would be able to fund that. Essentially, they would collect an interest payment each month uh, and then sweep it once a month for the principal payment. And then we would just do that until, obviously, it was paid in full. Okay. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. You know, only thing before I ask Dr. Matthews, uh, Mr. Kerr and Mr. Cumbo, I guess, knows this. You know, the the uh, Public Service Commission will have to approve that loan. So, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll, we have it. We just got the letter late yesterday. 
Um, we were going to submit it before today, but we'll get that submitted to you just so that you can review it. And then if we get to the point, because there will have to be some negotiation done, if we get to the point where that thing becomes a reality, then we will absolutely get it to you guys for your approval. Dr. Matthews? Jimmy Don? Hey, Dr. Matthews. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You're sleeping a little better these days. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Right. Um, now that you have the 2020 audit, have you talked to KIA about any of their low interest, no interest, forgivable uh, loan programs? Yes, ma'am. We are in the process right now, as Craig stated, I guess, in that list of projects. We sent out RFQs, uh, and we're in the process of putting packages together to submit to everybody. I think the one, you know, commitment or the, what I asked Alliance at the beginning of the year is I had several goals for the year, um, and one of those was a full meter replacement. I think that is our next big ticket item that we you know, are desperately in need of, and we are seeking out all the different revenue so or all the different funding sources for those. Uh, so yes, ma'am, we are in the process of working that plan now. Okay. I would think that given that you have a, a an audit, things will open up for you that maybe were closed before. Yes, ma'am. That's all I had. Okay, good to see you. Good to see Ms. you. Ms. Cromer, questions? No questions. Mr. Cumbo, any uh, any redirect? <clears throat> no redirect. Okay. That'd take near as long as you thought it would, did it? I don't know how you did that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, you must be losing your charm or something. Uh, that's Mr. Kerr, I mean, you, I don't know what you, you, usually you're on for at least an hour or two. <laughs> I know. Look, this is hands down. The, I think my longest was three hours, and my shortest was like two hours and 45 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> may uh, uh, may Mr. Kerr be excused? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. You may be excused. Thank you, guys. Good to see all of you. Mr. Cumball, I guess you have another. Do you have one more witness? I have John Hensley, uh, uh, Commissioner. Uh, it, uh, he is he is here primarily because the commission, inter commission indicated they wanted to hear from him also. So we'll go ahead and call him as our next witness. Thank you. Good to see you again. Ms. Transley, please please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Mr. Hensley, state your name, please. My name is John Paul Hensley. Mr. Hensley, how are you affiliated with the Martin County Water District, if you are? I am uh, currently serving under the term of treasurer for the Martin County Water District. Yeah. You're a member of the board of am on the board. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> we're, we're here today, obviously, and, and have been here at a time for, uh, for testimony relative to our application for rate increase. But let me ask you uh, the same questions that I put to, uh, to Mr. Kerb. Uh, John, how would you characterize Alliance's performance since they uh, first partnered with us back in uh, January of last year? I was kind of hesitant really to uh, get a management company to come in and uh, then after meeting with uh, Tim uh, McCarity, the uh, manager, general overall manager, I suppose, uh, and talk with him and he answered every question that I have had in mind and then after they actually come on board, uh, I have been very impressed with what Alliance has done in a short period of time. Everything that I had uh, wanted us to do, for instance, like uh, combining, uh, instead of sending out two bills, one for the uh, water and one for the sewer, we're now just send out one single bill, which is a savings to both places, actually of uh, probably about $15,000 uh, a year just that way. Uh, we're looking at getting, uh, the new meters and stuff that's that's one goal that we're trying to attain and and we desperately need that or uh, and it's going to save overall cost on everything uh and alliance is just performing 
the, the way that I think that they should be done. Fantastic. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about our, our application for a rate increase and, and, and whether that, that application should be considered an emergency. Would you share your thoughts and opinions with the commission relative to that request? Well, you know, everyone that's so far before me has testified and it's documented that uh, every month that we've been in, that we're in the, going in the hole and you cannot operate any place by doing that. You have to pay your bills. You have to be able to pay it off. And I think that's all the questions I have. Okay. Ms. Koenig, any questions? Yes, I only have one question. Hello, Mr. Hensley. Hello. Hi. Um, were, are you the treasurer on the board? I am listed as that, yes. Okay. I just wondered if you had any unique perspective as treasurer, how you've seen things change. But it seems like you're saying you're listed as treasurer, but maybe you don't perform those duties. Or can you explain your... Well, I'm not, no, I've, I am uh, listed as a treasurer uh, because no one else do, is, uh, <laughs> we really don't have anyone qualified to be a treasurer. Okay. But you said you were impressed with Alliance and do you feel like that they've addressed the finances and everything? You said that they're performing the way things should be. Yes, any any time you have a question or anyone else has any problem, all I have to do is pick up a phone and um, I, I can talk to uh, Craig Miller. Uh, if Craig can't answer the question I want, then I call Tony Sneed and then Tony can't do it, I can, I can holler at, at Tim. And, and that's the whole thing about Alliance, you know, you uh, if the person there is giving you the answer that you want, someone can. Okay. And so would you say the board has been supportive of Alliance since they've been there? Yes. Okay. We kind of have a new board uh, pretty much with, with three new people that's on it. But uh, everyone, I think, is impressed with Alliance. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Okay. Mr. Hensley, uh, I just uh, would note, I guess it's been mentioned earlier, that during the year 2020, last year, uh, the Martin County Water District had an operating loss of $690,000. And through April, from January 1 through April 30th of this year, it had a net operating loss of $188,657. Uh, uh, I suppose you would acknowledge, would you not, that continuing those kinds of losses is going to put the water district out of business because no one will work for you, no one will sell you anything, and you can't have the chemicals you need or the electricity that you need to process water unless you can immediately get some rate relief. Is that fair to say? Would, that would be fair to say. And as I understand it, that when that Martin County Water District is operating and has been every month in the red uh, for the last maybe 8, 10, 12 months or more and that that Alliance has basically not only not been paid for 30, 45 days but they've actually been uh, carrying expenses and paying for things that the water district would otherwise be paying for. Is that true to keep the operation that, going? That is, that is true. No, no further questions. Vice Chairman Chandler? I have no questions for Mr. Hensley. Dr. Matthews? I don't have any questions. Ms. Com Ms. Cromer? I have no questions. Anything further, Ms. Koenig? Yes, sir. Uh, may Mr. Hensley be excused? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Hensley. You may be excused. Good, good to see you Thank again. You. Is that your Good seeing you all. Uh, Thank you for your, your time. <laughs> Anything that, further, uh, Mr. Cumbo? That, that concludes the, the case in chief for the district. Okay, I think the commission had uh, asked for someone from the Division of Water. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We'd like to call Amanda Lefevre. Okay, Ms. Lefevre, are you uh, 
Are you present? I am. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lefevre. Will you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. County? Thank you. Can you hear me, Ms. Lefevre? I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for being here. Um, you've already stated your name for the record. Could you, could you um, actually uh, spell it for the record, too? I know you have it. Absolutely. Uh, it's L-E-F-E-B-R-E. -E -E. Okay. Thank you. And um, where are you employed? I'm employed with the Kentucky Department for Environmental Protection. And your business address for the record? It is 300 Sour Boulevard, Frankfort, Kentucky, 40601. How long have you been employed with the Comp De uh, Department of Environmental Protection? I've been with the department since 2006. Okay, and what's your current position? I serve as the Deputy Commissioner for the Department for, for, Environment, for Environmental Protection. Okay, how long have you been in that position? I took this position in September of 2020, so just about eight months. Okay. What are your general duties and responsibilities? Uh, I'm basically here to assist the commissioner in carrying out the, the duties and the responsibilities of the department, which is basically to protect human health and environment. Uh, we administer, oversee, and enforce um, state and federal environmental law and regulation. So uh, on a daily basis, I could be doing anything from department-wide initiatives to facilitating communication between the secretary's office and our agencies, um, working with regulated entities that you know, the public or, uh, you know, communities on issues or taking on special initiatives uh, like facilitating the Martin County Water District work group. So uh, those are some of the things that fall within uh, my, my job duties. Okay, great. Um, what's your highest level of education? I have a master's in public administration. Okay. Um, have you ever testified at a public service commission hearing before today? I have not. Did commission staff request your testimony regarding the Martin County Water District work group? Uh, yes, they they asked for an overview of the work group um, and some of the um, accomplishments as well as um, um, some of the compliance data that we have for the facility. Okay. And did you draft a letter to the commission about the work group that was filed in the record on May 26, 2021? Yes, I did. Okay, great. Um, can you tell me about how the work group was started, who started that, and what are the goals of the group? Absolutely. So uh, the, the Martin County situation uh, was a... Um, a priority for the Bashir administration uh, when they came came in in uh, the fall of 2019. Um, so by the time Secretary Goodman came in in February or, or in um, end of 2019 into 2020, um, you know she asked that our Division of Water spearhead an effort to help with the communication and collaboration of all the things that were going on uh, with Martin County and all the agencies. Um, um, you know, who were touching that particular subject matter. So uh, that group was formed in February of 2020. Um, we had our first meeting in February. Uh, and basically, we were there to foster better communication and identify issues and resources. Uh, that prevents overlap of uh, initiatives. Uh, it helps us make better decisions because we know what each are, are doing. Um, and it really just helps focus that effort. Uh, and of course, you'll be hearing from some of our focus group uh, or work group members, um, you know, after my testimony. So you'll see some of the some of the uh, work that our members are doing. Okay, um, I'm going to read off a list of some of the participants. Um, it's the EEC, Martin County Water District, Alliance Water Resources. Kentucky Rural Water Association, Big Sandy Area Development uh, District, University of Kentucky, 
Martin County Concerned Citizens and Bell Engineering. Is that an yes, adequate list of participants? Yes. Okay. That's and correct. staff within that. Okay. They all meet. Um, is it? They meet, quarter, they meet quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we have a technical subcommittee that meets monthly uh, with um, Alliance and uh, several members of the larger group. Okay. Uh, we get together once a month to talk about any technical issues uh, and try to identify ways to solve them. For instance, um, I think on one of our calls, we discussed a better way to calculate water loss and rural water uh, worked with uh, Craig and Alliance on, you know, looking at a better way to calculate that. So um, that, that meets on a monthly basis uh, and they report during the quarterly, the quarterly meetings. Okay. Is there any other water utility that's receiving um, these types of resources from the D Division of Water or the EEC? Uh, no, this is very unprecedented. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think we've ever done anything like this. Uh, Martin County presented this complex issue uh, that rolls together uh, poor management, operational issues, system neglect, geographical challenges economic issues and really call to action um, from the citizens and the media. Um, so this is a system that lacked much of the technical, managerial, and financial capacity to, to operate. So um, no one agency could really take this on um, individually and, and solve these, these issues. So, um, you know, that, that's why we sort of gathered the group. Um, so there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. So the group helped so us communicate and focus. Um, I think we've brought together a lot of organizations um, and, and this allows them to do what they do best. And that's the power when, when you get so many folks together to, to work on an issue. Uh, and I hope when this all wraps up, uh, because I, I can tell you that while Martin County is in a very, very dire situation, I'm, I'm hoping that when this all wraps up, we'll have learned some lessons uh, and maybe be able to maybe not at this scale, but uh, use some of the same relationships and, and same processes to help other utilities that might be going through this. Okay, um, because a lot of these agencies were already in different um, stages of uh, processes and, of helping and assisting Martin County, right? They had uh, ongoing projects and were at different places. So um, I, I think that you spoke to um, just trying to keep everybody focused and on the same page, but also realizing what uh, the different agencies part was to play. Um, for instance, I think the, your inspections, the Division of Water's inspections were different than the PSC's inspections and discussing that at meetings. was that Has that come out a bit at meetings? Uh, yes. So uh, all of us, uh, you know, uh, throughout the process, we, we'll talk, give updates on um, anything that we're doing. So, um, you know, we'll update on, you know, if we've done a comprehensive inspection or sanitary sewer inspections, um, you know, your inspections uh, have a lot more of a financial component where ours are more operational focused in, in terms of compliance with Safe Drinking Water Act and things like that. So, um, you know, when, when we talk in our technical committees and, and uh, in the overall um, quarterly meetings, we try to update on, on all of that type of information. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that. Um, can you just discuss generally and in, in your experience in the position that you have with the Division of Water, um, has the management improved at Martin County Water District since um, you've been involved with the work group? Right, and I just want to clarify, um, I'm at the commissioner level and not with the Division of Water. Um, I'm sorry. So, so sorry uh, about but, that. No, that's fine. I, I, just, I don't want to hold expertise that I do not have. Okay, um, thanks so. for clarifying. Not a problem. Uh, in terms of everyday management, um, I can I can tell you that there's no question that the management capability of the the, the system has has improved. Um, Craig and Alliance walked into a facility with serious serious data and information vacuum. Uh, Alliance has done a great job in triaging the situation and working sort to sort working to identify 
uh, and quantify those critical challenges and efficiencies. Um, so that helps them gain that great, that big picture of, of what's happening. Uh, so you can actually plan and, you know, come up with goals. And, and Craig talked about his 90 day goals this morning. Uh, and that's really, really important. Um, you know, they have the water loss program, meter reading initiative, the reconciling of records. Um, it's just helping them figure out what's going on in the system. Um, so that, that forward thinking um, operation mode is really important to a well-run facility. So, you know, Craig was talking about 90 days. You know, ideally you want people to get to the point where they can think ahead in years. Um, and, and Craig is laying that, that groundwork to get the, the facility to think years in advance instead of in this you know, emergency mode that they're currently in. Um, so um, he's done a lot to something else that I'm, I'm, I'm you know, pretty impressed about. He's done a lot to train his operators um, and, and developed a lot of SOPs. I think if you saw the pictures this morning, when, whenever they go to repair a line and they find gorilla tape or radiator clamps or things that you would never find in a properly run uh, system, um, that when you have well-trained operators who have operating procedures, you won't find those issues. Um, so, you know, your, your, your system sort of heals itself that way. I mean, there, there's lots of things that still need to go on but having a well-trained on operator is important. Um, so in my opinion, Alliance has addressed a lot of, and I don't mean this condescendingly, but a lot of the low hanging fruit uh, in that that's their sphere of control. Um, you know, they can do a lot operationally and management, uh, but what they can't control is in the ground. Um, so they made solid progress with what they have, but there's a lot that they still uh, need to conquer in terms of, uh, you know, their infrastructure and, and, you know, the surprises that await them on a, on a daily and weekly basis. Um, I can tell you, um, while I'm not with DOW, I have talked to our DOW staff and from their perspective, I can tell you that their working relationship with Martin County has changed trem tremendously and improved. Um, they feel that the current manager management is far more cooperative. Um, they, are reportedly far more knowledgeable and proactive in nature. Um, their notifications and are timely and their communication is transparent with us. So we can't fully help a system if we don't know what's going on. Um, so that's not the case now. Um, so there's, I can also say as much as we work with them, it's not necessarily in a hand holding nature because uh, I think Jimmy talked about how professional they are. Um, so, I mean, not only Craig is and Alliance is professional, but they're teaching their staff to be professionals too. So um, that that relationship has changed. So. Okay. Okay, that's great. That's very informative. And uh, so I'd just like you to briefly touch on compliance um, matters. You listed in your letter a, a couple of instances of compliance, but generally it looks like they have improved, except for a couple of issues during the flood. And um, and then a, a, the uh, there was an agreed order on disinfection byproducts, but that was before um, right. It was before alliance. So I'll, I'll go this through this um, issue by issue. First of all, first of all, you know every it, uh, facility has to comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay. Um, part of that is monthly monitoring. Monthly monitoring through. Um, monitoring operating reports or MORs and basically that's just a record of how much water they treat, um, the hours per day that they treat, the types and amount of chemicals used and the, the results of any sampling that they do and that's due 10 days after the end of the month um, you know that it's for. So all of those reports have been timely um, since January of 2020 when Alliance came in. Historically, Martin County Water had five violations for failure to submit these reports dating back to 2013. Uh, the last violation was received in 2018 for that. So um, they're timely with their reports. Uh, Martin County has um, 
you know, largely been in compliance with those, except for uh, they exceeded the um, performance standard for turbidity on March 1st uh, during the flooding event. Um, and turbidity is basically the clarity of water. It can, you know, it's basically, um, it's an indicator that there's silt or uh, organic material, microbes, algae, something in there. And of course, when the Tug River floods, it, it stirs everything up and it's taken into the plant. So uh, a turbidity spike um, is not necessarily unheard of during flooding events. I think at this point, they also had a rake dry bearing that went out at the same time. So I think it was sort of bad luck here, but they uh, they had an oil water advisory already into in effect. Uh, they immediately called our office and notified us of that. So that is a pending NOV because it was on March's MOR, which we got in April and had to process the data. So that will be issued. Uh, and then they also have to do a required public notice with specific language. Um, but other than that, they've been in uh, compliance with their MORs uh, for everything that they monitor for. Uh, you mentioned the disinfection byproducts. Uh, to my understanding, they're, they're also in compliance with those. Uh, there was a previous agreed order for disinfection byproducts that was closed in April of 2020. Um, but that was put into place after multiple um, DDP violations in 2016 and 2017. And we closed that after nine quarters of compliance. So, but we're, we're good there. So. Okay, great. Um, and we had uh, inspections during this time. Uh, they had one full inspection, uh, or what they call a comprehensive inspection. And that's basically a paperwork review, a comprehensive look at the plant. They also, uh, I think that was in 2020, um, I think they've done um, a sanitary survey in that uh, same time. And the sanitary survey is more of a technical assistance tool uh, where we tell, tell you, you know, based on our standards for managerial, uh, financial, uh, and technical capacity, here are the things that you can improve on. Um, so as you can would think, they, they've, they've made some strides in the managerial. We did one in 2020, and we're doing another sanitary survey. Uh, in 2021 and that's been completed but it's not finalized uh, but i can tell you i, I believe that um, a lot of the managerial check boxes will be checked off but those technical and financial issues will probably still be there so and technical would be the, you know your your infrastructure um and, and things like that and the financial of course is financial okay and so um, the sanitary survey um, is normally done every three years or or five, but correct. but they have upped the schedule. Is that the secretary decided to? Yes, and, and thank you for reminding me. Yes, that's typically done every three years according to Safe Drinking Water Act um, requirements. But uh, Secretary Goodman asked that we do it once every year um, just to keep um, uh, keep eyes and just note progress and try to identify areas that we could further help. So once again, it's a, it's a technical assistance tool. So it just allows us to have that, that comprehensive look at the system. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, with the technical and the managerial is more of our framework. Financial is a little bit different from what you would do in terms of financial. Um, but, we, we do do that, and, and that just keeps, you know, uh, us focused on the system and gives us feedback and getting them feedback on, on, you know, what could be done better. Okay. And then... Oh, I think we're back. Okay, we might be back on. Can you still hear me, Amanda? I can. Okay, we just seemingly lost power here at the PSC, but I think we're back on. So we'll continue. It's been a great day, right? <laughs> yes. I don't know that we check our boxes techni technically today, but anyway, um, as far as the work group, and you mentioned that it, it helps the many agencies um, work together and get on the same page, but what do you see as, as the future of the work group and its um, its goals as far as the future and helping Martin County Water District? So I think, you know, uh, we, we talk about funding and of course, uh, I think in the, the, over the course of today, we were of course talking about rates and we're talking about, uh, Jimmy talked a little about loans and things like that, but 
there's also um, grant money coming down the pike, and we don't know how much and who will get what. Um, but we know this work group will still be there to help, um, you know, talk through issues and help prioritize and maybe bring uh, technical um, assistance to determine, you know, um, you know, just to provide any type of advice or anything like that and how you prioritize, um, you know, money as it comes down and match up projects and, and things like that. So um, I think we can still serve a purpose uh, as we go through this and, you know, hopefully, you know, Martin County will, you know, um, be in a position where they don't need us anymore. And that would be fantastic. Um, and that's, that's really, really our goal. Uh, but until we get to that point um, and, you know, it, it, we'll be there to help assist any, any way that we, we need to. Okay. Thank you very much for your time today. I have no further questions. Thank you. I, ha I have no questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, questions? I have nothing. Dr. Matthews? I have nothing. Thank you, Amanda. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Cromer? I have one short question. Um, okay. Amanda, thank you for being here. Not um, a problem. My question is just in regard to the 2016 agreed order. Um, when you said that is closed, I'm wondering how that affects certain requirements in that order. In particular, one of the things that was required is that the district develop and implement a flushing plan. Um, and that was submitted and approved by you guys. And so is that still a requirement or did that get released when the agreed order got released? You know, Mary, I am actually not aware of that. Um, so uh, I'll be happy to find out, but um, I can't speak knowledgeably about that. So I don't want okay. to give you the wrong answer. Well, thank you very much. No thank further questions. Mr. Cumball, uh, any redirect? No questions. Okay. Anything further, Ms. Coney? No, sorry. I said Ms. Coney could be redirect, right? Sort of witness. Uh, if there's nothing uh, further, uh, you may be excused. Mr. Lapierre, All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, you have Mr. Caudill. Is that yes, correct? Mm -hmm. Mr. Caudill, are you uh, are you with us? There you go. Thank you, Mr. Caudill. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Coney. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Caudill. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Could you state your name and spell it for the record, please? Stephen Caudill, C-A-U-D-I-L-L. -L. Thank you. Um, can you state where you're employed, please? Yes, I am uh, vice president and manager of the civil group at Bell Engineering in Lexington, Kentucky. Great. Thank you. Um, and what is your current job position with Martin County Water District? Uh, it's stating that our audio is lost. Okay, so everybody on the YouTube can hear us, but nobody in the thing can hear us. Can you hear me now, Mr. Cottle? Uh, okay, just for a Okay. Yes, but I don't think he heard me because I'm going to have to ask that again. <laughs> That's where I am in my question. Yeah. Oh, 
Are we, can you hear us, Mr. Cottle? Yes, I can hear you. Great, I think we're back on. Okay, uh, I think the last question I asked you was your current job position with Martin County Water District. Uh, my current job position is uh, I am vice president and manager of the civil group for Bell Engineering well, in Lexington. Okay, but um, what's your position with Martin County Water District? Do you have a contract with them? Yes, we have multiple contracts with the Martin County Water District, and uh, we are providing engineering services from uh, design, bidding, and construction on uh, multiple projects. Okay. Okay. Um, can you state your highest level of education and your degree there? I have a uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Kentucky, and I am a registered professional engineer in the state of states of Kentucky and Ohio. Okay. Have you testified at a public service hearing before today? I have not. Okay. And did commission staff request your testimony regarding the Martin County Water District Work Group today? Yes. Okay. Did you provide a presentation to the commission about the work group and have it filed in the record on May 25th, 2021? Yes, I did provide a presentation. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to have you present that in a moment, but I, I would like to just highlight, do you have a figure in mind right now um, that you know that it'll take to put Martin County Water District um, in, a, in a place where it can pump clean water to ratepayers and be on track financially? Well, Chairman Smith, uh, at one of the very first uh, meetings we had of a work group asked a similar question. And I think at the time uh, I threw out a number of approximately $50 million. I think the 50 to $55 million range, uh, probably closer to 55 today, given the inflation that we've seen since then is probably more in line with what the district needs at this time uh, to come up to uh, high level of service. Okay, thank you. Could you present your presentation? Uh, yes, if you can allow me to do a screen share, I will go ahead and start. Okay, you have permission. It's it, You should have permission. So. All right, can you see it now? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a presentation that was given recently uh, at the work group. Uh, we give presentations on a quarterly basis concerning the projects that we're assisting the district with. Uh, and this is a summarization that was given at, on May the 12th concerning the water systems improvements. Uh, the first place that I'd like to just start is with the funding that the district is working with. Uh, currently, the district is working with multiple funding agencies uh, through a variety of grants, and those grants are listed here uh, for you to see today. There is an AML pilot nexus grant from the 2017 funding cycle in the amount of $3,450,000. A Corps of Engineers 531 partnership agreement in the amount of $1,869,718. An ARC grant in the amount of $1.2 million. An AML pilot nexus grant from 2018 in the amount of $2 million. And then there's several uh, funding sources through the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, some of which we know what the final numbers will be and some of which we don't. Uh, the first is through the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet Bridging Kentucky Funds, and this is these are funds that the uh, Transportation Cabinet utilizes to replace bridges, and that often leads to water lines having to be relocated. Uh, the Willis Dallas Dance Branch Road has already been done in the amount of $38,357. Uh, due to funding considerations, uh, two other projects had to be deferred into the next fiscal year. Uh, so their budgets have yet to be determined. And then there is a Kentucky Transportation 908 guardrail project that will relocate a 14 inch, portions of a 14 inch water line the district has. That also, budget on it is yet to be determined. 
So the total grant funding the district is working with is eight million five hundred fifty-eight thousand seventy-five dollars. As you've heard previously, uh, the needs are many throughout the district. They're not just concentrated in one area of the county. This is a map showing the locations of the projects that are being uh, that are being paid for through the grant funds that I just talked about. As you can see, there's eight projects shown on this map and they're scattered throughout the county. And I think that's indicative of the fact that uh, the district's having to address many different issues uh, simultaneously. The first project we'll talk about is the raw water intake improvements of pump purchase only. When uh, we were retained by the district and the area development district back we, in uh, early 2019, we had a kickoff meeting and we met then former, e, or former e, EEC Secretary uh, Charles Snavely. And at this point, the district's raw water intake was inoperable. They had had some new pumps put in and I think they lasted seven or nine months. The district was renting a pump from Xylem International at a cost of approximately $20,000 a month that the district was having to pay. And at that point, Secretary Stavely gave us several directives and by us, I mean the ad, Bell Engineering and the district. One of which was to get rid of that pump as quickly as possible. And then the second notation was that the funding agencies didn't want to spend all the money down at the raw water intake. So we needed to come up with something outside the box to replace uh, the intake pumps that were there. So what we came up with uh, was the purchase of two new pumps, uh, which has already occurred. One is a 2 million gallon per day raw water intake pump with a variable speed drive. The second one is a 4 million gallon per day raw water intake pump with variable speed drive. And then a new river screen that would screen in front of these pumps uh, at a cost of, or I mean, at a rate of 4,000 gallons per minute. Uh, the new river screen uh, is important, self-cleaning. Uh, just to give you an idea of when we went down to the previous uh, intake, we could not even find the pipe that goes out into the river because it was covered with sediment. Uh, nor could we find the intake structure itself that was out in the river. So we actually did a bathymetric survey to even be able to locate that. As you know, this, uh, this area or this river has a lot of sediment in it. And therefore these pumps were selected because they can also pass a considerable amount of sediment. In our opinion, uh, failure of the previous pumps were primarily due to the high level of sediment that was in the river, that was in the raw water. And without millions of dollars of retrofit, the raw water intake could not be able to make, you would not be able to make the raw water intake function reliably. So these pumps were purchased at a cost of approximately six hundred and one thousand uh, dollars that's all in project budget uh, funding was provided by band of mine lands through the 2017 nexus grant uh, it's complete uh, should be noted that districts had use of the uh, two million gallon per day pump now for some time that is the one that was questioned previously uh, that is the one that uh, was sent for service and now is back the four million gallon per day pump will be placed in service at a time when the raw water intakes and water treatment plant improvements are made. And I'll explain just in a moment why we can't place that in service right now. But uh, before I go to the next slide, I'd just like to note that by utilizing this system, the district has been able to save approximately $400,000 in pump, pump rental costs uh, while the next project was being designed and brought online. The second project that will discuss our actual improvements to the raw water intake and water treatment plant. Uh, they consist of a concrete ramp 
an electric winch system that will move the raw water pumps up and down a slope to keep them within an optimum distance of the river level. As Craig alluded to earlier, that river rises and drops fairly quickly. Right now, they have no easy way to move that pump around. Uh, this will rectify that situation and allow them to keep the pump an optimum distance from the water. And Craig alluded to the cavitation issues that were seen in the pump when it was uh, reviewed in the shop. That is because the pump is at a distance greater than we would like to see it from the water level. So as soon as this concrete ramp system goes in, uh, Craig and his people will be able to optimize that and we do not look for that to be a problem at any point going forward. As I said, we would really like to use the four million gallon per day pump right now. Uh, times like these when the uh, reservoir is down, it would be great to pump four million gallons instead of two million gallons. The problem is the electrical system that's down at the intake currently cannot handle a four million gallon per day pump. So we have to upgrade the electrical building. We're also adding telemetry so they can control these pumps remotely from the water treatment plant, along with line reactors and instrumentation. The line reactors will help clean up the power down there. Craig noted that uh, there's a lot of dirty power in Martin County. That's true, it's very hard on equipment. At the water treatment plant itself, uh, probably the best place to start here is just kind of explain the treatment plant uh, it is rated at 2 million gallons per day. There are three combination clarifier filter units. One is a redundant unit. All Basically, all three can do 1 million gallons per day. That's how come the plant's rated at 2 million gallons. So at any time when it's running, two should be operational. The third one is the redundant unit. So if there's a problem with one of the other two units, it can be taken down. And it can be repaired and then brought back into service. Clarifier number one has not operated at the Martin County plant since approximately 2009. So the district has had no redundancy uh, in its water production capabilities since about 2009. We're currently seeing problems with the drive uh, on clarifier number three, and it's going to have to be taken down soon. So as part of this project, uh, one of the most important things is clarifiers one and three will be rehabilitated and there'll be a new valve vault for clarifier one. We'll also replace the outside chlorine chemical feed piping, which uh, basically right now are just hoses run around uh, and strung around the system. So uh, that will be replaced with hard piping. The chemical storage also leaks Water leaks down on the chemicals that they're storing. We'll repair the roof there. We'll replace the master meter. And we'll also be adding a 500 KVA, KVA on-site backup generator so that the plant can continue operation during periods of power outages. The project budget from a construction standpoint that the district submitted, I guess probably as part of the 2017 funding cycle was approximately 2.447 or 247 dollars with funding uh, being prepared or being provided through the abandoned mine lands 2017 nexus grant and the Corps of engineers it was alluded to earlier uh, this project has been bid twice the first time uh, project bids were open on the uh, 15th of December. At that time, the district only received one bid. That bid was submitted by Pace Construction of Louisville. At that time, after some discussion, uh, it was decided to rebid the project. The hope was that we could get more competition. Uh, during the second bidding phase, there was more interest Craig alluded to the fact that uh, there was some site visits made uh, to review the project. There were some uh, numerous questions asked by a contractor in Ohio. 
There were also uh, a request from a contractor to delay the bid opening for two weeks so that they could better prepare their bid and give a more competitive bid. Uh, the owner did allow that. However, when we opened bids on April the 13th, we still only had one bid. The bid that was received was from Pace Contracting again, and it had a base bid amount of $3,858,387. There were several additive alternates and several deductive alternates uh, because we felt like there was a good chance it could come in over budget. The base price plus the additive alternates, so in other words, the base price plus everything else that we were hoping to do was $4,003,722. Because it was the district understood that it would be impossible to make these important repairs with uh, and also do the next project that we'll talk about, the Warfield project. They had some preliminary discussions with both abandoned mine lands and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers concerning the possibility of moving money from the Warfield line replacement project to the raw water intake water treatment plant project to address the overage. The district's been negotiating with the low bidder. We had a meeting last week. We got some preliminary information from them this week concerning the bid alternates and other potential money saving project modifications. Uh, we're hopeful that we can negotiate with PACE to get this job in bid or in budget within the next uh, several weeks. And then the district is district's intent is to award the raw water intake water treatment plant project and move forward with this particular project's construction. As soon as the negotiations are complete and the funding agency concurrences are obtained. Next project is the mainline service line and meter replacement in the Warfield area. This is a project that, uh, as it says, uh, in addition to the mainline service line and meter replacement, also uh, replaces the existing valves and hydrants. It had a total construction budget of $992,000. The district realized early on that there wouldn't be any way that they could do the entire project they wanted. So we had a base bid and again, several alternates. The alternates being put in place in case another source of funding came along at some point during either late design, bidding or construction. Funding for this particular project was provided by Band and Mine Lands, uh, which 2017 Nexus Grant and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, as with the previous project we discussed, bids for this project were initially opened on the 15th of December. Uh, the project was, uh, was rebid and bids were opened the second time on April 13th, at, just after the bids for the water treatment plant. Three bids were received. Uh, the base bid, which again is all the district ever thought that they would be able to do, was $910,463.40. The base bid plus all the additive alternates was $1,736,825.40. So due to the overage on the water, on the water treatment plant intake project, uh, the district's intent is to defer construction of this project to a later date and use the funds associated with this project for construction at the intake and the water treatment plant. Uh, the district has already submitted funding requests for this project in an effort to obtain project funding it will continue to do so so that this project can be constructed as soon as possible we often hear the term shovel ready project i can tell you that in america there's no more shovel ready project than this should appropriate funding come along because all the designs complete all the permits are in place we have multiple permits from the division of water permits from the corps of engineers permits from the transportation cabinet, all this project needs is adequate funding and it can go to construction. The next project again is another mainline service line and meter replacement project. This one's actually in the lovely area. Uh, it had a budget of $1,200,000 with uh, funding provided by the Appalachian Regional Commission. Uh, just to kind of summarize what's happened as far as part of this project, uh, it's included the installation of a new master meter to, a seat, to, to assist in leak detection. Uh, it's also 
facilitated the installation of 24,500 linear feet of new main line, uh, 66 new 5 eighths by 3 quarter inch meters. It should be noted that uh, in working with Alliance, the meters that are being installed as part of this project are radio read and will be capable should the district uh, be able to move the rest of their system over to radio read. The meters are already in place uh, in this area and will not have to be replaced. They can be utilized uh, in the future. Also, uh, approximately 3,500 linear feet of new service line and a new two inch master meter to a trailer park were parts of this project. Uh, basically, the project is complete. Uh, the contractor was doing his punch list work this week. He'll continue to do that next week. Uh, he's got some more cleanup to do. And at that point, we hope to be closing the project out fairly soon. Uh, we hear a lot of negative stories. There was a positive story with this. We recently at our office received a call from uh, a lady who was asking a question about the project and indicated that her grandparents lived in this area and had lived there for decades and had never had adequate water pressure. And as this project has gone line that gone, gone live, that her service or their service had improved immensely. And this is likely due to uh, replacement of the service line here in this area. Uh, Craig didn't show it earlier, but I've seen a picture that he has uh, of a piece of service line that uh, is only 18 inches long, but it has seven clamps on it uh, to stop leaks. So, this is the kind of thing that uh, contractors and alliance and the district are fighting right now. Uh, next project is improvements uh, to the water at the Big Sandy Prison, the East Kentucky Business Park, and the Big Sandy Airport. It'll include construction of a new 250,000 gallon water storage tank, a new 400 gallon per minute pump station and telemetry, upgrade of the existing Dabala pump station, and a master meter and booster coordination system. Uh, Craig alluded to the fact that this is the pump station that pumps to the prison. So from a financial aspect, it's very important to the district. However, even though it's not that old, it has some significant issues. Uh, ductile iron pipe is what uh, the water line is in this area. And it has a pressure class rating of 350 PSI. However, at times, uh, the water system in this area exceeds the pressure class rating of this pipe. So it exceeds that kind of level. So what this project will do will cut the pressure in half. It will also give the district more storage out there should they need, be able to, should they need to be able to pump through the prison at a greater rate. Uh, budget's $2 million. It's funded by Band of Mine Lands through a 2018 Nexus grant. Uh, we, had everything pretty well nailed down on this particular project. However, we learned that we could not use the tank site that we had selected uh, because the full bond release from a past mining company had not been yet achieved and AML money could not be spent uh, in an area where a full bond release has not occurred. We're looking at, we're trying to finalize two other sites and pick one of those two. Try to work with Craig shortly to get that make a site visit and then us go ahead and nail that down. But while that tank site's being finalized, design of the pump station, master meter and coronation system are all going on. Uh, next project's the high school water storage tank and booster pump station telemetry. Uh, this is a fairly new pump station and fairly new tank. However, they were built without telemetry, which is not ideal because as Craig indicated, he has to send someone out to uh, turn the pumps on, turn the pumps off. If they something happens somewhere else in the system, uh, perhaps the person can't get back soon enough, uh, the tank overflows and you have water loss. Uh, so this was added telemetry so that they can monitor this particular pump and tank from the water treatment plant and control them from there. Uh, the Martin County Fiscal Court actually paid for this. Uh, all equipment's been installed and it is operating currently. The district is using this telemetry system here. 
Next project is Willis Stiles Dams Branch Road utility relocation. Uh, again, that's to relocate a portion of existing water line to facilitate a new bridge uh, being constructed by KYTC. This isn't a huge project in the fact that the 38,000 in water line work isn't a huge number. However, these type of projects are very important because we get to replace and put in new water line at stream crossings, uh, and that's often where districts have problems. Plus, you can't see it when it leaks, it goes into the stream, it's harder to find. Uh, so although these aren't big dollar projects, they're very, very beneficial. Uh, that project was approved by Division of Water last August, uh, was quickly constructed and placed into service on September 24th, and the relocated line is in operation at this time and performing well. There are two other relocation projects that are sitting in the wings. Uh, those are bridge, are relocations for bridge construction at Hunter's Lane and Rockhouse Creek. Again, these won't be big dollar values, uh, but they will be important projects to the district. Uh, we were hoping to do these this year, but uh, due to funding considerations, uh, they have been put off, not so much with the water line, but more with the bridge. Uh, they have been deferred to the state's next fiscal year. Uh, another project we're working with KYTC on is the Kentucky 908 guardrail project. Uh, this particular section of line lies between the district's water treatment plant and the city of Inez. Uh, so there's a 14 inch water line in there. The district has had problems with this line in this area. Uh, the KYTC now wants to put guardrail in this area. So we will be relocating a portion of the 14 inch water line to facilitate this guardrail construction. Again, uh, at no cost to the district, but a very important piece of infrastructure. Uh, lastly, uh, we, with, uh, we, Bell Engineering, and the University of Kentucky are both building uh, water models. They're a little bit different. Our water model is more in line with looking at flows, pressures, things like that as far as an operational standpoint uh, with the system in Martin County, whereas the University of Kentucky's model is looking more at water quality and disinfection byproducts. So they're calibrated a little bit different, uh, but they they uh, operate off the same skeleton. And the status of that, all the lines, tanks, and PRVs have been input into the put input into the model and the location feel verified uh, to the greatest extent possible without digging up every line in Martin County. We've uh, verified the line sizes. We've looked at the pressure zones. We've been taking, uh, Tony at Alliance was extremely helpful, and I've got to say that Alliance is extremely helpful and always gets us whatever information we need. They got us the usage data for every single customer in their system, and we put in the usage data for all 3,000 plus customers uh, so that we can see where usage was occurring in the system and entered that into the model. We then went out in the field and, and calibrated that with field collected data. And we've been checking that against field observations and the model does uh, appear to be functioning uh, and have some good predictive values. Uh, just as a check here, we have given our model to the University of Kentucky and they've given their model to us and we're both QA in each other's model at this time. And that's pretty much a summary of the uh, projects, the funding that the district has in place, and how they're working to expend it. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Cottle. Um, I'd just like to follow up with, uh, you mentioned that you were explaining that you have a picture of, or that um, Craig Miller found a pipe that showed like seven clamps on it. Um, Staff would like to offer a PSC exhibit to, we have a picture as well, um, and I'd like you to identify it as soon as I, oh, our staff can pull it up. Trent, 
Travis. Travis, can, can you pull up PSC Exhibit 2? Thank you. Does, is that the, uh, the type of example that you're discussing? Yes, that is, that is what some of the service lines, unfortunately, in Martin County look like. Uh, from a standpoint of uh, engineering or an operations, standpoint, uh, it would have certainly been cheaper to have replaced that section of line than to put all those clamps on it. And much better long term. Okay. Staff would like to ask that that exhibit be admitted. Sustained. Okay. And Mr. Cottle, I would only have uh, one other follow up question about the work group. Have, have you ever seen a, a response as far as this gathering of agencies to respond to one water district um, in your experience as an engineer? You know, I, I have worked in the water and wastewater field for 28 years, and I have never seen this level of response and commitment from the owner to all of the agencies to uh, all the citizens, to everyone involved. I've, I've never seen anything quite like this. And it has worked well to facilitate communication. Um, you know, I, I spoke about one of the projects being shovel ready. Uh, one of the things that people sometimes don't understand is just how long it takes to get all these environmental permits. Uh, and that's, you know, they're used to writing, to being able to just go construct something. But uh, when you take federal grant money, a lot of permits are associated with that. And I think that's helped people in their understanding as to why it takes so long to get some of these projects to construction. Believe me, we would like to get them to construction quickly, and I'm sure the district and Alliance would also. Thank you. And just, um, I'm sorry, I do have one more follow-up. Do you have anything to add on what you've heard today about Alliance's performance or Martin County's performance since you've been involved in these projects and anything well, that Alliance, hasn't been said? From both Alliance's standpoint and from uh, the Martin County Water District standpoint, our, our work with them has been very positive since I've been there. Like I said, there's, we can ask for almost any information and they will get it to us. And likewise, uh, I hope Craig feels the same way. Any information that we're in possession of, we work get to get it to them diligently. <clears throat> so I think that, uh, that as it's been stated earlier, Alliance came into a difficult situation, but uh, they've done an excellent job. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Well, Mr. Cottle, the, uh, yes, sir. how would you evaluate the current status of the entire infrastructure of the Martin County Water District? I mean, I'm assuming you've, they've got now $8,558,075 in, in grant money, uh, but you're talking about perhaps uh, to get the district up to speed where it should be, uh, you're talking about $55 million. So I assume that the infrastructure is not in good condition overall. No, it's not in good condition. Uh, for many of the reasons you've heard today, uh, poor installation, uh, poor planning, quite frankly. Uh, there's scenarios where... Uh, there may have been a two inch line out there and someone decided that it needed to be expanded, which really it should never been expanded in the first place. And they connected a four inch line to it. So you have a smaller line feeding a larger line. There's areas of the uh, county where there are multiple mains feeding one hollow. Uh, some, all of them live. So, you know, you ask the question of, you know, what's one of the ways to get rid of water loss? 
if we could get some of those mains shut down and a new new a single new water line laid in these areas it's just the condition of the system uh, is poor now in order to basically make the improvements that you feel are necessary uh, will that require funding from sources outside of Martin County government and the Martin County Water District? Yes, it certainly will. Uh, you know, we talk, we're talking about a limited, small, relatively small customer base that unfortunately, you know, in many of the areas, rural areas of the state is declining. Your customer base is declining. And then Martin County also faces the fact that, uh, unlike some other communities, they don't have big users really there to help subsidize some of this. So it really, the burden of the rate paying really falls on the residential customer. And without monies from the state or federal government, uh, I don't think that it's practical to be able to think that these rate payers could pay enough to, to make these improvements that are needed. <clears throat> Until those improvements are needed, uh, when repairs are needed and, uh, and smaller items are needed to be replaced, absent outside money, the only source of funds is in fact the rate payer though, isn't it? That's correct. And if the water district at the present time, according to the testimony, is running uh, deficits of $50,000 plus a month, or the first four months of, of, 2000, of 2021, $188,000, uh, that's, not, that's not a sustainable, that's not sustainable, is it, in terms of uh, being able to operate the district at all? That is not sustainable. My comment toward, uh, you know, without the, the state or federal uh, funding was more in line with uh, large capital projects. Okay. You're correct. There are no other funding sources just to do day-to-day -day repairs. Uh, those will be have, have to be borne by the rate payer. And ultimately, without uh, substantial state and federal funding, rate payers are always going to be faced with probably some excessive water loss and other inefficiencies which will cause ratepayers to pay more than they otherwise would if the district had been maintained properly in the first place. Would that be fair to say? Yes, that would be fair to say. It is a brutally vicious cycle that you find yourself in when you don't do routine maintenance as it should be done. Thank you. I, uh, Mr. Cole, I have no further uh, uh, questions. Uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, questions? Yeah, just have two, uh, two lines, very short lines of questioning. So, Mr. Cole, the water treatment plant, um, are the proposed overhauls or the proposed fixes to the water treatment plant long-term fixes or fairly short-term fixes? Those are long-term fixes. Uh, okay. Those... You know, there's other areas of the plant that could use improvements also, but these are the, the these will in lengthen the time that those clarifiers and those filters operate uh, substantially. Yeah, I don't mean to indicate that they're not, you know, necessary for, for operations, even in the short term. I guess my question is, is the location, age, and condition of the water treatment plant durable um, for a horizon beyond 10 years? Is it is it possible to continue operating it beyond ten years? Yes. Without, without significant. Ideal? I'm sorry. I was gonna uh, without significant capital improvements beyond ten years. Is it an ideal situation? It's not an ideal situation. I'll be quite frank. Uh, this is one of the few districts that you see that draw water out of the tug fork. Uh, there's a reason for that. Water quality is not great. The uh, the sediment content in that particular stream is very high and that has been detrimental to both the intake and to some extent maybe the plant. 
uh, there's a reason why Prestonsburg, Pikeville, Paintsville, and Louisa all draw out the Levisa pour. It's a better quality stream. Uh, if we were starting today and going to locate a water treatment plant, I think it would be more appropriate to try to get the raw water from the Levisa pour. But uh, that is not the box we find ourselves in today, unfortunately. Uh, and so we're uh, trying to stay in the box that we're in and make it as operable as possible. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and if if the district was were to build a new water treatment plant, would you recommend that it be at the size that the current one is? Probably, if the assuming water loss gets under control, uh, I don't unless there is some reason to believe that population will change substantially. Yeah. And that uh, industry will come into the area. And even though it, it would be a, maybe a like size replacement, it, it would just operate significantly less uh, if the water uh, water loss was fixed, correct? Correct. Okay. And and is it, I guess my, my, my final question is, unless water loss comes under control, is is operating, even, even at the reduced levels that the plant is operating now, is operating at the capacity factor that the water treatment plant is, um, it, is that healthy for for a water treatment plant to be operating 18 out of 24, eight, you know, uh, all but four hours every day or two? Now, we, we would certainly prefer that it not operate that many hours because it leaves you, you know, if there's an issue, you empty your tanks or something like that, uh, when you're already operating at near capacity, it makes it very difficult to fill those tanks back up. Basically, water's going in as soon as it goes out, or water's going out as soon as it comes in. You know, we would prefer to see those numbers lower. Uh, I think they've moved in that direction, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to. Yeah, it just, it just reduces the room for error, right? Exactly. It, you know, you're, you're, that's well stated. The room for error is greatly reduced. And the time you have to get a problem under control is greatly reduced uh, before you have significant issues. Uh, similarly to, uh, you know, why we would like to have, be operating the 4 million gallon per day raw water intake pump right now. We'd like to fill that reservoir back up much quicker than we are. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just ask you, you're, are you aware of the previous I was asking uh, Mr. Miller about him earlier, the previous attempts at raw water intakes um, on the Tug Fork by Martin County Water District. I'm aware of some of them, yes. Okay. I, I've seen the one that is there now, and I'm okay. aware. It's the and are, you, and are you aware of the, the, the vault that was there before, uh, the floating uh, apparatus? Actually, I was there one time, and I saw it flipped upside down, so yes. Uh, I, I have seen it in the field. So let, let me, why is the current proposed fix, we'll call it, right, uh, or project uh, a more durable solution to the raw water uh, troubles that Mount Martin County Water District has had? Well, starting with the uh, river screen there, uh, this river screen is made for areas that are high in sediments. So siltation won't be as big a problem for it. It's a self-cleaning screen. Uh, it cleans two ways. One, it uses the river current to slowly turn it and clean it. It also has sensors on it that detect whether or not uh, the system is fouling. So then at that point, uh, it has water sprays on it that will come on and clean it. So we feel like that we'll have much better control over the sediment. Sediment is what has killed previous uh, previous intakes there, no question about it. They have uh, vertical turbine pumps. Vertical turbine pumps do not do well within high sediment areas. Uh, that's why that they were getting probably six to nine months out of some of those pumps. The type of pumps that we expect uh, have a greater capacity to pass sediment. So one, we expect to see less sediment because of the type of river spring we're installing. And then two, the pumps that we have should be able to pass it to a greater extent. Now, Craig mentioned uh, suction. That is an issue there. 
However, by building this ramp and building the motorized system to move the pumps up and down the ramp, uh, we feel like that we'll, they'll be able to keep it at the optimum location from the river level very easily. It won't require any equipment. It'll just require the pushing of a button. And therefore, uh, the pumps should function well in their suction lift. So we feel like that uh, for all of those reasons, that this particular intake setup, while not what you would normally see, and maybe not what we would necessarily design, is one that uh, will work and will get the district uh, the performance that they need. Okay. You also, um, part of the project is a 500 kW uh, generator will that operate the pumps and the water treatment plant in case uh, power goes out or is that just for the water treatment plant that is just for the raw uh, water treatment plant okay. the uh, assumption being due to the cost of the of placing one of those at the intake uh, as you know right now the intake pumps into the crumb reservoir and then it gravity feeds out of that our assumption being that as long as they keep the reservoir full that uh, we should be able to go a significant amount of time without the pumps at the raw water intake. So it was more of a value engineering uh, decision from that standpoint, trying to do the most with the limited funding available. That's fair. And then, and then talking about power for a second, you alluded to earlier poor power quality issues at, is it at the water treatment plant or at the intake or both? Uh, it's more in, uh, Greg can speak more to the intake, but, uh, the, it's I'm sorry more to the plant but yes uh, we're, we're going to have to do an upgrade at the uh, not only an upgrade of the electrical building but American Electric Power will also have to do an upgrade there at the intake to facilitate this new equipment well that's why I was asking I mean uh, you know we regulate more than water districts I'm, I, I'm just curious are you all have you all discussed your power quality issues with AEP uh, yes we have and I okay. think they've actually had sensors on there at times. So okay. you, you feel confident that that's going to be fixed so that it doesn't actually cause you all continued issues. Yes. So the greatest we've been assured, let me re put it this way. We've been assured that it will be remedied. Okay. And you'll let us know if it doesn't. Yes. All right. That's all the questions I have chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cottle. <clears throat> Dr. Matthews questions. I don't have any questions. The Vice Chairman stole my questions on power quality. So. Ms. Cromer, questions? No questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, where is he here? <laughs> Mr. Combo, any questions? No questions. Okay. Ms. Coney, questions? I have no further questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Appreciate your testimony and the time you spent with us today. I'm sorry you ended up going last or next to last, but um, you may be excused. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, next we had, I guess uh, we'd ask uh, Ms. Uh, McCoy uh, to be present and, and speak on behalf of concerned citizens. Uh, Ms. Cromer, uh, would you uh, present Ms. McCoy for us? Certainly, I would like to call Nina McCoy. Ms. McCoy, will hello. You, will you please, uh, hello, will you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. Cromer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name for the record? Uh, Nina McCoy, M-C-C-O-Y. And could you tell us what your position is with the Martin County Concerned Citizens? Um, the chairperson. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, get you to talk a little bit about how things have gone with Martin County Concerned Citizens over the past year during COVID, as far as the meetings have gone. Well, like with everything else, it's been tough through this year. Um, we had uh, one Zoom meeting where uh, we explained what the UK study was doing. Um, but then um, 
really 2020 was no meetings. Um, and then this year in April, we've had two meetings um, outside, outdoors, one in Inez and one in Pigeon Roost. Um, during that time, have you been able to hear any of the concerns from the citizens about the water district? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of a lot of quarreling about um, how much it costs for the water, um, and you know, some have talked about the quality of the water, and um, some have talked about the um, problems with you know trying to contact Alliance and not not getting, I guess, the response they thought they would get. Um, okay, let's just talk a little bit about affordability. Um, have the Martin County Concerned Citizens uh, look at what this rate increase would mean as far as affordability goes? Yes, we have. And um, what we what we figured is that this is actually going to be the most expensive minimum rate when you include um, the surcharges as well as the um, minimum rate. And I, I'd like to get um, uh, PSC staff, I'm not, not sure who it is to do this, to show um, the exhibit number one. It'll be Travis, and so he has all of your exhibits. Thank you, Travis. There we go. Thank you. Um, Nina, could you tell us what this is? So this is a, a comparison of the, um, the minimum rates. Um, and right now, um, looks like we're uh, fourth in line, but with the, with the rate increase, we would be the highest charged for the minimum. Um, okay, and, and can you tell us where, where this data came from? Um, well, it came from the Public Service Commission um, rate tariffs. And, and so what, why is it of particular concern that the Martin County would have the highest rates um, of the, all the minimum rates in, in, the, in, in Kentucky? Why is that of a particular concern? I guess the way that um, that we we would see it here is that um, yeah we're a poor county um, yeah we are in the hills but at the same time it just doesn't seem fair that um, they can't run a system on the highest I mean this in other words everybody paying the minimum. This is not like, you know, if you're saying only those people who uh, have 4,000 gallons, but when you're talking about the minimum, everybody's paying that amount. And it just seems uh, just strangely unfair that in the poorest, one of the poorest counties, we would have one of the highest rates. I know we're mountainous, but there are other mountainous areas in Kentucky. Um, can, can we see uh, exhibit number three, please? Great, thank you. Um, Nina, can you tell us what this is? So this is a uh, from the uh, Census Bureau, and this is the ranking of the income levels within the Mar Martin County. And can you talk a, just a little bit about how this chart intersects with um, the affordability concerns you were discussing? I guess the way that I look at this chart is the amount of people who are, I'm going to go with below 25,000. Um, below 25,000 a year and how there are so many of those people and here you're gonna have such a, you know, the, the highest water rates. It just seems uh, unfair. 
um, talk today about the the last rate increase and uh, the fact that the water district didn't get the full amount that they had asked for. Um, I guess I, I'd like to see exhibit number four now. Um, Nina, could you tell, when we get back to number four, um, could you tell us uh, what this is? Okay, so this is um, a look at um, how much the rates have increased um, over time and how much it would increase with this rate. Uh, and one of the things, you know, one of the things I want to point out is I want to thank Bell Engineering Alliance for proving exactly what the concerned citizens started for. The reason we started was because we said, there is something going on. There is something rotten in Denmark here and we are not, we're not gonna do it anymore. We're not gonna put up with it anymore. So that's the reason we wanted to get involved. And at that time, Public Service Commission may remember, um, they were asking for a 49% rate increase and, and then everything will be okay. And the you know, Public Service Commission said, no, we're not going to allow uh, uh, that much for different reasons. But if you look at this, if you include the surcharges, there's been a 53% rate increase on the minimum. And so those who want to say, oh, well, you should have just given us the 49% in the first place. No, no, that's not true. So there was a lot wrong. There's still a lot wrong. Um, it just it just needs to be brought to the attention that this is going to be an extreme uh, amount to ask of a poor county of a lot of the county. And and so if they um, get the request get the rate increase that they're requesting today on an emergency basis, how much will that be overall? It will be a 69% overall increase over the three years. Um, I'm move us along and talk a little bit about the second thing that um, you talked about, which was the customer service um, issues. And could you tell us a little bit about how Warren County Concerns have, um, what we've been doing to push, push on the customer service issue and to make sure that there's um, well, tell us what we have been doing. Well, actually, you know, it, it even started before Alliance got here that we kept asking that the previous management, um, you know, we hear that all these people say they've called in, they have done this, they've tried so hard. You have a leak on their property, but nobody came to look at it. So we asked for just a list of customer complaints um, just so that they would have a, a log of what is going on? How are people affected by the water? What are the people saying? And they're not just calling us. Um, they're not just putting it on uh, water warriors, but they're actually calling the office. And so we gave, um, when Alliance came in, that was one of the recommendations that we gave was, please have a customer log of complaints. I don't care if it's my bill is too high, they left the uh, meter, the, the top off my meter, whatever it is, if you know how many people are saying that they have this problem, then we feel like the customers will begin to have more of a feeling that they've been listened to. And you said we, we gave them that recommendation. Was that, was that in a letter? Yes. Yes, we did. Six. Yes. Yes. And then soon after that, we'll look at exhibit seven.
And so, you know, can you tell us about what this, what we're looking at now? So that is, uh, that is um, as we started uh, our work with Alliance, this is one of the things that we just wanted to make clear that um, this is something, it's going to take a long time to get customers to feel good about a new company taking over or any improvements that might be made. And one of the things was, please just just keep a log of the customer complaints. And what we were hoping was at the board meetings, you know, you might hear, okay, this many people have called in and said this, or, um, you know, uh, my uh, bill was too high, whatever it might be, just to keep a track. And can we see um, exhibit seven now? Nina, <laughs> you know, could you tell us what this is? Um, that was when we were asking to address the board and we were wanting to um you know talk about we wanted to talk to the board about some of the things that we thought they should help with including uh, um you know with the money coming in covid money whatever um lie keep lie walk whatever it is um then we also wanted to talk about um the problems with customer complaints um and just keeping a track of it and, and did we did we address the board on that issue? Yes. Yes. Um, and so, how how did Alliance board, after an Alliance with the board, how, how did they respond to our multiple requests that they they keep a lot of the complaints? Um, well, the last thing that they that they sent us was. Um, it was like a list of, it looked like a log of work orders, maybe. So they sent us a, um, a list of, of all the work orders that had gone out um, that I guess were responding to what people had called in about. And do we see exhibit? Repeat the number, please. Eight, exhibit eight. tell us what this is so this is this is what um uh alliance uh, supplied us with was the uh and you'll see at the top service order status report so that that was basically looked like that was their idea of customer complaint log and, and did you do anything with this to analyze it I did. I um, I sat down with it and just kind of tried to make a list of all the things that people might be um, calling in about, and I put them into a categories um, of what they had called in about, how many times um, it was, uh, you know, how it was responded to, um, and just made sort of a uh, I don't know a table of well, that. Exhibit nine now. you were you were talking about right mm -hmm. so it was um, like how many times did they say oh my water's not on how many were low pressure or high pressure and then I think if we scroll up you can see there are two parts to this right scroll down right um, so were you able to sort of discern anything about you know how things were resolved or 
Anything well, um, what, one of the things I noticed was missing, I just want to say, I guess, before, is um, we know that there were times when people said, my bill is crazy high. I mean, they were putting it on Facebook last summer, and it's like, this is ridiculous. There's no way. But we didn't see any sign of that on a customer complaint thing because this was more or less when the workers would go out. And so um, I, thought, I thought that it would be very telling if the number of people who are calling in and saying, my bill is crazy high on Water Warriors or whatever Facebook, um, then how did that compare to how many people might be calling in, actually calling the district? Because that's what's important, calling the district, you know. Um, but um, some, one of the things that I noticed is that there were a few that um, – had called in and said that their water stinks, just stinks, and had for either months or years. And, um, and I thought it was great that basically what they did is they went out and flushed the lines or blew the lines. They called it different things, different times. And the people called in and said, thank you so much. My water is so much better. And so um, that's the kind of thing that I'm just wondering how many people realize that there might be a there might be a remedy for something that they think is the whole county is dealing with when it's really just something going on probably pretty locally sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I guess that, that sort of leads me into talking about the, the last thing you, you talked about is the water quality issues that um, you hear about from residents in the county. And I, I guess I'd, I'd just like to start with how's the water at your house? You know, at my house, I'm, I live like a mile from the plant um, and uh, my water hardly ever goes off because it goes off here. It goes off pretty much everywhere. Um, it's, it doesn't stink. I mean, it smells like chlorine, no worse than Louisville's or anywhere else, but, um, it's not brown. Um, but at the same time, um, I can't say that for everyone because, uh, the lines are so, I mean, if you're losing, um, uh, 70% of the water, that means there's holes in the lines. If pressure goes down, junk gets in the lines, might end up in people's sinks. Um, so... It's not for me, but other places. And I can't speak for what other people are having to deal with. Um, I'd like to um, pull up Exhibit 10 now. Thank you. Um, Nina, could you tell us, tell us what this is? Um, so that's the University of Kentucky drinking water uh, study that they did during the year of December 9, 2018 to December 2019. Um, and, and you referred to the UK study and you said they did it, but can you tell us, did you have a role in this work? I did. I was the, um, the field person in the county. Um, so uh, myself and a helper were tasked with actually, actually going house to house and they just basically gave us um, home uh, addresses. We had no idea where, you know, whose we were going to because it was all randomized. And we just went out and we collected samples from 97 homes um, in uh, throughout the county. And when you were in those homes, did you do anything other than collect samples? Yes, we also did a study of just um, how the people felt about the water system, um, their experiences with the water, as well as um, it had a health uh, component to it um, that uh, was um, about what they had experienced in their home. Um, and can I see a exhibit 11?
might have to look at this sideways. I don't know. Is it possible uh, to rotate it? Um, and, and so, Nina, can you tell us what, what this two-page exhibit is? So um, myself and a, uh, a co-worker here um, basically took the results of this study and tried to make it put it into a pamphlet form that would make it easy on the um, the folks here to see what the study showed without having to read a long um, scientific paper and did anyone review this pamphlet before it was um, distributed locally oh yes um, the UK professor who is in charge of it, as well as um, a communications professor, as well as um, we got a, you know, the um, uh, the professor who's doing the modeling. Uh, I forget his name, but he was in on looking at everything. So it was actually looked at by a whole lot of people as we were designing it. And did they sign off and on it, it? And I just want to say, a local student did all the artwork for us, so we were very proud of that. And they did sign off on, yeah. And can you tell us just a little bit about what, what this, um, and I just think it's easier to work from the pamphlet rather than the report. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what the pamphlet shows? Well, one of the things that, that we were looking at was um, how the people felt about the water. And of course, perception is, is just a whole lot of it. I mean, what have you experienced? But at the same time, of course, they're going to be dealing with what they've, what they've heard. But we wanted to know, have you had low water pressure at times? So we looked at, uh, at we asked these questions. Um, have you had bad odors at times? Not always. I mean, not nobody said always it is. Um, excessive bubbles was one of the things that we heard a lot about, um, which I know is uh, when there's air in the lines, um, discoloration, um, if the water irritated their skin, and also just how are you willing to drink it? And 88% um, said, no, we don't drink it. We buy bottled water. And, um, you know, a pretty high percentage Ms. also McCoy, said, um, I'm Ms. using it for Ms. Gluten. McCoy, can I, I, before, yes. I, want, I want to clear this up and so I can understand it. Uh, are you saying that 88%, only 12%, that 12% of the people who had complaints said they didn't drink it, or 88% or of the people who, who were interviewed about having complaints refused to drink the water, or are you saying 88% of the customers don't drink the water? 88% of the customers that we talked with. Who had complaints about the water. I'm just trying to understand. No. It's, it's not 88% no. of the customers in the district uh, don't refuse to drink the water, correct? It's 88% of the people whose houses we visited. Okay, okay. thank you. But we didn't only visit people who had complaints. We just, we, it was random. And how many, and so just, just again, so it's really clear, how many houses and how were they chosen? 97 homes. And it was a randomized list of uh, homes. And we had like, uh, we would go within five miles, within 10 miles, within 15 miles, and they would just, say go to 2590 this lane and we would just show up knock on the door would you like your water tested thank you um and then if we can scroll down to the second page the interior part of this pamphlet um and nina could you just tell us a little bit about what this what is presented here um, the, the map shows um, all the homes that we went to, but since it is um, uh, anonymous, uh, we actually had to sort of just move the things a little bit so that you're not actually right on that house, but it's the general area of where the house was. Um, and then there is a little flask down at the bottom that shows what we tested for. Um, we tested for pH, metals, chlorine, conductivity, temperature, coliform bacteria, 
and disinfection byproducts. Uh, and then we had to, we wanted to explain to the people what these things were. So the middle part is just explaining what are disinfection byproducts, um, what, uh, what metals, um, you know, what, back to, what is the bacteria we tested for. And then on the right were the conclusions of the study. Um, okay, and what, what can you tell us about the conclusions of those tests? Well, um, the good news was that, that we did not find a lot of metals. Um, there was some bacteria at times, but uh, no uh, coliform, no E. coli. In other words, that would be a sign of sewage um, in the water. Um, also, disinfection byproducts is something that they have been, you know, having problem with for years. And 35% of the homes were over the maximum contaminant level for disinfection byproducts. And so, um, and again, when, when was this testing done? This was done the year of 2019, really. It was December 2018 to December 2019. So it was right before Alliance came in. And are you aware of um, whether the district was um, showing any problems with disinfection byproducts during this time? No, they had not had any violations during that period. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else about this study that you feel you think it would be important for the commission to understand? Well, one of the things that that um, that is important to understand is that um, we wanted to see if it made a difference where in the uh, community that the home was um, that that might have the high levels um, it didn't it really we didn't see that it was located in any one spot um, it did seem to be seasonal so uh, it seemed to be worse in the warmer months um, as far as disinfection byproducts go um, so that that's one thing to think about um, another thing is uh, I know a lot of people get mad because, you know, we're always questioning, looking over everybody's shoulders, but you got to understand that what we wanted to show is that the people of this community have been mistreated. They have, they have been not listened to when they've been saying for years, we don't trust the water, something's going on at the water plant, there's something wrong. And so we wanted to see um, how the people did feel about it throughout the county. Um, we were very well received uh, in any place where somebody was there to open the door because they were like, yes, we want you to test our water. They're, it's something that they, they want somebody to pay attention to. Um, the other thing is there's a new study going to be done. Um, and in that study, part of it is how to talk to people about the safety of their water, how to talk to the community about what does this mean? Um, and so part of that study is going to be how do you get people to understand what's in their uh, water and what they should be thinking about their water issues. Um, so that is actually going to be comparing two areas, not just Martin County, but also um, Letcher County. So we get to see that's one of the things that we found as we talk to people this is not just a Martin County problem. A lot of people throughout Eastern Kentucky don't trust their drinking water. Um, we just happen to pay a lot for ours. Um, is there anything about the um, disinfection byproducts testing that, um, that concerns you? Well, I think that uh, one of the things is I, for years, you know, we'd gotten these these reports about what what they can cause and you know they're they ended up putting them on the back of our bill for a few years and so four times a year usually we would get these notices that that these these can cause um, problems uh, including liver damage uh, possibility of cancer and uh, one of the things too is um, 
pregnancy, problems with pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. So if you just happen to be in your first trimester during the summer months, um, that's a little scary. Can we see exhibit 12? So Nina, can you tell us tell us what that says? I think it's what you were talking about. This, uh, these are the notices that we would get, um, and if you'll notice in the the dots there, it just says there's nothing you need to do. Um, you don't need to boil your water. You don't need to do anything. But if you have a severely compromised system. Um, you have an infant, you are pregnant or are elderly, you may be at an increased risk. Um, and so we got those for so many years. Um, and it was like, oh, but it only causes these problems after long-term exposure. Well, it was, a, it was a long time. For, do you know how many years? Um, I have them going back to 2000, um, and in 2000 it was total organic carbon, and then total organic carbon might lead to disinfection byproducts. So since 20, 2000, we've been getting uh, pretty consistently up till 2017. And then, and then so just, just to be clear, you're not talking about, you don't still get these, these notices, That's, it's not there's not, concern is not that they, these are still happening, it's just that there's the history that this, this has gone on for so long. Right, but there's another, there's another worry too, because when the Division of Water came here in 2017, I'm pretty sure, and said, oh well, we're gonna help Martin County fix this, um, and basically told us in our Concerned Citizen, it, the meeting that we had with the PSC and, uh, division of Water that, oh, well, um, you don't have to worry about it. This, these disinfection byproducts, the, the levels are too uh, hard on everybody, that type of thing. But that didn't make us feel any better. And then what they did is we're going to tell them where to put the chlorine in so that it doesn't uh, affect it in that way. And instead of testing in four locations throughout the county, you only have to test in two locations and that did not help people feel like oh well now I can trust the water I mean we all heard you know the rumors of oh now they're only testing in two and and then we heard the rumors that in that uh, in that place that's the farthest away what they do is when it's time to test they flush the line and then they test and so it, it just doesn't make people feel like it's gotten any better. And can we see exhibit 13? Can you tell us just what this is? Um, this is a request for um, uh, how it got decided that they only had to test in two spots instead of the four. And it's quarterly. So in other words, once every three months, they test in two locations instead of four locations. And what's your understanding of what that's based on? Um, what they said was that the um, the population of Martin County had gone down to the point where it was below um, 10,000 people, um, even though in the census um, we're still above. But what they said is you can base it on, I guess, how many customers that you have, and then you times that by a certain uh, number, three point. 
three per house or whatever it is. I'm not sure. I can't remember what their formula was, but basically they had a formula that allowed it to say that they only had to test in two locations. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any other just sort of general concerns that you have related to this rate increase or um, any of the things we've talked about so far? Uh, um, well, you know, one of the things is that this has been, as far as a test year, this is no year to base any baseline on. And I know that we're in a, a dire situation as far as a lot of things, but um, let's just keep in mind that this is a year when there was a moratorium on half of what we could do. And so this was a pretty tough year. And also it was a year where the, the uh, Alliance actually had to do, I mean, make sure that there were four um, different um, audits um and so this this is a tough year and also um i just i just think that we have to just continue to think about how can we help those people who are the poorest i mean when you got people living on supplemental social security they're making like i think it's 780 a month and if you take their water and sewer i'm sorry but they got it in order to keep your water, you have to pay your sewer too. They have to pay 10% of that check to goes to water and sewer. And so those are the kind of things that worry us. How can we get help for the people who need it the most? I know that, uh, you know, we talk about, oh, this is a, a dire need for this, this whole system is in such a bad shape. Well, so are a lot of human beings they are in a shape where, oh my God, how am I going to make it? And so those kind of things is something that we, we need to think about. Thank you. I have no other questions. And my, I, I have one more thing I want to say. Every meeting that we've been to, and I've noticed it in a lot of the letters to the PSC, has mentioned this thing about having a separate office in the community center as well as a corporate office about half a mile away from that. Now, I don't know, I don't think people understand and I don't think Alliance understands why this affects people so much. But the reason this does is because what we have in this county has been going on for years and years is that we have a small group of people with a huge amount of power throughout the state and they go and they get these boondoggle uh, ideas of a community center, a $6 million uh, opportunity center, a new courthouse. And then what they do is they make the people of the county pay for it. So I know that when I was teaching, um, we had to pay the community center I think the school system had to pay him $15,000 a year in case we wanted to use the community center. Well, we were begging for copy paper and textbooks, and we were so mad about having to support the community center. And uh, the same thing happened with the health department. The uh, health department was hacked, had to buy a, um, a, a useless building from the uh, fire department so that the fire department could build on a lot that somebody owned, and then they couldn't afford nurses for the schools. So the people are tired of keeping uh, the ratepayers, the taxpayers, having to pay for things that have been allowed to occur to us. And I'm just gonna have to say about the people who we owe money to, I know we hear something like, you know, oh, well, those people propped up the system for that many years and uh, tried to make the system look better. You know what? We knew the system was bad. And it seems to me that um, those people who allowed that to go on for so years, should so many years, should be responsible as the ratepayers are 
for getting us out of it. And I really think there must be a situation where we look at um, how much we have to pay those people um, for basically propping up a system that what it did, what happens sometimes is that um, you have a society that is abused and you have some people who are hiding the abuse. And so the fact that they didn't blow the whistle when we were screaming our lungs out means that they were complicit. They were complicit, not just the water district was, was the problem. These people who didn't blow the whistle and say, you know, there's something going on here. There's a real problem here. And so we wanted that information to get out. And you're talking about the local. So, so that local office, the reason people, I know it's only $800. And you're like, oh, well, $700 some dollars. What difference does it make? That is why people are so mad about it. They're tired of having to support something that they never were a part of the decision of. And I know Alliance says, well, that's, um, we have a corporate office and the community doesn't pay for the corporate office. What the community wants to know is why do we have to pay for the community center office? And also, I got one more thing. We have been so abused by these companies who have done us wrong. And I was at a PSC hearing when I told them, I told you all that there had been reports by the workers at the new high school that the water system going into the new high school was a problem. Talena Matthews gave me a piece of paper with the division of water number on it. I called the division of water. They said, well, we'll go out and check on that in a couple weeks. I said, they are burying the line right now. You need to go see if it's done right. Oh, well, we'll be there in a couple weeks. He called me a couple weeks later and said, it's right. They said it was right. Now, let Craig Miller explain to you the problems he has with the water system to the high school. Because when he tried to use it the way it was supposedly designed, it backed up and filled the clarifiers. Instead of going toward Warfield, it backed up toward us. My hot water tank was spewing like crazy. And I, I, that's also some of the complaints, by the way, high water pressure. So. Okay, thank you. But I appreciate Bell Engineering. Well, Ms. McCoy, I'm glad you, you got to. Um, we wanted you to basically you know, set out the position of the concerned citizens. But just a couple of points. I mean, the issue about the water line to the high school, that was put in by county government, was it? That was Kelly, Ke hold it. Kelly Callahan and members of your physical court, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the members yes. of the physical court for 20 years is now your county judge executive. Isn't that true? Because he was appointed by the governor. Just. Mm -hmm. Now, the, during all of this time, I mean, I know, I mean, to reiterate the history, uh, Martin County Water Districts had, a, had a, a terrible problem, at least since the late 1990s, as evidence in our rate hearing, and, you know, I tried to go through in a concurring opinion some of the history. But, I mean, back in, in the early 2000s, uh, there were management audits of the district where, you know, people promised to do all kinds of things and didn't do any of it. And, and that's not the Public Service Commission's fault. We just have to go by the laws as they are. I, I don't know, I guess I know what you're saying is, is that you feel that there is a local power structure which ignores the needs, the legitimate needs uh, of, of people who don't have nearly as much money as they do. I mean, I guess that's what you're saying, that they basically control everything. Well, I don't know who controlled this water district, but whoever it did ruined it. Uh, and, and the problem that you have, and you know that, and everybody over there really knows it, is uh, <laughs> maybe politicians don't want to know it, but, but as I told the, the joint uh, uh, 
Senate House Committee when I spoke there that they couldn't have done any any more damage if they had intentionally set out to destroy your water system because the water system is ruined. The problem that we have now is essentially this. You know, if it is correct, as the testimony is, and, and we have some documents, that that the water district last year right, lost $692,000. The year before that, it lost $704,000. And that so far this year, it is operationally through the first four months in the red $188,000. That Alliance has not not only not been paid in 45 days, but that they have, been, they have paid on behalf of the district $65,000, whether all of that is dollar for dollar accurate or not, if, if the district can't pay its bills, it can't provide water to anybody. And I know that you've indicated, I mean, your water may be pretty good, except when the high school situation happened, but other people in the county, uh, their water may not be as good, right? And, but at some point, the duty of the commission is to try to not only help you, but you're, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't help you if you don't have any water at all, right? Would right. you agree with that? And so, I mean, the question is, if the district is in a, a death spiral financially, uh, I mean, what option is there other than to raise the rates, uh, at least until some outside money can come in as, uh, as uh, uh, Bell Engineering and others have said are necessary in order to try to get the system in a, in a situation where it can stabilize. I don't know. Have you got any improved thoughts on, on that at all? I would have to say that I was just hoping that a year of a management company would do some fixes, and, I, and I'm sure that they have. But I just thought it would just be a little better, but it just seems to be the same shape. Um, but I'm hoping another year. Uh, I've been waiting 20, so. Well, you know, if you're talking about, I mean, I'm sure if there are water quality problems, and I don't doubt that, that some people do have those. I mean, uh, if, if you're talking $55 million <laughs> to, to fix it, it's obviously going to take a while to do that. I mean, when you've got, what, $8 million so far, and some of the projects, uh, I mean, everybody here wanted the Warfield section fixed, right? Because we know about the water quality problems there. But as you know, and as you spoke up at one of these quarterly meetings, uh, you know, you were disappointed that the bids were so high. They were, you know, and so was everybody else. Uh, I just, uh, you know, wonder what we can do uh, and it's a bad, it's a bad situation. I mean, you're, but I will say this, you know, there are other areas, other water districts, other water groups. There's another one. We had a, a rate case uh, testimony a week, two weeks ago, where some of those people is water, water bills will go, if, if it's granted, will go to $96 a month and the sewer bill to $95. They're talking, they go from $25 or $26 to $96. I mean, two, 300% rate increase. So it's not just Martin County. There are a lot of facilities where, for whatever reason, those people in charge have not done anything, not used any good judgment, and basically have just let the whole let the system go to hell in a handbasket. So I, I don't know. I mean, I just wonder. I know you are an advocate for uh, for those who are in need, uh, and and not just poor, but people who don't have good water. But you know, if there are solutions, if there are things that you can propose, uh, and I don't know that there are. Uh, we're certainly willing to, uh, you know, to listen. They've been around a long time, and I hate to tell you, but it's going to be a long time probably to cure it. Uh, and I wish, I, I, I hope you think and know that we will, 
have done and will do everything we can. And I just wish every people had acted earlier and maybe we could have mitigated some of it, but I, I don't know. And I will have to say that I show up here to support my people, but I also try to take this, this fight to other uh, venues because I think this is a national problem in a lot of rural areas. And, and I just think that infrastructure is so neglected. Well, it is. And you know, I, we hear about the American Society of Civil Engineers talking about $6 billion, $8 billion in Kentucky for water, wastewater infrastructure. If Martin County's is $55 million for water alone, $63 million for water and sewer, and you've got, we've got over 4 million people, and, and you've got 3,500 customers, do you, $8 billion won't touch this problem, in, I don't think. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, I would point out to you too, you know, the Public Service Commission, uh, last fall uh, tried to take action on behalf of uh, low-income people by eliminating late fees and requiring that uh, uh, connection reconnection charges be limited to only what the actual costs were as opposed to some kind of percentage or arbitrary fee and i will point out to you that your senator and your representative voted to strip the Public Service Commission of the power to help out low-income ratepayers. You understand that, right? I do. I hate that. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there may be political solutions to some of these things. Uh, exactly. But, but uh, we don't have any political influence down here. Uh, so uh, that, may, that may have to come from, uh, from people locally. Uh, in any event, uh, Ms. Coney, do you have any, any questions of Ms. McCoy? I have no questions. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Vice Chairman Chandler, any questions? He may have gone. I think he had to leave it. The Vice Chairman had to leave a little okay. early. Uh, Commissioner Matthews, questions? I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cumbo, any questions? No questions. Uh, Ms. Cromer, any anything on anything on redirect? I would like to move those exhibits into the record, please. Okay, sustained, sustained. Uh, excuse me, Chairman. Could you could Ms. Right. Cromer identify the number of exhibits that you did call, or or if it's easier, just say the ones that you didn't. I have that two and five that you submitted um, prior to the hearing were not part of the group of exhibits that you moved to admit. Is that that's Correct. exactly right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can make sure that the reporter has yes, the correct exhibits. Have, yes, sir. Uh, and they would be numbered exactly what? The, okay. Uh, they are numbered 1 through 13, but not including 2 and 5. So. <laughs> okay. I, well, I mean, I, I mean you, you can do that, right? You can go... One through thirteen, but two and five, you know, won't be, won't won't be there. Nah, so they won't be one to fifteen. They'd right. be, I guess one to thirteen. Right? That's all. Yeah. Okay. They were identified earlier. Uh, now, I, I guess uh, we have to make a decision under the criteria that was uh, initially discussed or read into the record on on you know whether or not it's a uh, Failure to grant an emergency rate increase will materially affect the uh, operational status of the uh, of the of the uh, water district or its credit, um, and you know everything is subject to like the last time we did this in 2018 uh, to a, a, a true up if if it turns out to be that that doesn't be the case doesn't turn out to be the case in the end, but. Uh, Ms. Cromer, do you, I want to offer you the opportunity, if, if, would you like to write something in the form of a brief or a statement or something for the commission to consider based on the evidence that's been presented today? Um, and Mr. Cumbo, I'll offer you, since you have the burden of proof, I may offer, ask Mr. Cumbo, Cumbo, Cumbo I'm sorry, Cumbo Cromer, you, 
named or similar. What uh, if you'd like to present something, or let the let it stand on the record? Well, that, we're comfortable with standing on the record, Commissioner. Uh, what about you, Miss Cromer? Um, I would like the opportunity to write something, but I, I'm assuming it'll just uh, be short and a short deadline. Okay, sure. If, if I guess depending on what Miss Cromer uh, submits, uh, Mr. Cumbo, you, you do you want the opportunity uh, to uh, reply? Yes. Yes, I will. How much how much time would you like, uh, Miss Cromer? Oh, I'm going to kick myself for this until Monday. I'm sorry, what'd she say? She said until Monday. I, that's Memorial Day, so PSC won't, I don't know. That. You could, you, you're a good lawyer, Miss Cromer. Lawyers work on Saturday, Sundays, Memorial Day. Why don't you take till Tuesday? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and then uh, if, if Miss Cromer has something filed by it, Next Tuesday, Mr. Cumbo, uh, how much time would you reasonably need? I mean, this I is would, Thursday. She doesn't even. She only gets, you know, three business days. So if she's Tuesday. Can you go Friday or the following Monday? The following Monday would be doable. Right. Let, let me say this too. Uh, I guess we've never really addressed it in in public. I assume the lawyers know. But, but one, uh, for concerned citizens, you know, there, we don't have the General Assembly uh, has not uh, set up a tiered uh, rate schedule based on the ability to pay. So all people who use electricity, gas, water in this state uh, are charged on the same basis, uh, depending on their class, but not based upon uh, their ability to pay. And uh, in a court case in 1982, the uh, Kentucky Supreme Court in South Central Bell Telephone Company versus Utility Regulatory Commission, which and, and Stephen Bashir, who was then with the Attorney General, President Governor's father, uh, 637 Southwest 2nd, 649, August 1982. The Public Service Commission had uh, attempted to take into consideration poor service on the part of Bell Telephone uh, in a rate increase that, uh, in a rate case that it had, and the court held that the Public Service Commission had no authority to basically reduce rates because of poor service. So I, I know it's important uh, to that the service, uh, at least to some people in Martin County, in some areas, may not always be the best, may not be very good sometimes. But uh, that's something that the Public Service Commission uh, can't consider uh, when it, uh, when it uh, uh, makes a decision on the rates. Okay? All right, is there anything else, uh, uh, Mr. Cumbo, that you'd like to say or like for us to consider? No, no, Commissioner Word. Okay. Uh, we will rest. Ms. Cromer? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Ms. Coning? I have nothing further. Okay. Commissioner Matthews, you're the only other one here with me. Do uh, you have anything uh, anything you'd want to add or say? I'm not going to get between all these people and and suffer. No. Um, I, I just appreciate everybody and their testimony and their work it's been a i i wish we had 65 million dollars i'll tell you what if i had 65 million dollars i'd buy a new lexus and go to dayton <laughs> <laughs> we heard that at one hearing it was a lot less than... <laughs> I, I believe i'd go further i would aim a little higher <laughs> All right. All right. If there's nothing else, then this uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all very much.